Thank you very much, gentlemen. Hello, everyone. I am Rivington Vizna III and Poland Caster Duty with, for me, with the first three games. <laughs> for you. For I'll me. take it from with here, With me, man. for the first three games, is going to be <laughs> Sam Kobe, Hartman, Kensler, and it looks like I'm going to need him today. We're about to storm the rift for Gravity versus Team Liquid, and both teams start the day tied for fourth and are looking to go a lot higher than that in the standings. Yeah, especially, you know, Team Liquid, they're making a serious push for that top spot in North America. If yesterday's performance was any indication, I mean, this is a team that have strong individual players, and they can carry from any of the three lanes. Mm -hmm. Phoenix, obviously, uh, was a one-man army yesterday, turning CLG's four versus one tower dive into a quadra kill for himself, and didn't stop there. You know, he was able to use that lead that he earned from that play to gain control of the mid-game team fights, and he ended the game 11-0-5, yep. and five, even putting his uh, self at risk in many of those team fights. And Quas was also another great asset for the team. Uh, he showed off a different side to Team Liquid, which was his versatility with the Scion pick for yeah. the top lane that they said, you know, they haven't even practiced with practiced with Scion for weeks, and he still came up with clutch plays for the team. Always a rock-solid player coming out of that top lane, and he'll be going toe-to-toe -to -toe with Hauntzer. Hauntzer's been a stepping up a lot for Gravity here. Yesterday, he was second only to the team's AD carry and kills. Pretty good for a top laner, and he was giving Alltech a run for his money as yeah. much as he could. There's definitely a reason we keep going over the amount of growth that we've seen from Hauntzer from last split. It's very impressive that he's been able to actually double the kills per game that he made from from last split to this split. Yep. And he's been winning lane against some of the top names in North America. So we also have to talk about Keen, though, the mid lane. Can't forget him. He is tied for the most champions played, and he brings more flexibility than even Quas does to the pick fan phase for gravity. Like yesterday, uh, Cop was able to use Keen's uh, champion pool. They had an early lock-in of Hecarim, mm -hmm. uh, which we would assume for is, the t is for the top lane, but they're able to switch it mid because of Keen after Kassanen is locked in to give them a huge laning advantage uh, that they were able to punish their enemies uh, with in-game. Right, and speaking a little bit of Hauntzer before, he says Gravity's unpredictable team comms aren't just to throw off the enemy. Our, like, weird picks mainly works just because we have, like, confidence in each other. Like, even, like, say, like, one game, Move will play, like, Heimerdinger or Jungle or something, right? Like, we're confident that he can do his job and, like, help us, like, snowball the game. So, really, if the pick's, like, good into the, whatever we're playing against, then it's, like, not that bad. If it's good, then it's not that bad. <laughs> Heimerdinger confirmed on stream. We'll see. Let's check out the starting lineups. On the blue side, it's going to be Gravity. That means it is Hauntzer in the top lane. Move in the jungle. Keen in mid. Alltech at 80 carry. And the foofooist of bunnies at support. And on the red side is Team Liquid. Up top is Quas in the jungle. I will dominate. Mid, Phoenix, 80 carry Piglet. Yep. Support special. And, of course, uh, Coach Peter. Coach Peter for Liquid Cop on the other side here. Not so much brothers, sisters anymore. It's like the, the families have almost separated now. Yeah, it's pretty funny, too, that they're technically tied for fourth right now because they're right behind that three-way tie for number one. Yep. But that's history. <laughs> They've changed names, both teams. So. History in the past. Well, with the same record coming into this game, both teams have shown a very different play style of how to get that record, so it should be a very interesting one. Gravity coming up with the first win when these two teams met, and it was a pretty pretty quick win, pretty solid yeah. win to add to that. That's actually, that's a pretty good point, because, you know, we talk about Team Liquid there, you know, ready to carry from any of the three lanes. Mm -hmm. Gravity has a kind of different dynamic. You know, while Keen does bring a lot of flexibility in champion select, yeah. he actually does, he's the only mid laner that does less percent of his team's damage to champions than both the AD carry and top laner. So Hauntzer and Alltech have been really the ones putting out most of the damage for the team. Wow, the respect ban right away on the Azir. It was definitely key to Gravity's win over Team Liquid earlier uh, in week two at the beginning of the split. Mm -hmm. So they're going to ban that one away from Keen. 7-0 and 10, <laughs> so they don't want that to happen again. Very nicely played. We'll see what they can get for the rest of the bans. Very targeted as we come in here. Not letting a special engage on Annie. Nothing crazy from Keen on that Urg out in the mid lane and Rise. Just because Rise. Yeah, I mean, Piglet especially remembers the way that the game ended <laughs> in week two, trying to play against Hauntzer's Rise, and he's still in the same state, so don't want that one on the table. I actually want to go over the first ban from Gravity, mm -hmm. because 
while Keen is extremely flexible, Phoenix plays a lot of just what's very popular in the meta. Um, you know, he played a lot of LeBlanc before she got nerfed, a lot of Azir, a lot of Cassiopeia. Yeah. Um, so they're going to try and take that one away from him, especially since uh, the Azir play yesterday. I think that may have something to do with it. Liquid feels like banning out one of those big flex picks could give them maybe the idea that they won't get hit with two of them. They don't have to start dancing around not knowing what they're going to be fighting against. Here, they have a little bit better of an idea, but they do give up the Gragas hunting, something we've seen consistently banned, at least yesterday and the weeks before that. Yeah, it seems like uh, Dominate feels comfortable playing into Gragas. He does have Rek'Sai available. Also, uh, he's been quick to pick up Echo in the jungle, one of actually the few junglers for North America to play it, um, along with Meteos. It worked well for Dominate yesterday. The Sege games they kept trying to go with, it was Rumble, Sege, Jace, Rumble, Sege, Jace for both TSM and Dignitas in week four. With Dominate on something a little more aggressive for damage in and out of the fight instead of Sege being in there. It worked out for the team. They were able yeah. to really get more kind of positioning in the fights is what I was looking for. So since Gravity didn't really want to give away much in their first round, I guess, and picked a fairly neutral yeah. all-around champion, Team Liquid were able to grab that Alistar, which has proven to be huge, pretty much in all games across the world, Yep, as one of those frontline <laughs> supports. So that does mean that Bunny Fufu will be able to get Thresh if he so desires, which has been the classic for him. But... Uh, Special, well-equipped to make some roam plays on Alistar. Pretty much yep. the scariest part about that champion is if their bottom lane can gain control and allow him time to roam around the map. I feel like there will be quite a bit of roaming, at least by the junglers in this one. We see a lot of jungle bans in the past few days. None here. Gragas open. Dominate's still going to get his pick of the litter with Rek'Sai still being up as well. So those guys, they could can, they can be putting up a lot of pressure this game. Yeah, I am going to focus on jungle this game, I guess, more so than usual, I guess, but because when Team Liquid, you know, in the beginning of the season, they were having such success, it was all these games where Dominate kept playing really, really well. His yeah. counter gank timing was perfect. He made a lot of clutch plays, but, you know, last week when they had their 0-2 week, yep. he he left a bit to be desired. Yep. You know, he was a bit low, he was a bit slow on his rotations, um, and he played, you know, a bit more cautiously. So I'm definitely looking for uh, him to return to form. Some early game plays, maybe. Ooh. And he definitely has... Speaking of caution... ...to make it happen. We, th we thought it was the Thresh, but lo and behold, he goes for the Janna on the side as Rek'Sai and Bane get picked up. So the Janna's looking even a little bit better now. They can keep someone safe on this team and get those divers out. Yeah. Janna with uh, a bit of peel for Sivir. Yeah. Altec's still going to have to be quick on his feet because Alistar, um, Nar, and Rek'Sai are extremely difficult to peel because all of their CC is so quick and any of them can flash in on you for the knockups. So definitely going to have his work cut out for him. And I'm, gonna s I'm actually interested to see what impact this Janna can have for Team Gravity just because we know the impact of Bunny Fufu's Thresh. Yeah, absolutely. And he has historically had a fall off when he transfers to other support champions. Uh, we'll see if he can keep it up. Pretty much all the ooze from the crowd, though, did come from the Vayne pickup for Piglet. Happy to have him back on his favorite champion and playing into a Sivir, which uh, he should be hunting for that matchup. Awesome. I am really excited to see some Oriana play <laughs> with the Hecarim as well. You can get some really nice ball delivery here. But they have to go through quite a front line. Yeah. It'll be very back and forth. These fights are going to be difficult to take for both teams if they're not just flashing to engage it. Gravity get that really strong synergy between Sivir and Hecarim. Able to speed him up for the mm -hmm. fight. Uh, Hauntzer has had some teleports that were that also left oh something boy. to be desired. But uh, yeah. <laughs> if they can combo this time around. I actually really like to pick a Kog'Ma. Do need the AP a little bit inside the composition, and if you could start off with the other team being lower than full health, that's really going to help for Ali Quas, or I should say Ali, Nar, and Rek'Sai to jump into the fight. Eight seconds left. Peter, his last piece of information going over the team. It seems to be a victor all along that the team wanted. They're going to yep. lock that in for their AP. Yeah, uh, with the last two lock-ins there from Gravity, uh, they don't choose to make use of any 
swap potential and no. flex picks uh, for our Hauntzler and Keen as the Orianna will obviously go towards that mid lane and Phoenix gets a fairly standard AP versus AP yeah. matchup here. It, you, as you mentioned though, it was something they left up both bottom or for the bottom picks, both mid and top. So Cop had that option open left for his team if they wanted to get that last counter that they could from blue side. I like the balance here for Team Liquid too. They actually have a decent amount of early pressure. Mm -hmm. The only thing is this Bane Alistar lane, you they may be able to punish it early on before Vayne gets to Blade of the Ruin King, before Alistar gets to level yeah. six. So while Victor is a great early laner and Rex has a great early ganker, um, very interested <laughs> to see how the Alistar Vayne gets through early game. Well, hopefully the teams are relaxed as the coaches as they head off to the back. We're about to get this one going. It's almost time to start, so head over to Twitter and start sending your votes in for this match. Use hashtag GVWin or hashtag TLWin to at LOL Esports. We'll be tallying those up throughout the game, and we'll have to see what Gravity has against Team Liquid once again. We remember, back to week two, Gravity was able to take this win pretty convincingly over Team Liquid. Let's see if Liquid has patched things up and they're ready to get back, get that equalizing win at one and one for the, sli uh, the split. <laughs> uh, not the right game, but <laughs> I like the enthusiasm. A fan all together. All right, yeah, remember, this is these are the guys, they're just one game behind the three-way tie for first place. So the Victor here will be licking at the heels of that number one spot for North America. We're gonna push their way to the top. I wonder where that came from. Who wants to be licking at heels? Biting at heels, chomping? So I think it's uh, centered around dogs. Dogs do that a lot. Oh, yeah, yeah. Gotcha. These guys are dancing. Good heel placement by Phoenix. He's got the heels. Talking a little trash. So good competition. Good competition already. All right, defensive lineup so far. The only one really playing aggressive is Hauntzer. Pushing out early. Altec on his Sivir, most played champion. You can see his kill share and damage. Yeah, I feel like... Over the average. A lot of AD carries have Sivir as their most played champion nowadays. <laughs> <laughs> it's a great choice. Okay, great baton work coming from Phoenix in the mid. Yeah, all right. These guys are keeping limber. You're going to have to. Start of the day. I have to get the adrenaline going. All right. So a couple, a, a bit of a deep board here, though, for Gravity, while all the dancing was taking place. Uh, used a little bit of sleight of hand, and they've slipped a ward in uh, to see that the duo is at the Gromp. Uh, Special, I think, poked his head out from that bush a little while ago, and Gravity will move up to that top lane. So the Vayne into Sivir will be avoided. And actually, we will probably get some influence from the Alistar roaming early on here. As both teams start with double jungle. Team Liquid double jungle on their weak side, though. And here comes Bunny Foo Foo to harass them. Smite was used on the Krugs, by the way. Some people have been adapting and doing the small camp without Smite and saving it <laughs> for the big buff just because of that. Can Bunny get in there? Never mind. Couldn't do it. Just trying to trade, but Gravity is actually coming in with two of their members here, Kobe. Haunter and Move are making their way in. Quas gets knocked back, forced to flash already. He is going to be staying with Dominate, so it's not going to hurt for him to go to a lane there, but it will eventually when he needs to. That's five minutes of that. Got a flash out of it, yeah. as well as one camp for Counter Jungle. Uh, let's see, it's just going to be the standard four and four now. The next thing that you look for are the teleport plays. We've seen several times um, people trying to sneak in and defend the turret with three people um, and sometimes being able to cut somebody off with a teleport. This ward is to see if Team Liquid are going to go for that, yep. sneak three people in and try and do a defense. However, they are not. They're a little bit slower on their jungle because of the greedy start on their weak side. And uh, they're just going to make their way down for the four on four. Both teams chip it away. Much quicker in the side of gravity here. We'll see how they can use this timing to get maybe some wards in place or the lanes back in their favor the way they want. Yeah, So absolutely. because they have such a lead on taking down the turret, 
they can actually take away Team Liquid's position around Dragon, and they can counter uh, an early Dragon that a lot of teams for red side will transition to that after taking the turret if they have the same amount of time. Mm -hmm. But because they're so far behind and taking early dragons this early in the game costs you a lot of not only time but also health because everyone's so low level. If I remember correctly, I believe it was actually Gravity that kind of did this vice versa yesterday. They were actually the team in the bot lane and didn't go for dragon. But remembering now that Team Liquid could, they're ready to act on bot lane going for Dragon. So yeah, maybe learning on their own mistakes there. Especially this game, do not want to go for it. Um, if you do have the lead as the red squad to in the turret race at the beginning mm -hmm. of the game, maybe you have Jinx, Janna, or something like that, uh, then it's an option. But the opportunity cost of a Dragon this early in the game is so high. Yeah. And you take so much damage that it forces you back to base and you lose a lot of map control. So even if it is open to you, I'd be very cautious about going for those early dragons. You really need to have the right setup. <laughs> Everybody, you, they, you, the pain of the cannon yep. minion miss. Feel it. It's you real deep. So it's Altec trying to push now with bouncing blades. Get himself moved up a ricochet. And here comes a special back down to the bottom lane to make sure Piglet isn't pushed out too far into the turret. They're gonna again continue to put damage on the turret as soon as possible here. Map pressure. Yeah, look at this. Piglet with the Avarice Blade start for Vayne in Good this eye. matchup. So they're really just looking to scrape together as much CS as they can, get him to his breakpoint um, of ability. I feel like he's still going to rush the Blade of the Rune King and not go for like a uh, quick Ghost Blade, but right. who and knows? Well, that's a signifier that blade. they're going to take a bit longer and maybe play safer. Is that something Gravity should act on, knowing Vayne won't spike as hard, knowing they can hit her up as with, Piglet's trying to get cash money? With Janna Sivir, you can put, you can continuously shove this Alistar Vayne into turret yeah. uh, and bring down extra pressure. Hauntzer does have teleport. Um, it does depend a lot on who's able to, you know, gain priority up in this top lane. Um, Quas right now, looking to use his Narbar to pressure Hauntzer. Pretty good mid, uh, position on the menu wave for it. Monster wait for the CS just to push into him right now. As both junglers hang out in the top side of the map. Dominate, level four right now in that respect. As we see a bit of aggression here to the bot. A little denial of CS trying yeah. to make special. Trying to make him miss the cannon, but Alta got the attack off. And without headbutt, a lot of your presence in lane is diminished with Alistar. Early on, long cooldown there and the taking away the threat of actually comboing both Polarize and Headbutt. We're going to put them in a more defensive route. Phoenix is going to cheat on his CS numbers. Get the little babies. Get Those are actually worth can. good money, though. Mm -hmm. We don't see too many junglers do that. Or, I'm sorry, mid laners do that to the jungle anymore. Usually you're leaving your camp up and the other camp. Xiaowei Xiao used to be all over those things when we see that yeah. type of situation. So the early game here, not too much. The lanes were swapped, but the CS is nearly even in all the lanes. A bit of a lead towards the top that could easily be closed once haunts are back. And same thing with the bottom lane. So moves still to be made. First blood yet to come seven minutes in. But we are going to be getting the buffs transferred over here to the mid lane. All right. So because Piglet opted to get his average blade on first back, he's made Almost 200 gold, 190 gold on it. Mm -hmm. And Altec has decided to try and match him. But because he went with the second pack, uh, picking up his Avarice Blade, he will be that yeah. almost 200 gold behind on generation from that item. But they will have, you know, relatively similar combat effectiveness. It looks like yeah. Piglet actually will rush for uh, Ghost static. Blade. Or Static, yeah, yeah, excuse me, Static on the vein. So that'll be interesting. Give them some more side wave control. Yeah, keep to them be able to the shove a lane and try and keep up with the wave pushing power of a sivir through a static ship. So no blade blade build for Piglet. Going to King and Ghost Blade. Interesting. We don't usually see these type of switches by the AD carries until you've seen it a few times in different different areas. And not, not even regions, maybe online, maybe during their scrims. But. We'll see if this works out for him. Definitely playing situationally. Yeah, Vayne does have more flexibility than most AD carries mm -hmm. in builds because she benefits so heavily from attack speed. Not only because of the true silver bolts, but also the attack damage that her ultimate gives her 
just increases the value for yep. um, attack speed to get off higher powered attacks early on. Well, there's definitely a bit of respect being given to that lane now. Pushed up quite far without a lot of vision in, in that respect to the bottom side of the jungle. Hanser also a little too far forward, but he does have the means and move to get out of a bad situation. Looks like we're going to get Keen back in. I was starting to head towards the top side, but he decides to just go back. Probably finish up in Athenes or just the Fiendix, it seems. Yeah, that mid lane. Very slow Dead game. even. <laughs> <laughs> oh, gonna still protect it. Well, he knows it's there now, yep. so. The value you get out of a pink ward after uh, the enemy knows it's there. It's not. Ooh. So, Piglet's having a hard time here sneaking in for CS, and Altex has been able to actually catch back up and surpass him because of the lack of security for this Bane Alistar lane. Bunny Fufu also just swept Crybrush. You can see that cooldown. So they know there's nearly zero vision down here for Team Liquid. I wonder if they'll try to get a play. Hauntzer's already making a move towards this area. Yeah, so I think that the play that you make now for Dominate is to yeah. prepare for action bottom. So you leave a Rek'Sai tunnel over your jungle wall close to the bottom lane. And then you can save your ultimate and be there if Gravity go for um, an offensive move down by your bottom lane. So Dominate needs to put some forethought into um, the map control that he wants yeah. with Rek'Sai and leave tunnels in a good spot. There is a teleport from Quas. He does yeah. not have a rage bar, though. So Gravity shoving in on the dragon, going to burn it down. Yeah, that actually just went down for him. Great push in the top lane from Hauntzer. Left Quas farming a wave. And he came down at the right time, really. Map control by Gravity. No kills on the board yet. But yep. turrets and dragons have gone down. And again, this is a move that we see um, a lot from Hegrim players, but also um, other top laners starting to pick it up. Marin was the first uh, to, that I remember to just buy home guards early. Yeah, on just outright. Right. Other champions besides Hegrim just to make plays like this, where you use the home guard speed to get to dragon, get your objective, and back to top lane without even having to expend your teleport right. cooldown. So they were able to get that objective without costing themselves uh, you know, a big teleport play bottom, which could easily turn the tides of the game. Dominate so far. Just been mostly hard farming and clearing out wards. Here's another move monster, though. Doing a very nice job. Comes back to lane, knows he has the upper hand and can quickly get in. Throws down two deep wards right now inside the top of Team Liquid's jungle. Move. Trying to keep wards up as well for the team. So these guys are definitely going to have all the vision they need to stop Team Liquid from crawling back into this one objective-wise. Still waiting for a fight, though. Both teams giving a lot of each or a lot of respect to each other in that sense. <laughs> what a rowdy crowdy today. Gotta love it. Only a bit of a gold lead here coming from Team Liquid. Just CS in the lane so far. Right, so Team Liquid looking to turn it back around and even up that matchup with Gravity mm -hmm. to go 1-1. One, one. And Piglet has been able to finish his static shift, so the clear side lane clear is definitely there. And they've sent him down to actually <laughs> hold the wave by himself. So because he's paired with Alistar, you know, this shiv will give a special more time to be able to roam around, try and clear mm -hmm. wards, and pull off some plays with Alistar. That's a good point. Gives Pickle a little bit more control of the lane. However, it does greatly reduce his 1v1 potential. And, you know, Piglet's a guy that loves to go for solo kills, yeah. loves to go for duels without rushing Blade. Uh, he's not going to want to take those 1v1s unless uh, it's a really, really fortunate positioning or they've got uh, extra numbers. They're trying to plan here, working off of possible Team Liquid's mistakes, but they're in no position to make mistakes right now. Team Liquid, full communication with the team. They know where they want to be, and they know they want to take it slow. Quas just going to farm the top lane here, and forward wards. Hauntzer's trying to put down a good start to pay off. Coming in for a little bit more aggression here on to dominate. I don't think he's going to be able to get it. Oh, yeah. Smite is down. He doesn't know that, though, so going after it could be big. 
Dominate's able to get as he pops up. Haunts are looking for maybe some mid lane pressure here as Quas comes down, but the team is a bit occupied. It should Does be able to make it out. Even have to burn his ult nope. either. Yeah, he saw that Dominate had not uh, used Smite on the red camp, and it was only down to, or already down to, uh, three and three to four hundred. So he figured he didn't have it up, and went in to go for the lucky steal. Not able to grab it though. And again, those home guards early on, right back in lane, still holding onto their teleports. Look at that quick shove from Piglet as well with the static shift. Able to deny a couple of minions at the secondary turret. Very different game from the first one we saw back in week two. That Urgot coming from Keen took out Phoenix's Cassiopeia in the mid lane. The game kind of escalated out of that, but there nothing of that sort coming in this game. Both teams very safe in the early. Um, the lane swap also kept the AD carries pretty safe in farming. Yeah, I mean, speaking of very safe, the, again, we're seeing a um, a Fiends from Keen, the magic resist route for mid lane, even though Phoenix is the only magic resist on the team. So that does you know, help out in lane, and it will give him that stronger lane uh, to go even with Victor. However, as they transition to team fights, might be lacking a bit of extra damage. Piglet might be a little too far away from the team here, buddy. They are getting themselves into position just to clear wards here, and I think out of anything, if it's not this dragon, oh, he's going for a 1v1 with the static fight ship off the ward. He's got more attack speed from the dagger, and it's just for the push out. So ultimate for an ultimate, and a little bit of H more or HP more on the side of Piglet. This is why the Vayne into Sivir and Callista into Sivir are pretty much the two matchups that people like mm -hmm. to counter her with for the 1v1 style. As we get to team play, of course, Sivir will be able to help out the entire team for quicker movements across the map, but not quite there yet. Slowly but surely, mm -hmm. we are getting there. And the battle for ward coverage on the side lanes where the turrets have gone down is pretty much the biggest the yep. biggest point of confrontation that we are going to have in this game. The battle for those deep wards on red buff sides of the jungle for both sides of the map. Gravity uh, have actually lost ground here. Yeah. Liquid got a couple deep ones in there. Move. Actually, I think he's, he used his smite on that red buff, so won't be able to smite uh, raptors when they come back up and try and clear out those deep wards. That's something... Oh, let me see. Uh, so that's something... As a jungler, if, especially if you ever see your Raptors counter jungled, you always want to use your sweeper or drop a pink ward by your Raptor rush. Because if the enemy takes their time to counter your Raptors, they most likely yep. have dropped a ward in that brush. That's just such a high value brush to drop a ward in. If they, you already know that they've been there, a really high percentage for sweeper accuracy. It there. Is there any way to draw the raptor into the brush so it doesn't trigger if they put it all the way in the corner as a jungler? Can you squeak it out? <laughs> yeah, that's the, that's the other thing, trying to use your <laughs> raptor buff efficiently and not have it pop on <laughs> wards that you already know are there and you can just sweep or drop a pink ward with someone else. It always feels, feels great to smite and have to use it right away. Dragon is alive though, definitely something that could put that first blood on the scoreboard. Piglet here in the bottom lane. We just saw him not afraid to make plays. Something awesome to see in a tight game like this. The AD carry the one trying to go for the solo kill so far. So. Yeah, I'm, I'm so actually curious to happen. see where he's going with this build. Is that BF Sword gonna turn into a Bloodthirster or an Infinity Edge? Because right he already right. has crit. He already has some crit mm -hmm. in his build. Making the purchase of Infinity Edge, you know, really, really high damage. However, he is dealing with a Sivir boosted Hecla. So, may want the extra survivability. I really like just going all for it, though, and going for an Infinity Edge. It just sounds like a super high DPS yep. vein. If they're able to keep <laughs> him alive and use that Alistar to peel for him, get a lot of value out of it. See what kind of items we could have coming into this one. Teleports are up. Triforce is not finished to the Black Cleaver of Quas, but still haunts you. Slice down Piglet with that Sheen and Phage damage. It's going to be the Dragon teleport take in. Home guard off. Oh, he Haunter. didn't even have it. Yeah. Haunter comes in. This looks like he's not going for the ultimate. Should 
pretty much be able to have this. Dominate not close enough. Silver Ultimate goes off with a disengage here. Coming from Gravity, Haunter definitely wants to use that, and I think that's all she wrote about it. Bunny Fufu goes down with a nice, actually didn't even get his Monsoon off. That was just on the hunt, yeah. getting Gravity out. Bunny on Janna. We were wondering uh, how he would look on a different support. And on the front lines there, easy pickings for Phoenix. Yep. Just full combo from Victor, and that support is toast. So he's the only one going down. But two dragons now. Let's see how this fight goes down. Well, Bunny trying to be a front liner here. Does get the knockup, but right into that ulti and laser. Boom. Ooh. <laughs> Very that, simple story there for that dragon fight. That Q burst auto coming from Phoenix took him by surprise. Boof did that. get the dragon, though. Yeah. So, uh, two dragons. Still pretty big. They can keep that timer going for five and have to pressure Team Liquid into fights they may not want. Yeah. Altec here actually not afraid. Oh, that's smart. Still, Piglet staying. Nope, no he's not. <laughs> Thought about the situation, saw his vision, and with the river being warded, it did not help him that much being pushed up that far. The standoff here in top lane. Gold is only 200 apart. Yeah, it is going to turn into a 2v1 up there momentarily as Dominate heads on up. No, no wards for Hanser to speak of. Oh, that is no ulti. Can't get the last one. Boomerang hits again. Gonna pop him up. The move block does not actually get to him. He couldn't dash forward, but it looks like Haunter will still go down the end. The red buff really contributing to locking that one down with Boomerang after Boomerang. All right, they're gonna shove down bottom, though, in response to seeing the jungler up top. One turret for gravity. Team Liquid, they can opt to keep both their laner, uh, top laner and jungler up in that top side to try and answer, but the Sivir Janna shove is not slowing down. Gravity knowing top could be pressured now, but quite a bit on the bottom yeah. turret here. Yeah. Very, very slow early game. Kobe took to what? Oh, could be a fight here. And it looks like they are going to get out alive. Turret goes down on the top side. So Pressure on the bottom. They're not able to do much. Speaking about Crumbs is, I figured, nope, maybe not. Quas teleport in. On to move. He's only going to be able to get Hyper off of this. And doesn't look like he'll be able to connect with the Boomerang. I thought they would have ganked the Vayne more, knowing just an Avarice Blade in the bot lane, or even, as Crumbs said, immobile mid lane. Uh, yeah, so I would put, I would just say low mobility mid laners because they do, they can't actually walk around, but it's a, it's a pretty <laughs> good point. They were also both playing really safe. Both yeah. of them were sort of For sure. standing back and wave clearing, and the game did start off in lane swaps. Yeah, um, but that kind of occupies It the still is a very valid point, uh, since Gragas and Rek'Sai are the two, you know, most potent early game uh, Cinderhold gankers in the meta right now. Right. So without any bans on the junglers this game, they get what they want. And they kind of just say, let's farm it out, bros. But like you said, that lane swap, definitely going to keep them occupied in the beginning. And a hand out pretty much to Gravity getting the first few dragons. Good map pressure in control of that as they were the ones to go top lane. And all tech and the rest of the team dropped that turret first and then began to move the map in their favor. Liquid has all the kills, though, that have gone down on the map. The last one they found was a bit of a 2v1 pick. If they can keep doing that, Gravity's going to lose their map. Yeah, we're going to have to keep track of that ward coverage. There is a, a decent line mm -hmm. into the blue side jungle, so you can tell, you know, Gravity, they want to get to that third dragon and continue the stacking, uh, concentrating all of their efforts yep. in this quadrant of the map. Uh, move making frequent visits over here with the Raptor buff. Try and keep it clean. That deep, deep ward isn't something you usually see other than for yeah, the lane this swaps late, in the early. Yeah, around 23 minutes there. It's really nice knowing everything that could happen, especially when you're planning a dragon. Those are all moves wards. Always talking about moves wards and stats. Throwing them down, getting them deep. Doesn't just go in for one. He makes sure he can get all three down for that moment. Use that to their advantage. Very, very safe Team Liquid, though, has been skirting around that issue for the entire game now as we approach 24 minutes. Looks like mid lane finally gets a little bit of love here. But I figure they're just going to back off. Minute on Dragon, they're just trying to look to blow some ultimates. Get some summoners out here. This may be one of those chances. Ward clear, try for move. He's going to be able to get over the wall easily, so not yep. too much expended there. 
Didn't even have to blow his ultimate, no. so they save it for Dragon. Uh, one minute away. We've got, you know, nine summoners that will probably be available <laughs> for it. Uh, Quasis, Flash may come up in a minute. Um, so the next Dragon Fight, number three, is probably going to be where we will get our next action. Until then, more cleaning duties for everyone. <laughs> Just sweep the river. Nobody really willing to make uh, more aggressive side lane plays. Just farm halfway the map. As soon as you get the river, pull off. Is pretty much been the name of the game. Monster, even though he sees the pink ward, um, decides that he's going to push it across the river. Across, across half court. I feel like at this point, they're doing absolutely the right thing, but almost could bait Team Liquid to the dragon even more and just give it to him. Then run mid, take top, get two turrets for that one first dragon the Team Liquid's about to get. However, they're putting a little more priority on it. Dragon 3 doesn't suck. They still want it. Yeah, I think I think Rev Gravity really want to make use of their Trinity Force completed on Haunter. Yeah. You know, finally get that Strike while home, the iron's guard, home guard teleport in on a Trinity Force just completed Hecarim is one of the most devastating things. So Piglet... It's true, it is the spike for them. Uh, Quas, Special, and Dominate. All they really need to do is tag Hecarim to take that uh, home guard buff off him. And Piglet should be able to, you know, duck and dive around the team fight. Yep. Uh, I think that Gravity needs to get a pink ward for this team fight just because of it. Not going to be moved. Quas actually getting that one. Keen gets hit up. Expecial trying to follow through, but nobody's there as he puts Unbreakable Will on. And still very, very safe from both teams. It's going to be the Dragon and the Rundown now. They're walking parallel to each other through the jungle of Team Liquid's side. I don't so even now know if mid grab the turret here. for their Okay, they do have the wave. I couldn't see it under Altex coin coming up on the minimap, but they have exactly what they need. Rek'Sai coming back out. The pressure may push them off, but it's not going to be enough. Good ward over the wall lets them know everything that's happening. Yeah, I mean, Sivir ult down, but that's the only thing that Gravity really burned in that. So just trading the last outer turret here for a dragon is actually quite good for Team Liquid. Uh, this stage in the game is when the 6% starts to. Yeah. actually matter, um, as well as slowing down that stack for Gravity. Now Gravity are actually going to have to play around, you know, coming up with a pick, a deep, a deep ward home guard teleport flank for Haunter, or a side lane play. Let's see this one more time. Haunter did come down, but the, uh, everybody held on the alts. So the early smite again Four. for Dominate. So Dominate actually has had a trend of early smiting with you know, almost single digit HP left on the objective. Yeah. This time it's picked up by Quas, but that is, it has cost them objectives before, and it's something that has, you know, emerged as a trend from Dominate. So, uh, gotta be a little bit careful with those early smites. Move not able to get it in anyway, though, so Team Liquid secure the dragon and get their 6%. Also, they've been able to shift Haunter down to the bottom side of the map. He can get his split push on. Yep. Start to get a bit tanky Not after be. burning, uh, after building his Trinity Force. Too tough for him. See a lot of glacial shrouds coming out for gravity here as they want to try to shut down Piglet if this game starts to go long. Still trying to use that home guard Triforce. Haven't seen the home guard come into play yet. We got Pouncer kind of walked into the last dragon fight, so gravity hasn't really executed on what they brought to the table just yet. Only seeing them getting picked off around the map. Sorcery Elixir for Phoenix here, as they know they're going to be getting another fight soon. Let's see if Hunter can work his way around. He's walking over. See, so they won't have the extra speed, but should be able to dissuade Team Liquid from posting up at the turret. Remember, this Team Liquid team, they're about split pushing. Mm -hmm. They've got Vayne as their AD carry, very low range. Uh, their siege, not that great. Victor himself doesn't like uh, to stand close to a turret either, because he has no dash of his own, right. and it could be a very vulnerable target for a Gragas ultimate. A well-placed ultimate from move uh, could absolutely wreck Team Liquid. If you get Victor into a bad spot. He did a good job so far, though. Keen, uh, or uh, Phoenix, excuse me, was able to zone as the shockwave from Keen yeah. in the last fight. He's not playing in their favor to the side of gravity just yet. The early game looked good for them, but they didn't act on it. We've seen a lot of teams go for the fast turrets and then kind of fizzle out. 
where both teams continue to mirror each other until somebody gets the picks or that objective. Yeah, I mean, this game is going so slowly that it all hinges on the next, uh, on a team fight. You, yeah. We're not gonna get really ad any advantages pulled out by a single skirmish or a single player. Uh, even Piglet has been fairly tame and he's been content to static shiv, farm the side waves. Now that he's got his Infinity Edge yeah. on top of the early static shiv, you know, he's really got the extra damage from the synergy of the crit build on top of Infinity Edge. Right. Maybe we see him go for one of those plays, but might just go ahead and continue to wait until it gets Blade. Reflecting back on uh, Keen's mid lane champions as well, this really puts him in a position to play safe. I mean, he's not a utility champion as opposed to a Jarvan in the mid lane, a Rumble, a Cassiopeia, and Azir just eating people up. Yeah, we'll definitely keep our eye Slows on the ball to look for his level 16 now Shockwave that's powered by yep. the three, the trinity of items for <laughs> mid lane. Got him. He's got a lot of power behind that Shockwave. We haven't seen one hit yet. Uh, so, got some fancy may feet. underestimate how much damage that will do, especially if you get that correct combo, yep. getting the distortion in as well. Team Liquid's been able to dance these fights very well. Nobody surrounds themselves around that ball. Nobody groups up either if they're trying to escape. It's very hard for Fiend or Keen to get any of those ultimates in. Still waiting for a possible delivery from Haunter, but they have to be aware of Move's ultimate as well. The fight could be pretty chaotic actually for that Shockwave. They yeah. hit everything right. What I, I feel the key for Gravity is gonna be using this, the Sivir ultimate effectively. All you have to do is work around the Narbar. If you see Quas transform yep. out of Mega Nar, then you know you've got a nice window to work around where he can't generate rage. And even if he teleports into a fight, it will have a very low effect on the fight. Here's a Silver Ultimate to try and get a cutoff on Nar, especially. Hanser is going to try and keep track of him. Flash is there. Oh, no. Are they going to go for Baron? There's yeah, wards there's on the Baron. The, that was actually Gravity's ping to Baron. They realized the move they were trying to make to get down there and then it would be a lot safer to now go for Baron. Teleports up for Quas. We're gonna get the heal off here from Liquid. And Quas did more damage to Hanser in the exchange while Hanser was trying to corner him for the rest of the team. Team Liquid faint onto Baron and just the threat clearing out those yeah. boards. Gravity are forced to pull off of their chase. An interesting attempt. Gravity hoping it could have, lead, could have led to Dragon. Hunter going back for home guard effect. He's locked in, TP's up for him. His closest war doesn't actually look like it's gonna oh, be behind the right team. Behind oh yeah, you're right, up by the blue on the side of Team Liquid. It would be Just perfect for him to commit. He's running out of base. The team yeah. is not gonna get Dragon Special very close to going down, but they huh. don't know. I believe where Nara is coming in. Quas is gonna make Wow, super safe play this game. And Team Liquid are able to walk away with Dragon number two. They are zoned out of the mid lane. So once again, Gravity looking to trade a mid lane turret, but now they want to fight it. On to Phoenix. Gets blasted around. He's going to be able to throw down his Zanyas, but he flashes over the wall nicely. Didn't know if it was up from the other oh. side, and Gravity still wanted the kill. Chaos Storm raining down hell on Gravity and dominates over the wall. No Seeker to take his prey out, but the hit comes in from Altec to take down Dominate in a tunneling mistake. Look out. There's so many tunnels there. They're just picking up gold off the crowd for all of Gravity. Everyone's standing on it and getting a piece of the gold. Wow, that, that was, was just so an awkward sort of fight right there because they force Phoenix out of the fight by chunking him so early, but then walk back to the wall that he just flashed over, allowing him to get the ultimate off over the wall. And then it's Dominate's decision to re-enter the fight trying to finish off move, yeah. which ends up costing him control of the map because of the crit from Altec. That just seemed like an, an expect the unexpected fight from Gravity. If the dragon was over, everybody was walking back, and Hauntzer just gallops into the jungle and says, hey, look, a fight. Yeah, everybody's sort of walking on eggshells yeah. in this game. It's like, oh, they're probably just coming into ward and get vision. No, you're dead. Hauntzer moved, decided to go for the first, you know, actual aggressive move in the, pretty much the whole game. Yeah. And it does force him over to the other side of the wall. But both of them separated from the healing from Bunny Foo Foo. And basically, the Chaos Storm just baited wow. Dominate in. That one. Pretty sure Move saved himself with his passive there, too. Yeah. Uh, he, as well as a shield from right, yeah. Bunny Foo Foo, just uh, a little bit of baiting there. Yep. I guess. Good plays. And the importance was not really the kill on Dominate, it was the 
uh, control of the map that they lost because of they, they had that player down and losing that turret because of it. So another turret stacked up there for gravity at the cost of that dragon. Well, gravity's huh. first kill. <laughs> Four kills, 34 minutes in. These teams have been next to each other quite a bit. This TP's down here for Quas and Honker. Uh, Hanser. Honker, yeah. Going to be running up the mid lane to get himself back to the action. Two to two on Dragons. Should be up for a bit. The double Frozen Heart completed yeah. from Gravity as well. Banner of Command on Bunny Fufu too. Oh, if they ever do get to pull off a Baron Bait, then that could be a mm -hmm. game winning. Push. Hard for Piglet to get in, and then they still have more to worry about in lanes now. That double Frozen Heart. Um, Move and Hunter have pretty much been in the same area of the battlefield anyway, but it will be very effective against everybody except for Phoenix. Right, yeah, you gotta think Quas is gonna be trying to get that hyper stacked up as well as Narbar, that'll slow that down. He's not getting beat on to make it go up, so. Pretty easy to get in range of Bane as well. Yeah, absolutely. Short, short attack range. Finally, they're kind of setting up for this fight in the mid lane. So remember the vulnerability of the victor, right? To the Gragas especially. Yep. And Mu did get a good Gragas ult on him last fight to mm -hmm. gain that positioning. This time around, Phoenix does not have flash, so we'll be cautious. He has also gone with a Lich Bane. So Phoenix on this victor is looking to be in auto attack range, which is risky, especially now that he does not have that flash. He'll have to work around it, see if he can keep up and dodge the necessary dive mm -hmm. on Gravity. They actually don't even have to focus Piglet first. Phoenix is a decent target. Oh, they don't have eyes on this one. Hauntzer comes in for the home guard. Ooh, has gonna to hold out. Yeah, ult himself out of that one. Chaos Storm is still following Gravity here. It's going to be Move that gets stuck. Move taken down. There's the Lich Bane pow empowered Q from Phoenix on that victor. And you can see the damage just chunking down one of the more tanky members. So Team Gravity. Oh, oh absolutely zeroed out with the dissonance and the rest of the damage assist as well going to the team. Phoenix not expecting that. And Keen and the rest of the team now going to chase in. Haunter could close this gap enough, but it looks like the base gate will be utilized here by Dominate. And they're going to be able to get the safety. Pressure on the inhibitor turret coming in here from Gravity. They can get Haunter back on that with that Sheen. It'll be nice. It's special, a little too close along with Quas. They are really trying to stop this inhibitor turret from going down, and I think they have successfully done so. Well, one more wave here. Gravity actually not even going to wait for it. They pushed down the turret. Never mind. Brute Force, all techs the one to take the turret. Team Liquid can't even guess about going back in or think about it, rather. It, you know, in and out of Dragon, though, could be number three for Liquid here. You know, Rivet, something about the travel time of Oriana Ball that you just never really expect Flash Oriana plays, and it makes them all that much more Some exciting. Some of my favorite. Yeah, just because when you pull it out, it is uh, so unexpected. But Phoenix, even with the travel time of the ball, he's not able to zone as that flash play from Keen. So here's sort of the scattered engage from Gravity, where Move and Hauntzer this time around not able to engage at the exact same time, and it costs um, Move his life because especially able to headbutt him back into the team. Uh, Bunny Poo was able to get the knockup to interrupt Quash's re-engage there, but this is all key. So he had about 700 and the shield. Yeah. No, uh... So, GG. Not able to react in time. I'm pretty sure that uh, Phoenix still had his Zonia's active ready. He did yeah. not use it on the Hauntzer engage, so... Oh. Well, he doesn't have any magic resistance either. Got Going it. for the Morello Namakon to start off right yeah, into this, the Zonia, so. this melee victor... Yeah. Well, not melee, but <laughs> auto-attack range victor build. The semi-mobile melee range victor. <laughs> Bottom lane, taking quite a beating from a massive wave of caster minions that's actually getting another siege wave coming in. Huh. That kind of needs some tending to, but it looks like it's gonna grab the turret first. It goes to the wayside. Dragon is alive. Haunter's trying to go in. There's the condemned back. Onslaught of Shadows oh, completely misses. Piglet now has the kite he needs to take the fight. And Gravity now needs to rethink this one as they head back towards the mid lane. They're gonna march. Team Liquid to the beat of their own drum. And that they was... say, we want the inhibitor instead of the fight. Those were some... Oh, flash, flash. Okay. The disengage instead of the engage here from Gravity. is going to be going down. The guy that they really need to cause chaos in the fights. 50 seconds on these death timers now. Team Liquid able to re-engage there and get uh, control of Baron Pit. They already have double pink wards 
in the area and sweep it as well, just to make sure. But Piglet, I have to say, that was impressive to dodge every ability from Hunter. Yeah. Perfectly timed the Condemn, able to tumble out of the ultimate. Nice advantage gained there. And he's showing his mastery of the champion. Absolutely. Unfortunately, not playing the SKT game. Huh. Only pulls it out for special occasions. Yeah. So Banner of Command would be amazing for the bot lane right now. That is, oh, wow. That is growing. Only pick her for the side of Team Liquid. They get Dragon instead of... Are they going to get two turrets and an inhibitor turret and an outer turret off a minion wave? There's Hunter. He's back. Only took 50 seconds of its death time before somebody was able to get back to it and a fight. Honestly... But Gravity's thinking they may, might lose too much map control just leaving for that. And they were probably right. Yeah. I mean, both of these teams, very non-committal. They're only poking at each other. It's also It also speaks to the quality of the disengage that the players have been pulling off. Some decent, you know, defensive maneuvers from both yeah. teams. But neither team opting for all-in as far as any of the team fights have been concerned. Very, very quick to disengage rather than go for the full commitment of a team fight. And yep. we still have yet to see any sort of game-changing swing. Pretty much dead even still. Definitely a one and done. Someone gets caught, the fight's over. And that was after a dragon, after a turret. Yeah. Really not extending these fights out too much. I mean, Gravity have some of the best disengage skills in the game in mm -hmm. Gragas and Janna plus the Sivir speed advantage that they have really gives them the option of disengaging. Hanser, though, again, he doesn't have Flash. That's Talisman of Ascension. He has a team, though. They have a special Unbreakable Will very, very late, which still makes him look like a tasty target. He flashes over the tri brush to safety. Quas, level 17, gets knocked back here, and it looks like they may have enough to take him down. We've seen this before. It gives Team Liquid time to catch up in the fight. Is that what happens this time, though? It seems as it's worth, and Gravity are choosing oh! the right targets. The Zanya's at the perfect time. Keen still has his as well. To Zanya's in a bad situation. Now they're able to focus on to dominate. That time of Phoenix pausing gave Gravity the time they needed to look at their targets, prioritize, and snap down onto the right ones, taking down Quas and dominate. And what we said were going to be these long, extended fights. Be even though they're chunked out really low, because of the teleport and the shields of both Orion and Janna, the yeah. Baron is a very real possibility for Gravity here. They should be able to get this. There's no jungler, yeah. not even a top laner for Team Liquid. So this is going to be pretty much Baron going down and then a quick shove to one of the side lanes for Gravity. Because yep. of that victory, they should be able to get a pretty much a 4,000 gold swing off the back of this Baron and trying to take down some outer turrets. But let's take a look here. Maybe this is a call from Piglet uh, looking for one of those uh, 2v2 scenarios, 2v1 scenarios. It was kind of like we're more powerful than the situation, we think. Wanted to go for one of the aggressive plays. He life steals off the wave here yeah. and tries to re-enter, but because his special was chunked so low on Alistar and had to pop his ult, they're down a man in the, in the team fight anyway. So it would basically be a four on five at that point. Ooh, once Quas gets cornered, then they pretty much only have three members left, and it's a massacre here. Even though Phoenix is able to zone use this time, uh, the Shockwave, yeah. that's going to be Gravity chasing them down. Relentless. Piglet's still doing damage, but with Hanser knowing that damage isn't really zeroing him out, he stays in the fight a little bit longer each time. These guys really know the boundaries and the champions they bring to the table. This is... Yeah, this has really been uh, one of those defensive games where the first time we see... It's hard to win when you're always playing defense, Kobe. Well, we, the first time we see an overextension with an offensive call right. there, yeah, yeah. it's a Sivir answer, and they punish it so heavily. Gravity with some really good uh, counter-engage there off of Altex ulti. Let's see if they can. They're not actually going to go for the outer turrets and get that big golden gold swing. Right. I was looking for. They're actually just going straight for the inhibitor. Want to get the extra presence on the map with the super minions up mid. Ooh. That command minion doing quite a bit of damage from the back. Banner command already used once in the bot lane by Bunny Fufu to clear up that wave. It actually called Quas down to the bottom lane for a bit, which did affect the last fight we saw towards the top side of the map there. 
Liam is still waiting for his teleport to come back up. Has to join the team now. Let's see if Gravity can get another push as they wait for this minion wave to meet them up towards the inhibitor turret. Five to four here as we're reaching 44 minutes. The gold's only 3,000 in the lead for Gravity. Such a calm game here from Gravity. And Bunny Foo Foo taking up that shot calling role. Really coming into his own. Yeah. See if they can keep up the siege here and spread out. Really, they need, need to watch the uh, flank here from Quas. He's pretty much prepped his rage bar. He's looking for that multi man Nar ult. Bunny Foo Foo is just sticking on all tech. Perfect positioning here. He's ready with the ulti. Move, looking for that Grog Assault. They can just Grog Assault to try and burn down the turret. But it looks like they this do is, want to save it for a team fight. This is tough for Quas. I figured Quas would almost want to be in the fight here, trying yeah. to get his Narbar up on minions with the team. No flash after this that. This could be difficult. Special's in on this one. There goes Haunter to the back line. It's kind of pausing the fight. They're stalemate and trying to figure out which target they can take down. A good hit coming in there. Dominates very, very low, though, as they get a good amount of damage onto Keen. Everybody's piled up into one spot, but Chaos Storm cannot come out at the right time. They're able to start shutting down Team Liquid. A double kill for Piglet as he finds his mark, but they are still pushed back into their wow. base. Great boomerang blade coming in from Alltech as they get a finalizing fight to tie up the kills and start to open up the base a little bit more onto Team Liquid. All right, two inhibitors down is going to give them so, so much control. Dragons back up in five seconds. That will be number four. Gravity with a pretty good hold on the game now. Also, since they, that siege took so long with the Baron buff, all of Team Liquid's wards have expired on the map. Yep. So the only thing they can do is defensively ward their own jungle and hope for some you know, lapse in judgment from gravity and a split move through the jungle to try and pick somebody off. All right, let's oh. take another look here. This is the special flash. Ooh, he was trying to go for a combo there. Yep. The headbutt not in range, so it came out as a flash pulve onto nothing. And then you can easily knock it back in. Uh, Gravity make the call to Grog Assault the Alstar back, which is usually not the option, but without Black Ooh, Pulp, right on the edge. no danger there. Piglet here does his best to turn this around. Gets a pretty good move on Haunter there, but Phoenix being so low, they lose a lot of presence from the back line, and Quas is not able to tank on the front. One last, better duck. Short attack, can't duck. move there. But they pick him up anyway. Dragon should go over to Gravity as they've got the pressure from double super minion lines. And just a, uh, you know, a cautiously played, a well-played map from Gravity, waiting until they actually got a large advantage. Oh, boy. With. Headstrong Haunter over here. <laughs> Not worried about anything. Like the team Zero Cares in the world as they approach the last outer turret. That's why it only had about 500 HP on it. One quick whack from Monster's Guitar. He rocks out with the rest of the team. Coming up on just under 50 minutes in this game. The final inhibitor turret looking to fall as Quas is still looking to charge that bar in the top lane and come in with some kind of fight that takes Gravity by surprise. He's gnawing out already and not participating in the fight. The team calls off any type of engagement, I guess. And they just hold, hold steady. Yep. Gravity are content with this situation, though. All they have to do is just sit here and wait for the beefy super minions to walk into the base. There's an ulti on the hunt as they think that Team Liquid is going to engage on the fight. They saw that Quas was coming in and figured something might happen. And now Gravity's actually going to go in without the ultimate on their side. The inhibitor turret actually it does just go down. They're able to fight under it now. And that's going to be Dominate falling as Gravity kites backward nicely. Quas trying to hold them off as Haunter has already fallen in the fight. But Team Liquid slowly losing their base each time. They're not coming up with an advantage on these engages. Cannot even get in. It's special zeroed out and dunked by Alltech as he comes in for the engage. That could be it here. Liquid heading for their found for Solace. The Nexus turrets have already fallen now. Nine to eight. They finally start turning things on from the side of Gravity, able to pinch down and suffocate Team Liquid here in the late game. All right, so that should be able to clean it up here for Gravity. What a victory. That's going to move them up to try and uh, take that first spot next yep. week. Make them look really good. Seven and three once they finish the Nexus. Coming into this with 
six and three, the same as Team Liquid. And they do set themselves apart. One last hit, the ball cannot make it. Oh! Catches him on just the end. And Gravity will have the 2-0 on the summer split over Team Liquid. Get these out of here, I don't need these headphones. I don't need these. Gravity just looking stronger and stronger each week. Came down again to the last two picks for Gravity. They have champion and select the same way. They weren't flex picks this time, but we still see them going down that path. Using champion select is something they can try to get a lead, and we see that time they didn't. And it was a much slower game, especially from Keen in that mid lane. Couldn't be playing anything that was aggressive, that killed. The Orianna was safe. And we saw how long it took him to ramp up there. Yeah. They didn't seem worried, though. Neither did Team Liquid. It didn't seem like either team was falling behind. They were just okay with what was happening. Gravity showing a lot more versatility here. Yeah. Liquid playing a very, very safe early game themselves. Phoenix getting his Azir band out is the first thing from the side of Gravity. And he was not able to produce the results that he usually does on his victory. Team Liquid, no Azir for Phoenix. Yeah. So, no four versus one. <laughs> <laughs> None of that nonsense. With the good, sometimes comes the bad. Unfortunately, it started to trickle that way for Team Liquid after they engaged around the Barons. Haunts her with a few plays that were really unexpected. The time they just Impulse versus Cloud9 for our next match today. And yesterday, Cloud9 were able to pick up their third win against Team Dragon Knights as they slowly claw their way back up the standings. Right, they did get a win. Uh, it was against the last place team that were fielding subs, but they really need to keep climbing and they are gonna have to aim higher. Team Impulse, they're yeah. just one game ahead of them. So this is a perfect target for Cloud9. Team Impulse also have a very clear play style and traditionally one of Cloud9's biggest strengths has been their preparation. So i definitely looking to see if they can plan specifically around this team uh, and get uh, a team composition for Team Impulse to react to their yeah. style of play. That clear play style of chaos <laughs> in itself. <laughs> well, it's just a high tempo style. Exactly. Yeah. And while Cloud9 are slowly rebuilding their team, yesterday it looked like Team Impulse's problems were still looming. Yeah, I mean, Xiao Xiao did mention in his interview as well that the team, they're still struggling to fix those communication issues uh, that, of course, were going to be a big deal uh, putting together this team. Mm -hmm. Uh, the losses also seem like they're starting to wear on team morale now, uh, specifically Rush. I remember when he came into this league, he was just so excited, and he came in with so much drive, and he had these lofty aspirations of taking over the entire league, right. and he had a lot of enthusiasm and confidence in himself. But it seems like the slow start to the split has you know, sort of curbed his enthusiasm a little bit. Well, let's see if he can get things back into gear. We'll check out the starting lineups now and get into the game. On the blue side, it's Team Impulse. That's Impact in the top lane, Rush in the jungle, Xiaowei Zhao in the mid, Apollo at 80 carry, Adrian at support, and Fly as coach. And on the red side, it's Cloud9. Up top is Balls in the jungle, Meteos, mid, Incarnation, 80 carry, Sneaky, support, Lemon Nation, and of course, Coach Charlie. And got to say, yesterday's words from Lemon Nation were a little discouraging, especially for fans, maybe. He seemed quite down, but in a way that also means Cloud9 knows the severity of the position they're yeah. in right now. And obviously, you're making changes to it's, get out of it. This pervasive depression is kind of all yeah. over all the North American teams right now, actually. Everybody looking to have perfect play, mm -hmm. but nobody there. It's nobody very, really close either. Very difficult, especially when it seems that it's, it's just fizzled out here. Even with Incarnation coming in, it didn't really fill the shoes that needed to be filled in a sense. Medios' shot calling, he says, has kind of been a thing that he's not so sure of himself. So with those repaired, Cloud9 could definitely come back riding into the horizon for their fans. We'll see though, it's been a tough, tough road. Impulse as well, four and five coming into the season so far. Struggling to find the way to get back in, saying the break really put them back and they haven't been able to get that mojo going. All right, so Rumble's still on the board here yep. for Cloud9. Alistar is also still available, very high priority pick. And one of the two uh, Cinder Hulk early ganking junglers have been banned in Rek'Sai. So Gragas, mm -hmm. Alistar, as well as Rumble 
pretty high priority in this matchup versus Cloud9. It looks like Impulse willing to give the champion over to Cloud9 or willing to first pick it yep. for Impact. Echo last ban. Causing Cloud9 to wonder a little bit what is a bigger priority, and it is taking away that Gragas, making sure they don't get a first pick. So the junglers do get bans in this game, something we hadn't seen in the last two. Let me see what teams begin to favor here. The alley does, however, get picked up. A real priority pick that the teams have been going after and banning quite a bit. Cloud9 to decide now. Supports have been shown. What is Balls' is pretty much first pick here? I mean... He's looking at 17 and 0 in North American there. LCS on Rumble. Yeah. Uh, so that's impact. That's always a quite good a few pick plays. for Cloud9. Uh, but yeah, the Alstar, definitely nobody going to argue with that first pickup. Man, we've heard Zion Spartan say, I will not make the mistake again of giving balls Rumble. <laughs> I would never do it. Never going to happen. Is, impact is not Zion. He's not Zion. Uh, that's for damn sure. And the Alistar, I feel like that's really just too hard for Impulse to pass up because they love going for tower dives. They yeah. love going for those early that moves and hard initiation. Alistar brings everything to Team Impulse. They can also combo with Sivir. So yeah. Cloud9, if they're, you know, this Team Impulse team, they're looking to prep against it. Two of the biggest picks for Team Impulse are Alistar and Sivir. Yeah. And yeah, they've Sivir both gone call. through this pick bans, while as Medios has opted for the early Nocturne, which is technically a takeaway from Very much Rush. So. However, Rush was Nocturne ulting in onto supports a lot yesterday, so. I say it's either the Lee or the Evelyn for him, and to give up the Sivir here would be a little crazy. I'm sure Sneaky would love to take that away. It's almost a prerequisite here for Team Impulse's composition. So, thinking it might just be that Sivir. So, the thing is, Nocturne is actually quite good against Sivir. Yeah. Because um, he can ult in on her, and even if the spell shield's there, you all you really have to do is keep up speed with your trail from mm -hmm. the Deathbringer, and you can almost match Sivir's speed. You can almost keep up with her. I, I'm very interested to see what type of smite Meteos takes as well. Um, for his diving in onto Sivir, because they're very much expecting this from Team Impulse. In Team Impulse, as we said, very clear play style. These yeah. three picks <laughs> are quintessential Impulse picks. This is Rush on his Lee Sin as well, so they are just tripling down on that uh, early high tempo style. Get a seventh play of Sivir in there in the nine games so far. Now 10 coming out of Team Impulse. What does Cloud9 have? Nocturne definitely been seeing a bit of resurgence here as teams continue to ban out the top junglers. And Echo is there in there as well now, considering Medios to play that. Definitely still have the Kog'Maw for Incarnation. Can stay on the back line this game, but already have a bit of AP. Does he go Jace? Keep poking the team here. What can they decide? Or what will they decide, I should say? They make it easy. They let Incarnation Round out the composition with last pick as it comes back around in the Jinx. Annie, actually a lot of Kaboom there coming in for the team fights. Yeah, but so they do power. have the combo of fire and fire, yeah. which is the Annie and Rumble, <laughs> which is a pretty uh, big tool for mid-game team fights. However, Annie does uh, sometimes have a problem with Alistar uh, when you transition to the team fight phase. Mm -hmm. um, Alistar's pretty good at trying to zone her out and nullify the flash tibbers, um, headbutting her away, being able to ult out of her stun and tank in front of her, um, especially when sped up by Sivir. So uh, Le Lemonation's gonna have his work cut out for him to try and get into a good position yep. for his flash stun. Um, but he could take focus off of Impulse rushing towards Sneaky. The lock-in of Sneaky on Jinx as well. No dash on that AD carry, always a bit worrisome versus Team Impulse who like to charge the back line and dive you, but uh, sneaky confident in his positioning to pull it off. Oh. More Oriana. I'm enjoying this second day of week what five. What a setup there e easily too. A point and click delivery yeah. for the Oriana ball. Especially with a Jinx now, that's gonna be tough for Sneaky. Yeah, uh, looks pretty scary. They do have the darkness to work with. They can- That's a good point. You know, cover the, work with the cover of darkness for uh, their mid game fight and try to hope that they can cut off Team Impulse because if they have poor communication mm -hmm. and you Nocturne ult, 
then you can really pull apart a team. Even, yep. this is what a lot of teams uh, would do against TSM way back in when they were in their prime and uh, had control over all of North America. Sometimes Reginald would get, um, go for initiations, and if you had Nocturne on your team, you could cut off the rest of TSM, yep. and they would uh, fall apart and be disorganized. But if Team Impulse, all they're saying is go forward, go forward, go forward, then yeah. they're still just going to go the same direction. I do. Because of that, I actually like that last Victor pick coming in from Cloud9. Let's see the plays here. Gravity in Week 2, and he did play it against TDK yesterday. So Incarnation feeling good on Gravity. He's got three members, a Maokai, a Lee Sin, and an Alistar that could be jumping on him. Very easy members to Chaos Storm in that balled-up situation. Bit of a disengaged defensive play there with that Victor. Hopefully they can turn it into some offense throughout the game as well. Now Cloud9 would like to start getting those wins in as it's been Ooh, a hurtful, hurtful would season they ever. in that record book for them. Four and five for Team Impulse. And it's time to start flooding Twitter with your game predictions. As always, send your picks with either hashtag TIP win or hashtag C9win to at LOL Esports. We'll make sure we tally those up throughout the game. Team Impulse did get their Sivir. They have the composition pretty much that they want as long as they get that. We'll see if Cloud9 got what they want. Balsher did. He got his rumble in the top lane. All right, we'll see if he can make it 18 and zero North American LCS all time. That'd be crazy. On that champion. Pretty crazy. I wasn't, wasn't Fakers LeBlanc somewhere around 16, 17, 18? I think it was 16 before he played it against uh, Pawn in the mid lane against the Morgana at MSI. I wonder what the longest record is for that in professional play. And Apollo, speaking ring. of the side of Impulse, puts a lot of blame for Sneaky's recent lackluster games on the rest of Cloud9. So I think Sneaky right now definitely is a above average AD carry, but yeah, his team is holding him back a bit. Um, it's hard for an AD carry right now to make a huge impact in the game. It's, it has to do with like playing as a team, like your jungle, mid, top, everything. So it's, yeah, it just, once their team starts to do well, you'll see him shine a lot more. 30 seconds until spawn. Yeah, Sneaky has been assistant player for Cloud9 for a long time. Gonna be very difficult on Jinx. Versus uh, Sivir boosted. Yeah. Alistar Maokai looking for the back line. This is like you went to the menu of difficulty and you selected just above the hard. It's like normal, hard, just above hard. Well, at least at least there's no Nocturne on the other team. <laughs> That's true. Get half a screen away with the point and click. He'll have his work cut out for him this game. You can see Balls Rumble stats there. 86% kill yeah. participation on top of it as well. He likes light people on fire. All right. Well, deep boards there for Cloud9. It's got the lane swap. Looks like Ooh. they're going for the strong side invade as well. So strong side start for Impulse, yep. whereas it's a strong side invade from Cloud9. Um, and they should be able to split uh, jungle quadrants here. Ability Tome start from Balls as well here. So Flamespit are going to help to crush through the jungle and yeah. his potions. Get to a fast haunting guys for himself. Clear quicker. Yep. So, may have another bit of a slow early game. Well, Jungler's kind of hanging out here. So the dual lane, nobody was up there to group up the minions, so they're not going to try the and top, freeze. Right. They're going to try and push. Uh, they did the Gromp instead. Oh, wow, it just Already it froze for themselves. It froze without them even being there. And they will be able to keep it there if they so choose. Just going to split jungle yep. across the map here. Uh, for both teams. Everybody pretty much dead even here, as far as the clear speed goes so far. Also some early roam here from Alistar, as Adrian looks to join the duo in a gank attempt, rather than oh. sitting in lane and leeching more experience. This looks like it could work out very well. The flash coming in perfectly from Incarnation. That's worth for him. Yep. But then maybe rinse and repeat for Impulse to come back. Splitting that combo, able to flash right as the headbutt goes in. And they're able to remove a lot of that threat from the Alistar. But again, Victor, no dash for himself. Now, no, no uh, flash. Has to be very, very careful in this matchup. Especially just against Xiao Wei Xiao himself, bringing Ignite to the mid lane. Sometimes you see barrier for Orianas or something else as well, but he has that kill pressure on Incarnation. It comes down to it with the heal. 
Ellie once again. Oh boy, it looks like they just want everything under the turret here. You can see Xiao Wei Xiao pushing huh. the lane in as hard as possible. I feel like Incarnation has to know something's going on. Xiao Wei not giving any aggression up on this one. They go right for him. Rush is the first one to tank it, and they do it very nicely. Taking I, down Incarnate. I like the adaptation. Because you get reduced value of sending your other champions to attack a turret this early in the game, there's reduced damage taken from champions. They instead go for the first blood money off of middle before then having the extra time to head bottom or secure Jagan right now. Pretty much Impulse yeah. have their pick of the litter right now of what objectives they want to go for. Apollo by himself also got solo experience due to committing everyone to mid instead. So he's got the experience boost when they do meet back up with Sneaky. As well as that first blood money going over to impact on Maokai. So the other side of the lane swap when they meet back up. He'll have some extra cash to work with. The fact that that happening is pretty rare too. Usually you see a team say, all right, we'll come back in a bit. They literally went back to the same spot and did it as quick as possible. Impulse knowing where they can get their advantages, and they might even start to pressure even harder down towards this mid lane. We'll see where Adrian goes. He's not going towards the bot lane just yet. He's ready to roam still, so they may try to get more ganks on these lanes. At least wards to come out. You see Medios farming up his Raptors. Should be good to come back with his item. Yep, Nocturne very happy with an evenly split lane swap a scenario. Uh, yes, Cloud9 would have liked to avoid the <laughs> action mid, mm -hmm. but getting Nocturne to level 6 as soon as possible is always the goal, as well as avoiding the uh, early aggression of Lee Sin. Didn't work out for them, though. The early aggression still came in from Team Impulse. They were still able to find their mark. Let's see what they can do with it, though. Uh, Lee Sin, uh, Rush, and, Rush and Impact have been yeah. able to combine for some very strong early plays. This ward, though, from Balls should keep him safe, and he can try to waste some time. Yeah, rush. nicely done. I don't know about waste, though. Took a 200 damage about in that combo. Could be a way back. They pinged the tri brush, and that ward died on the top side, so they may be able to come back themselves. But they are just saying, keep an eye on the tri brush to make sure they don't try to come down here gonna gank themselves. Medios is still on the bottom side of his jungle though, so nothing will come of that. Xiao Wei Xiao is also free of pressure here, but they get knowledge of Medios. So a lot of little things happening here the teams may be able to work off of. It looks like everybody's content with just keeping the farm as is. Yeah, Medios, uh, not only did he get a couple of lane minions, but he's also to mm -hmm. sneak away a camp there, uh, steal it from out from under Rush, uh, increasing the CS advantage that he has over Rush. Comes up, he does have the Raptor buff as well, so he knows wow. there's no ward there, but sees the Sapling Throne. That's the thing, right? He just went through mid lane, whether or not Impact knew that from the call. He just kind of said, you know, maybe 15, 20 seconds, I'm gonna Sapling this top brush. Hey, look, I found a Medios. So, again, what I was talking about last game, where mm -hmm. you see your, your Wraiths are counter jungled, you gotta assume there's a ward in there as well, and Medios has left one in that Wraith bush, so. Uh, Rush can work around the knowledge that they have seen him enter this side of the map. They do have a pink ward on bottom, but difficult to pull that dive off yeah. unless they call in a teleport as well. It is something that we have seen, though. The jungler bringing a ward with them for an early gank uh, to have a teleport assist assisted gank from the top laner. Impulse, though, take down the turret, shove up so that they can just get a dragon. The advantages of uh, yeah. being on the bottom side of the lane swap. Very nicely done. May even try to go for a quick gank here in the bot as well. On the hunt is up for Sivir. And it looks like we're going to get Sneaky to back off already. You can see the first dragon timers for these teams. Really not kind of matching what's on the stats. But they go for it early. If Impulse can do it, they will try. Medios just hard farming, trying to get to that level 6 off of the red camp. Probably will get close and one more. At that point, mm -hmm. what lane does he even go for, though? Try and punish this bottom lane that's extending really far into the jungle. Actually, Impulse are getting their recall off because they don't have the deep wards to back it up. Good call there from Impulse as their bottom lane recalls just as Medios does hit that 6 mark. 
Carnation double summoners back up as well, so. A play on mid though is always fairly risky versus Orianna because Nocturne commits all the way in and she can easily take off the spell shield before getting a shockwave off. So if Shao Wei Shao gets back to his turret, yeah. uh, you have to be very careful uh, about a turnaround gank there. You have to know where Rush is before you go for one of these early moves. First uh, ultimate from Nocturne does determine a lot of his snowball potential for the rest of the game. Yeah, and Medios has actually farmed himself up pretty well, something we've been seeing him do the past few weeks. Oh no, he's going Cinder Hulk. They're not a damage farm. Nocturne. No. They do have a damage lease. Plenty of other sources of damage for uh, for the Cloud9 squad, though, so they do want a tank. Uh, the only thing is that Nocturne doesn't really have any innate scaling with health. He's just trying to get to be a Strong body on the front line. Was it last season or two seasons ago? Towards the end, he played that tank. But yeah, he's played it. He's played it both ways. Nocturne. He's played it full damage. He's <laughs> like played it tank before as well. Um, we have seen it. It was also used in China as tank. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, That's true. Also, also damage there too. So both ways in this team comp, though. You're right, though. There is a lot of damage to come in for these fights. Yeah, they've got. Uh, Plenty of other sources won't be a problem for them. Should be seeing one of those quite soon. See what pans out here towards the top lane. Maybe at least a 2v2 between the junglers. Slowly moving on the mini map as Incarnation and Xiao Wei Xiao continue to push, push each other in with the blue buff. Top lane fizzles out. Just a bunch of warden coming from the junglers to keep everybody safe. Medios back down to mid. Level 6 for him and level 6 for Rush as well. So making sure everybody's matched up here. They, they really want to make this... Uh, Flash play here. Elimination level six wants to get the stun to start it all off. Oh boy. Great flash by Shao Wei Shao. They still want it right under the turret. And that's because the rocket was the follow up over the shoulder of his teammates. They get the kill into Shao Wei Shao. There's your Cloud9 coordination for you. Everybody mid with the ultimates. Lemonation sets it up. The stun lands even as the flash uh, gets right. pulled off. So even though he got the flash off under turret, Medios commits to it and the rocket straight down the middle. Since it was a straight line flash, still hits. That's the thing. Everybody uh, will flash in straight lines unless they train themselves yeah. to flash <laughs> Perpendicular, at an, at perpendicular an to any skill shot. It's Plus, there was no way he could see that coming. Sneaky was sitting in the middle between their own. That's true. They were all at a really here, good so range. He was out of vision. The rocket had time to speed up. This is like a gank like this is also reminiscent of Cloud9 setting up a gank that kind of if the first part fails or kind of misaligns, there's still something else that's going to follow up. They're yeah. sure that it's going to work in some way or another in their advantage. That Nobody would be goes. heartbreaking for the team. If that was turned around, if, <laughs> if Xiao Xiao lived uh, from that, they committed yeah. everything. The Flash Nocturne Ultimate right. used the Flash Ult from uh, Elimination as well. So, Cloud9 though, uh, their precision play pays off when they get that kill. Not for blood money, but a kill nonetheless back for them. I always like to think it works once, though, right? Now he's aware Xiao Wei Xiao is not going to let it happen again. Where can Cloud9 do it next? Oh, Impulse. here's that combo, though. Impulse had their way with Incarnation in mid, so they go to the top side now, trying to shut down the 17-0 balls. He's bringing out some damage, but not enough with the Haunting guys just finished up. And he goes down to Rush, making plays on his Lee Sin this game. Impact and Rush, mm -hmm. once again. The Bash Brothers of Team Liquid. Yeah. It's something that worked for him before. Why not go back to it? And they knew, you know, Medios had used everything in that last game, so... No presence for him up on the top side. Since they have defensive wards up, 14 impulse all across that side of the map. You don't see any entry into the river. And they were very safe with that aggressive play. Oh, they're going to try to hit this one up immediately. The Ignite goes down in Elimination. Apollo has enough to kind of just stand through the Tibbers. It was the call for Balls to come in, however, that could change the fight. And I think Impulse has actually calculated this one so everybody can get out. Balls comes off of the Overheat but doesn't have enough speed on Scrap Shield to get back into range. Nicely done by Impulse to thwart Cloud9 there. Yeah, and some mistiming yeah. there. After such great uh, combo in mid lane there. That one was a little bit disjointed mm -hmm. for Cloud9. Turret still had plenty of health there, and the Alistar was able to get in the middle of it. Medios now caught out Ooh. in enemy territory. 
They don't get what they want, so they want to tr provide a way to get more. That also takes down Cloud9 as they get in for some deep wards, and things start to crumble quickly as they start to get ahead and try to get themselves a lead. Yeah, they used everything on that mid lane. It's crumbling on the sides. Mm -hmm. No real deep vision, though, for Team Impulse. It's mostly defensive here. That's true. They're kind of working off a lot of what Cloud9 is trying to execute. They're getting it to work in their favor. Safety from Impulse is not usually what we see. It seems to be paying off a little bit here. Again, back into their own jungle. Try and guard their wards. This one, a futile attempt. Elimination able to take that one down. Okay, well, Rush 202. Maokai's getting super tanky fairly quickly as well. Looking to get in there for a Righteous Glory combination next. Did have to get some magic resist for his lane versus Rumble, but they're looking like the dive buddies for Sneaky. They're getting ready pretty quickly. They want top lane to get pushed. They say Dragon 1 for the other team. Ain't no big thing. Easy also picks that one up for the team. No worries there, but they want to ha have Impact, rather, push this top lane so he can get everything yeah. off of that top turret. Start spreading the map a little bit. Cloud9 able to output some pressure, go for the objective off the recall of mid lane. Shao Shao goes back and they quickly jump on it. Okay. Evening up the Dragons is actually really big for Cloud9. They don't want Impulse to gain that lever in the right. middle of the map. They can just try and pull Cloud9 out into the open where the possibility of the Maokai TP flank and Sivir boost for the rest of the team enables Team Impulse to get to that back line and try and blow up Victor and Jinx. Very low mobility. So they finally get this lane pushed up. Ball says, no thank you. Equalizer right down the middle of the minion wave here. And it looks like Cloud9 could actually get a bit of an upper hand here in turrets. They already have two to one. They may make it three to one though. His impact is left guarding this by himself. Quick arcane smash Ooh. to do the trick, but he actually can't get to the minion wave. Takes more damage than he probably would have liked. You're just heading down to just the lens support yeah. here. They're gonna have to call down a more resources. They do have one ward at red buff. That should mean they're going to back off as soon as they see the move from Orianna. And a wave was lost mid because of that move. So Cloud9, once again, playing the map. And the oh, pressure no. bottom results okay. in some missed CS Ooh. for Xiao Wei Xiao as they lure him down to the bottom side of the map. Even with vision, uh, not going to go for that interrupt on Incarnation. He's level not 7 yet. Victor and not. junglers don't really like going aggressive on level 11 with laners. The possibility of that burst just too much. Pull a whoopsie. I think you got the kill on the guy backing. He was baiting you. Going to get a transfer over to Xiao Wei Xiao here in the mid lane. Still has that ignite. Hasn't been able to go aggressive on Incarnation. After that first gank, he played, has played very, very safe in the lane and has kept the CS completely equal. That 15 minutes. We're at 17 now. Looks like we're going to try to get something in the mid lane, maybe a ball control from Adrian. But Lemon Nation is also there for the counter. Pink Ward's pushed up here by Cloud9, definitely giving him the advantage. They know that Adrian just walked out, but he was still on the side. There is the Shockwave coming in. It's going to be a Chaos Storm kill onto Xiao Wei Xiao, but they still get the Retribution on Incarnation. Impact's taking quite a bit of damage as Rush oh. comes in. A ding ding, a new challenger approaches, and they get the twisted advance onto Sneaky. That was the worry. No escape for the Jinx, and now a no escape for Lemon Nation. Rush coming up big as he connects the Sonic Wave the resonating strike to boot, and he will not follow through on the Meteos, but they will get the middle turret here and finally open up this game. Yeah, Rush and Apollo, the early response team there. Pop Silver Ultimate, an order to react for another similar play from Cloud9. That's what it looks like when those all-ins are turned around. We mentioned the possibility of that early yeah. and how devastating it can be if an Orianna gets to turn around a gank like yeah. that, landing the Shockwave, and then Rush going in for a patented Lee Sin kickback on Sneaky, able to get that another, low mobility a, champion right one, into Kobe. the loving embrace of Maokai. Impulse working well off Cloud9 trying to engage. So, Xiao Wei Xiao, because he lives with, what, 300 health there, does get off the shockwave before going down. Right. Incarnation trades with him with the ultimate, um, but because, oh, actually, it's a lot of tanking right around because of the Alistar ultimate yeah. as well. But again, Apollo Ooh. comes in flash to join the <laughs> with the flash boomerang blade and takes out Sneaky. 
What a pass there from Rush in over to Impact. Yeah. Right spot at the right time for that fight to occur, it seems, for Impulse. Everybody made the right moves to continue finishing off the cleanup kills. And put it in their favor now. Seven to two. Only took a few minutes for things to kind of go off the handle there. We were just talking about even CS in some of the lanes and an even game altogether. But that has spread it. Now, yeah. minute 30 on to Dragon. Should be in favor of Impulse here if they can start to flex their muscles a little bit more. They have the warding for sure on that side of the map. It seems like Cloud9 wants to start getting a deny on the resources here on the top side, but also Vision to make sure nothing is snuck. A little too early for Baron just yet. Yeah, you can tell that Cloud9 have been pre-planning these combos mid that they want to pull off, but yeah, they gave away so much speed to Team Impulse, uh, and a team that really have had a lot of practice uh, with this type of squad. Mm -hmm. Able to pull off the response and get the counter the second time around. It's so risky for Cloud9 to opt for a uh, mid laner with, you know, no extra mobility in his kit and an AD carry that are going to be vulnerable to the high tempo dive style of Impulse. Still, Cloud9 have the option. Yep. Still have some tools in order to turn this around. But the vision now for Impulse is actually growing to be a problem here. Dragon 30 seconds and they've got plenty of it around the blue side buff jungle of Cloud9. They can see one of those plays coming now. Yeah. A pretty good amount of wards. They're just outside the range of Impulse's pink. So they have vision as the fight will start here, but it's not something that they really want to take right off the bat. Got to get a good equalizer down. And with that Sivir ultimate, everybody's going to be able to pretty much disengage it. Real hard. Lemonation's already tied twice. Can't talk. Tried twice to get himself in for the Flash Tibbers. Once it worked, once it did not. So they may be kind of hesitating on it again. Yeah, man. As we said, it's going to be like they, you can tell what they were planning picking this squad, but it's going to be hard to pull off. Yeah. One of the biggest things to counter Annie are really big, beefy front lines that just build full defense. Maokai and Alistar are two great examples of this, that they can try and interrupt her and zone her away from getting yeah. the perfect flash stun that she wants to do. Now that Impact does have Righteous Glory as well, they have to worry about contesting neutral objectives, opening themselves up you know, in the middle of the map. Very, very vulnerable, unless they're able to contain uh, the fighting into a small area. Looks uh, pretty good for yeah. Impulse here as far as the mid game goes. Fearless movement. That's got to be a scary thing for Cloud9. Impulse not really worrying, knowing they can set down wards without even being skirmished on. And they're the ones that want to start the fight. Sneaky in a bad spot. Unbreakable Wills taking the turret from the beginning oh, and oh. completely dunked as Sneaky. Balls is going to go down thinking he can actually assist. And the I think I can may continue to play through for Cloud9. They get right in the way of the shockwave. That's elimination. One more hit is Adrian in range. It's going to be the command oh. move coming in from Xiaowei Zhao. Another kill. And somehow with one person under that inhibitor turret, four go down, or rather outer turret, four go down for Cloud9. Nine. Man, it's like Impulse just went into a candy store in <laughs> in the pick band phase, and they just got everything. No they way! Wanted. Oh, Medios looking to get a final push on oh. the wave. This is final really hard to watch, life. actually. Man, why indeed? <laughs> why indeed? I mean, they got Alistar to start off the dive. Everybody perfect follow-up. Oh, can he get one back? Nope. Riv, can he get one back? Riv! Oh, felt the breeze. <laughs> Riv, can he? Felt the breeze. Well, let's see how this started. One person is under this turret, and nobody's really in range to die other than him. Adrian's happy to tank it up. Alistar ultimate, and they even want more after that. Impact with a secondary engage. He's full tank. He's sitting on the rumble equalizer the whole time and <laughs> taking the turret for the team. Got a hot foot. For the third re-engage from Adrian. Oh. Confident to push the mid lane mage right back next to his AD carry because they're so <laughs> far ahead. Here, have this. This is for you. Ouch. Take this. Run away. That's exactly what Cloud9 was thinking. Well, but they ran too. They tried to get the fight. Impact 
doing what he can to clear out this bottom wave. These guys have to be feeling good right now. I mentioned it, 15 minutes, the game was close. Yeah. We're seven minutes later, and now a 7,000 gold lead coming in for Team Impulse. A lot changed in a very short amount of time. So, items surplus now for Team Impulse. They have frozen hearts. The Lockets of the Iron Solari oh finish the want to engage even oh. more. And not even a chance to breathe or blink coming in from Cloud9. The connect here going on to Medios. The connect on to Sneaky. His, his mind's telling him, you know. But he doesn't yeah. do it. He does not do it. Cured of the Lee Syndrome is Rush, and he heads to the team for the priority target for that priority objective of Baron. Oh, uh, yeah. And not only do they have, you know, vision, of course, but they obviously have control, so pretty easy pick up there for them. There's not much to say about the amount of control Impulse have over this game. I guess it wasn't really a candy store. It was an armory that they got to go into. And they pretty much picked up <laughs> bazookas for themselves. It's a candy armory. All right. Well, now they've got Baron on top of it. So they can also go into demolition mode and start taking down the rest of the turrets. And I got to say, if well, Impulse is still playing well, and Cloud9 has made some grave mistakes that hurt them this game. You got to see how much Sivir plays into Impulse's compositions. 207 already. They're in and out of any fights they don't want to be in or do want to be in whenever they want. At this point, they want in on any <laughs> Absolutely. Any ding, ding. Rush is ready. Rush calling these fights with the rest of the team. He had a pretty great early game. Kind of oh, he jumped up to 606 without me even really keeping track of the yep. last hits for him. Yep. Starting things off so the composition now can run in whatever they want in mid at the right spot at the right time. And him, uh, he has been banned out quite a bit towards jungler. He didn't want to play Lee Sin, went for the Nocturne yesterday. And it looks like he should have went for the Lee Sin. Apparently. Well, let's see what they do with it. They can just steamroll straight through these turrets. Adrian can tank them. Impact can tank them. <laughs> Rush fearless. Itching to make a play. They're as well. all fearless right now. Zanya is almost ready for Shao Shao. He'll get himself into right. some Lemon's more peculiar plank, positions. Though. Lemon's in position. This could uh, be good. I don't know. Don't waste too much on that guy. It's the bodyguard. That's still really good damage. It's going to be healed, but they can start that fight. Baron minions on the turret. All right, going to allow too much to Flash King for Sneaky! Absolutely dunked with the last auto attack from oh. Apollo! And now here comes on the hunt once again. In range as much as they need to be. One last hit to Lemon Nation. Rush gets the face of the mountain coming in from good guy Adrian. And it looks like they're still able to engage. Impact completely tanking that shredding inhibitor turret. Ball's now in the wrong spot at the wrong time. He's going to go down. They're going to be able to drop down Meteos. That's the ace for Impulse. 19-3, to 3, 26 minutes in. They're inside Cloud. Nice base. What a massacre this game is. Team Impulse just shredding Cloud9. Impulse is all out of bubble gum. <laughs> that's, that's all there is to it, man. All out of bubble gum right now. Holy moly. This is the team we saw last split, previous splits from Impulse, but it was from the get go. They would do these things from the start. It's taking a little bit longer now, but they can still produce that result they're finding. Whew. Yeah, breather. Take a breather. Painful. There. Yeah. All right, well, let's let's see how Rush got in there. Because he misses the Q, but he's like, I don't need that Q. <laughs> Ward hop into Flash. You're gone. Oh. That's one of the low mobility carries for Cloud9 out of the picture. But why stop there, Riv? What? <laughs> Inhibitor turrets? But there's, there's more. They don't slow you down. For two easy flashes. In fact, he's not even really taking damage up from this inhibitor turret. The only thing that causes a member of Impulse to die is because when you use the Twisted Advance for impact, he loses tower aggro because he becomes untargetable. So it swaps back onto Adrian and they get one kill for Cloud9. Becomes a thing well, that's lot. it. Still trying to claw their way back in, as we said in the pregame and doing it in this game. Impulse has pretty much kicked the ladder away from the roof at this point. Cloud9's yeah. gonna have a tough time finding their way back to the top in and, this game. And Just we are about 40,000 to 53,000 right now. We are past the halfway mark now for Cloud9. Oh boy! As well, as far as he's There's the on the hunt there. right onto Incarnation again. There's no escape for him or Sneaky in these fights, and they continuously go down very quick. 
Balls looks to get the first loss on his professional rumble career as Impulse makes their way into the base. Almost another ace. His sneakies in the bottom lane, not even present for the fight as Cloud9 is looking to squeak out a few more objectives on the map. Well, he's, get, he's got an inhibitor, he's turn, gonna get but it. it's going to cost him a Nexus. There's a hashtag worth here, <laughs> at least for Sneaky. The team is on to the Nexus for Impulse. Cloud9 looking to get another loss in the record book oh. here. Just under 30 minutes, 24 to 3. As Impulse turned it on, they're able to take down Cloud9 and go 2-0 on the split against them. One of the most brutal beatings that we've seen. This split. That's the team that doesn't let go, that's not okay with having a little bit of a lead. That's a team that wants more of a lead consistently. And it's an impulse we haven't seen for quite some time. It really is. It really is now. <laughs> Few fights that are really reminiscent of Cloud9's past trying to get back into something, but that call just escalated the game out of control so quickly. And it happened twice in a row in this game. The engages in the bottom side of the jungle, Tip was able to control and turn in their favor. The engage in mid, Tip was able to control and turn in their favor. After those two fights, Tip made the fights in their favor. They manifested everything from there on out. I, I just, I don't think you can give Impulse that much of a speed advantage. No. In the overall team. If you, if you give them that mobility, then they are gonna create those plays across the map. And if, you know, one step goes wrong in this sort of sniper combo that Cloud9 yeah. wanted to pull off with the Nocturne, Jinx, Annie, and Victor all mid to take down one target. Mm -hmm. If one thing goes wrong in that plan and you get turned on one time, you're left with nothing. Yeah. They have, there's no backup plan there. And uh, both your carries, it be very vulnerable targets. The composition that Impulse brought to the table. Team Solo Mid versus Counter Logic Gaming. Now, earlier in the day, we wanted to get your thoughts and questions about this hotly anticipated matchup. Our first question comes from at Colio21. As a relatively new player, I would love to get some background information on how the big rivalry began. I'm so hyped. Freak, can you illuminate us? Yeah, so there is a lot of details that I'll drop from the discussion, but essentially, uh, Hotshot and Reggie had a bit of beef. They made the separate teams, uh, basically to beat each other, essentially, and, and those are the, the first, you know, the guys that, that made the teams: Hotshot GG for CLG, obviously Reginald for TSM, uh, and and so they were like already like the owners had beef, and then from there they were just the two best North American teams. They were clearly the number one, and number two, and they were like literally every single year until Cloud9 showed up. So like pre-season one until halfway through season three, these were obviously number one and number two. They would play like all the way down into like double elim, best, double, like double best of three, grand finals at 1 a.m. These two would like, would fight neck and neck. And TSM would like always win. CLG very, very rarely, with one exception where TSM got DQ'd, did, uh, did CLG ever win that matchup. So uh, Solomid's been getting the better of him for a long, long time. As we know, the record has moved to 15 and nine in favor of TSM going into today's matchup. Our next question comes from at NCSU Che, who asks, there have been a lot of people calling for Wild Turtle to retire. What are your thoughts, pros, cons? I think that Wild Turtle's positioning it was something that was called into question. So kind of lighting a fire under his butt and putting him in the spotlight. There are pros and cons to that for sure. Pros are he know, he's aware that he is trying out for his position and he needs to step up. The pressure is on him. But that's also a con is when the pressure is on you, are, the, are you the type of person who crumbles under the pressure? Yesterday from Wild Turtle's performance, though, we didn't see him crumbling under the pressure. He delivered yesterday. Yeah, I was going to say, yesterday suggests that he is going to step up to the plate, and it's only going to be a boon to TSM and their performance the rest of the split. Next up, we have at CeeLo Gragas, who says, are these the most dynamic solo lane players in the history of this rivalry? I like that uh, Twitter handle. It's a pretty sweet name. Yeah, it is good. <laughs> uh, to answer the specific, the specific question of who is more dynamic, I would say definitely in terms of both these lineups, um, Zion Spartan is the most dynamic CLG top laner we've had. Uh, Pobalter is probably the most dynamic mid laner we've seen CLG have. Uh, definitely for Bjergsen, definitely for Dyrus. Yeah. Uh, most skilled for their time, it's debatable because like Reginald was around there. Hotshot GG for his time was a really good top laner, especially early on. Uh, but yeah, as far as like flexibility and like playing different roles, for sure. All right, well, there you have it. Finally, at Arctic Wolf Lull wants to know, Dyrus and Doublelift have been on their teams for years, but who is more important to their respective team? Ooh, that's a hard one. It's a yeah, big, that's, that's a, a big, it's a loaded mm. question. 
I'm gonna go double. So I say I have an answer. But, mm. yeah. I'm gonna say Dyrus is a really good emotional leader. I feel like he's he's really in tune with like how TSM is doing. He's like super super focused, really hardworking dude. Um, so I, I kind of edge towards Dyrus, but like both are like obviously really big for the team. Yeah, I'm gonna go with double lift on this one. I feel like. He's the longest standing member of this team currently. He brings a lot of that veteran status to it, but also he brings the trash talk. <laughs> like a lot of people get invested in the CLG brand because of Double Lift and because of his trash talk. So when if Double Lift starts, you know, they start getting towards that first place again, you're going to see that come out and people are going to be like, yeah, this is the CLG that we are t all talking about. Mm -hmm. Double Lift on your screen right now. He's got the bandages off. Yeah. Still looking at his finger though. Ooh. To be fair though, anytime Double Lift speaks it is trash talking so oh <laughs> freak he can't even hear you he can't come even on defend now himself. it's fine all right well there you have it that's all we've got <laughs> from our twitter questions but as we throw it over to our caster desk double lift and po belter have formed a good working relationship which has made it easier for the carries to troubleshoot mistakes yeah po belter actually he's he works with me a lot better than link because he'll always want to do something with me that requires us to like sit down and talk or like watch a replay together so a good example is sometimes we will be on different targets in a team fight and he'll notice and he'll write it down and he'll come to me and be like hey we're on different targets here let's like figure out what happened and that's something that used to never happen and i didn't really even think it was a big deal until pobolter brought it up with me and i think one of the reasons why we're so much better at team fighting is because uh you know mid and 80 they're the back line and they have to work really well together and pobolter and i actually we bounce ideas off each other all the time about how we can do more damage or have like more DPS uptime, stuff like that. It's just so much easier to work with him. Well, hopefully they've done Aww. a bit of that. So <laughs> always got to add something about Link. <laughs> hopefully they've done a bit of that between yesterday's game and today's game, seeing a few where those arrows could come in. And now I want to welcome to the caster desk a man who can't say no to a good old-fashioned tri-cast. It's Joshua Jat Leesman. But we have no time for pleasantries, Rib, because let's get into right. the game with a quick roster rundown. On the blue side, it's Team Solo Mid. Top lane, we got Dyrus. Jungle, of course, is Santorum. Bjerks in the mid lane. Wild Turtle on AD Carry and Lustboy on support. That's right. Then on And on the red side, it's oh. Counter Logic right. Gaming with Zion Spartan up top. Smithy in the jungle. Poe Belter mid. <laughs> Double lift AD Carry and Afro Moose support. With our coach Zix Low. I like you guys are loud today. <laughs> we to get louder. We're, to We're trying to get on your level. The crowd, the crowd's ready as well. The seats are absolutely packed as well. They should be. Coach Loco Doko and Zix Low about to take the stage as we get into champion select with their teams. And there's got to be a lot of preparation that's gone into this matchup. Team Solomid already with the 1 0 here in the summer split. And I'm sure CLG would love revenge. Yeah, this is a death week for CLG. They had to play Team Liquid and now TSM. Yep. They were carrying around that ridiculous cinder block for some reason. They're trying to get a physical <laughs> representation of their burden. Well, it only grew yesterday yeah, because on they the lost foot. to Team Liquid. Yeah. And they got to break it again. Their, against CLG. their physical block may have turned into an actual mental block, though, because they lost to Team Liquid as well. Don't want to continue that trend here. Remember last time, CLG, they had somewhat of an odd pick with the Smithy on Lee Sin last time around and didn't get to do much on that pick early on. Yep. Uh, already two jungle bands focused at him, so we are going to go deeper into the jungle pool. This has happened in all the games today. We've seen the double jungle ban, so... Or at least in the or last game. Or double last pick, few, right. Yeah, triple jungle ban, actually, with the Echo, if you consider it, so that definitely stretches the jungle yeah. champion pool. Lee Sin, Nidalee, Sejuani, all those things will be on the table later on in the pick and ban phase. Bard getting taken out from Afro Moose. Still plays to be made there from CLG, and they don't want him on a champion that is made to roam. So they take that away from him. One final band. It is going to be the Rise top. Dyrus with the first pick may just be taking his Sliver? lane. Yeah, the Alistar still left off. That has actually yeah. been a few first picks today. I like, to yeah, I like it. Band Bard, pick Alistar, two of Afro Moose's favorites, mm -hmm. uh, two of his best performing champions as well. Pretty good yeah. early round here for TSM, all things considered. Mid lane left wide open, though. And the counter pick is CLG's to choose. Yeah, this will... I wonder if CLG will go with conventional things or if they're going to stretch to ah. slightly different things like <laughs> yesterday. I mean, the TF Ash Bard comp that they did yesterday was... Cool in theory, but with some executional mistakes, it kind of fell apart. Here, though, you'd think they'd pick a Sivir comp in group. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> True enough, Sivir on, on the board and Callista banned, so that does spring to mind. Uh, Wild Turtle 
can play Vayne into it if they so choose. So showing, uh, some, showing some love here, the other thing, off any nerves. With all the jungle attention, uh, Nunu does mm -hmm. rise quite quickly in priority for me uh, when you do get to move towards this stage of the game. Evelyn is still up though, also is pretty good into it. But yes, hit the nail on the head there with the Sivir. <laughs> It's what happens. Classic. <laughs> yeah, Callista banned Sivir's higher priority, which is why you may have expected it from TSM with the first pick, but TSM opted for the strong support initiation. So with that, I see TSM maybe going for some early turret dives. The game we just saw, the Alistair Maokai Lee Sin was like best in class turret divers across the board. Yeah, that was and we saw pretty good. Uh, a big early okay. I kind of like a new new better here though. Um, especially against a comp that already has a Sivir and the possibilities of Flash Gnar engages. If you already have Alistar as a front line and you add Nunu to that, your endgame DPS is great with the Nunu blood boil on his ear. All right, they forgo the jungle. We won't lock it in quite yet. They did allow the Sivir to go away yesterday and pick the Jarvan into it and keep it locked in still. First time we've seen Santorin on that. Not picked up yet, though. The Azir has been by Bjergsen. And let's see, the Rumble will be locked in for Dyrus in the top lane, so he a lot is of definitely magic damage. gonna have a bit more impact here, not just a tank for the team, but he's gonna be throwing out the DPS. Yeah, Pobelter and Bjergsen are two of the NA mid laners who have put a ton of games onto Azir, uh, which makes it a priority pick, not only in general, but specifically in this matchup. Bjergsen more recently as well. Yeah, Bjergsen more recently, Pobelter in the last time the TSM played CLG was nearly the reason that CLG was able to come back. He had right. some spectacular Azir plays in the team fights, but ultimately CLG fell. Yeah, and especially with LeBlanc being nerfed, Sivir already being locked in, the Varus definitely loses value. You usually like to combo with something like Corky, so they go with mid lane AP poke instead of mid lane AD poke. Kogma locked in, and there is the Evelyn. Second time might be a charm. Yep. yep. Zero, six, and three on that Evelyn yesterday. Ooh. Ah, taking a page out of Boob's book here. He played it yesterday as well. Yeah. Yes. It's good. I mean, now you can still, now you can lock down a Sivir and a Kog'Maw in the same spot. They're going to have to flash out no matter what. No tumbling or dodging out for these AD carries or DPS dealers. Interesting pickups by Team Solo Mid. Going with the Jarvan they did last time. Wild Turtle to go back on a Tristana play. I shouldn't even say back. That'll be number one here for the summer split. I do like the Jarvan lock in here because a Kogma is very vulnerable to Cataclysm spam. And that just means getting his flash with the first one, your cooldown is extremely low, and returning to that. So you can combo with the ultimate from Rumble as well and put the Kogma in the hot pot. He's got only one escape, and that is Flash. And now he has two, because Aphromoo picks Thresh with the very Aha. last pick, saving the support till the very end. That's kind of a nice little counter at the very end of Champion Select. If I look at these teams holistically, though, I see TSM wanting a lane swap early on in the game, pushing down turrets quickly, and also trying to abuse the turret diving potential early of a Jarvan and an Alistair. Those two uh, will be able to turret dive frequently throughout the game, whereas CLG, I think, has to play the lanes quite defensive for at least the first five or 10 minutes. Yeah, obviously they've got that Kogma AP, wants to scale up. Tilly hits Luden's Echo, a level 11. Will be the waiting game. Smithy though, on the Evelyn. I don't want more waiting game. We've had way too much waiting game today. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> you're done waiting, Riv. Done waiting. Game. All right. Game game. It's time to get the fights on. It's time to get the game going. Everybody locked in with their champions now. Team Solo mid versus Counter Logic Gaming to go live. TSM back in week two, able to grab this victory for themselves. And as you know, it's always time to head over to Twitter once the champions are locked in and show the team some love. So tweet at LOL Esports with the hashtag TSM win or the hashtag CLG win. And we'll be updating that fan poll throughout the game. Ladies and gentlemen, we're about to go live with El Clasico. We've been waiting for this match all day. The crowd's ready. Everyone at home is ready. And we three on the desk. We're more than ready. Let's get jump, jump into this match. TSM on the blue side, CLG on the red. And we are on to the rift. In-house fans of Team Solo Mid seem to be more abundant today, but the Counter Logic Gaming chants are still there underneath the chants of the TSM. The fans are still ready to get behind their team. Double lift now with the cast off, with the bandages off, back at full. Yeah, I mean, the last time this matchup, 
in the spring split uh, happened for a battle for first place was when both TSM and COG were five and one. Obviously, this is their second matchup yep. in the summer, but still seven and two is an incredibly impressive record for both of these teams. And it's still a match for that first place. A lot of pressure, a lot of fandom on the line. And this game will be a good determinant of who's better next uh, for the end of the split. Oh, Smithy. Oh, going to pulverize Smithy. He went down first yesterday. He goes down first again in a bad spot. Again at the wrong time. Double lift and the rest of the team have a lot of follow-up DPS here. The face Jack, jab, though. How does that happen? Two games in a row for Smithy to die within the first two levels. Well, it's a face check into the pixel brush. That is never recommended, whether you're invisible or not. Oh, man. Did what that... a way. What a way to start this game. I'm going to go back. Real quick. Yeah, we're going to see that again. Uh, yeah, continue. <sighs> Both teams headstrong in the idea they had in the beginning of the game, but TSM with the team in mind while they were doing it. See it? CLG thinking they could sneak one person in for a yeah. deep ward there. Yeah, he got the ward at least. He got it. Yeah, so this happens again. He saw he was following Already. Santorin in. He thought it was just a jungler, but there's there's no vision on literally anyone else. It's a careless move without the a thresh or something right behind you that could counter with the play. You're against an Alistair at level one, one of the most formidable level one opponents in League of Legends. Right. Yeah. I, I don't. We can't justify that, so <laughs> we can stop trying. It's a big mistake. The, the boomerang also going full after the Jarvan instead of going to the brush could have alerted them. But yeah, they open door number one and get an Alistar in the face. You don't have to open a door that early. <laughs> There's no point in the risk. We'll see what TSM can use out of this very, very fast first blood, and everybody was able to get participation in that. The kill going over to Wild Turtle to get a Tristana going early helps even more for their bot lane. And now for Amu, just seconds short of actually picking himself up a kill on Dyrus. So it is the lane swap that yep. we thought was going to be happening. Uh, there was no flash on Lust Boy's Alistair, so the eventuality of a turret dive is a little bit diminished. Maybe we wouldn't see a mid lane turret dive later on in the game, but still lane swap with the Trist able to push on her own. Right. Plus TSM, they have the possibility of, you know, getting a three buff. Now, three buff itself doesn't hold as much value as it did before. Uh, you can get just as much experience from a small camp, mm -hmm. um, but the fact that they cleaned that side of the map uh, might be of more importance because they do have other camps to go to on that last quadrant. Left for mining. Some stats on Azir. We actually saw that being banned away from Phoenix earlier today out of respect. Bjergsen also good kill share and damage provided throughout a game on that. We saw him being it being a very big reason for them to win late game team fights recently. So this is an interesting little tweak that TSM is doing to the 4v0. Uh, they're only sending three because they know they're going to kill the turret anyway. And they're using this space window to get Santorin a really big experience lead over X Smithy. Smithy not only died at level one, that didn't necessarily hurt his experience, but when he's in the lane, uh, giving the farm to others and just kind of trading between four, but Santorin is actually clearing three-fourths of the jungle. That's what's going to be what puts Santorin ahead by a pretty wide margin. Yep, looking to freeze that lane for CLG. But yeah, basically the extra quadrant of jungle that TSM were able to farm, it wasn't just a buff steal away, getting small camps as well. A lot of extra resources there on the map just for them to be able to get, and that's where we got this big gold lead in addition to that first blood boost. Ooh, just watching Zion in the top lane, he's actually missing quite a bit of this free CS. It's gonna hurt with these guys not really yeah, having any levels. He's on it. He'll get it locked down. Just a lot of caster minions focus firing on oh, one. one. Smithy's looking yeah. to punish the solo lane here. Dyrus pushing up. Uh, but because Double did get back to lane in time, it's going to be right. difficult to pull off. Flash. This could help quite a bit right into the turret. Wow. Ooh. A rare mistake there from Afro. And Dyrus pulls off the very small baby sidestep while well slowed from the play, but it's enough. I'll turn to the top lane to stop any of this nonsense of free farm and Zion Spartan. Hopefully he can start pushing that in. That's a in bunch of himself. Yeah, Riv, that's a bunch of misplays we've seen. Just little minor things from CLG. Right. Miss CS by Zion on the top lane when he had a small window before the lane was going to get pushed in. Afro moved down at the bottom side. Yes, Dyrus was able to juke that, but 
flaying into a hook. Also, X Smithy just kind of jumped the gun, it felt like, or half hesitation in going for that Dyrus gank and the face check early on in the game. Uh, definitely not the way CLG wants to start out if they're looking to get their first win against CLG or Team Liquid this year. Yeah, only makes it harder that everything has been fizzling out in favor of Team Solo mid here. Six minutes in, CLG getting a push down on the bottom side as Top getting pushed in now from Wild Turtle. Junglers shimmering each other's side of the top and bottom now as these turrets soon to fall. Yeah, Pobelter doesn't have Ghost. He still does have Flash. Oh, man. He can flash the first part of the combo uh, here. I even <laughs> need to. The puddle was yeah. very well placed by Pobelter right there. You can see TSM's strategy is mimicking their champion select, though, just in the way they're playing the lanes. Already taking the two other turrets with Tristana and then looking for mid lane turret dives with Alistair. That's how they're supposed to be using these champions. Yeah, even pre-6. Looking to pile in there and punish the Kog'Ma. Very vulnerable. Double lift can even up the turrets at his leisure, though. Just wait around and deny as many minions as possible. Also, just a tad ahead in CS. Help that he's behind on that kill so far that Wild Turtle has. I go back to the bottom lane, maybe able to work something off of this. No jungle pressure. Double is just really trying to get the wave killed as much as possible. Pull calculated 67 to 33 so far, and I'm sure a few of those votes were just in the first minute as we saw Xmithy go down for that first blood. Still something CLG's trying to repair, but just about a thousand gold lead is still a game here between TSM and CLG. Pobe out there has to be really, really careful. Hug the bottom side of the map too, where they have all their ward coverage, their strong mm -hmm. side. As uh, Jarvan, definitely one of the champions to punish Kog'Maw very easily as we went over. Yeah. You can see the average blades on both the AD carries as well. Again, yeah. Since they've already taken down the two side waves, uh, I wonder how much passivity we're going to be seeing from CLG throughout this, knowing that they're already playing from a deficit and they have a tier Kog'Ma in the mid lane who won't be that relevant until he completes at least Luden's Echo. Uh, basically, that early mistake will create a lot of passivity for CLG, who yep. sometimes likes to make plays. We knew they were going to have to play passive early game regardless against the, the Alistair potential roam. Uh, this just kind of exacerbates that point about their team composition a bit more. Going to that late game, we're going to be quite hard to fight against the Dyrus if he gets any more fad wild turtle as well. Zion Spartan's going to have to get pretty big in his lane to get through the damage that's going to come through on the front line. Things looking good for TSM as they slowly, slowly hold on to what lead they have right now. Not looking to pressure it or put themselves in any dangerous positions just yet. Belter in mid lane staying safe as well as he stacks tier here. TSM always knows and feels that they have better mechanical prowess in the late game fight, so if it comes to that, they're more than happy to. So Dyrus, luckily for him, his wave is pushing towards him already anyway, so even taking out that pink ward and even having Smithy up there, not in quite so much danger because they do have two pink wards in the river. So if he comes up that way, then he would have an alert system. Smithy could go for a lane gank, but he's gotten so low trying to clear his jungle. He's not going to have that presence. I mean, this is very, out on that trade. This oh. is a very similar Evelyn game to what X Smithy had against Team Liquid. Mm -hmm. A mistake early, and Evelyn's one of those jungles who you really don't want to fall behind on because it's all about her pressure within her first couple of items in those power spikes because there's no right. item build currently that really scales well for Eve to make her a late game threat. You're always just kind of mix and matching components. He'll be late to his warrior outbreak. He was late with early pressure. He's going to be late to this entire game for the most part, and the rest oh. of COG has to make plays. Sivir ultimate teleport in. Yep, Zion got in already. Nice hit. They are going to be able to get a slow onto Turtle here. He's not going to be going too far without boots, and he goes down. Take advantage of the long lane. Duo pushed up here for TSM. And the teleport for Dyrus. Yep. And Xmithy had Zion. just been back to base as well, so he will be full health. Santorin, I thought TSM was going to be trying to force a dragon shortly, but thanks to that Sivir ultimate timing with the collapse from Zion Spartan's teleport, they could go for this one. It's going to be hard for TSM to contest. Azir and Trist back in the base. Uh, they'd have to teleport in with Rumble to go for something. 
And Dorn looking to go in here. He's level six double buffs. They have good coverage for the fight. Double lift just How below long? them with zero mana on the, the fight, The longer though. they wait here, the more likely it is they're going to teleport in. So much free damage from that dragon. Very, very low goes Zion Spartan, and very, very down he is as well. Pole Belter right in the front, not where he wants to be. He's trying to walk out of this one. Smithy's able to come up with the dragon for the team as they hightail it out of there. One Harpoon, the attack, Ooh. two Harpoon as Dyrus overheats. It doesn't activate. Not already have yet. that first one shot. Now on to double lift. He came into this one with no mana, trying to help the team and just put himself in a bad spot. These guys got themselves a good amount of kills across the board Here. for Team Solo Mid. Yeah. Yep. Uh oh. Smithy, oh. He's got to play. He's invisible. Yeah. It's fine for now. This is where we think he is. The observers can't see either. Let's see how the guess was. Hey. Good guess. Well, it's <laughs> not a guess. They can give it, leave it locked on him, even if you can't see him. <laughs> <laughs> really? You can do that? Yeah. All day. Today I learned. But uh, he is going to get out of it with his life. Uh, and they did get the dragon because uh, Santorin smote the dragon for some health there to survive uh, and able to continue the fight. The first early dragon here, though. Because TSM have the global gold lead, probably won't need that Yeah, much. the whole setup to this fight was just TSM stalling CLG on that dragon and waiting for Bjergsen to arrive so that CLG would have to completely bail out. Yes, they got the dragon, but then since the collapse arrived, there was really no chance for the rest of CLG. CLG was not committing their damage onto the dragon when they had the window to take it, when Azir and Triss were down bottom, and they ended up getting caught in a very poor fight. And unfortunately for them, the money went to Dyrus there. Dyrus getting that kill is huge for the next dragon fight. So CLG are going to have a really hard time uh, using that dragon to try and stack up, even though you know, they have timing and they've got one already. Mm -hmm. TSM are going to have a huge advantage that when the next one does come up, Dyrus is going to be fully ready to roll. Getting earlier dragons in the past two games than our average with these 4 0 lane swaps coming Another in. Another lane. Take that turret down. Good ward keeps Wild Turtle alive that he just placed down in the top side. There's a lot of pressure the TSM is trying to apply right now onto CLG, getting deep wards within that jungle. Even if they don't get kills, the map pressure is pretty immense. All the while they're doing this, they're leaving a window for Bjergsen to take the mid lane. Scary, scary thing if you're going to be fighting an Alistar and a Rumble in those choke points in the jungle. CLG is forced to back off. But like you said, Jap, mid turret was already going down, and TSM is working off the ball very well right now, making sure they're getting more than one thing every time they act on it. Yeah, it's always that line that you tread when you are going for the split push. We saw mm -hmm. uh, it bite Wild Turtle uh, last time, not able to get out of the lane with Silver Ultimate. This time, though, Double Lift wasn't quite there to assist the CLG gank squad with the Silver Ultimate. So he's going to try and use it on the bottom lane. Oh, Dyrus going to go down. Not much he could do here. Turns and Ooh. retreat for the Flame Spitter. But that Un definitely goes to Aphromoo, and that's definitely not what they wanted. 2-0-1 yeah. for him now. I feel like that was an unnecessary ignite from Aphromoo. They had the 3v1. Right. Uh, and that's only going to lead to an accidental KS. That's not the second kill from Afro Moon. Especially when you bring the fight to the teleport. And there, TSM, they continue with this split push strategy, but they weren't applying pressure in mm -hmm. any of the other lanes there. Bjergsen had gone back to get blue, and Turtle can't really pressure Zion up to the turret. You know, Tristana, yes, she can take down turrets if she's left alone with them, uh, but the threat there from uh, Nar, uh, fully stacked up on Rage, not enough to gain anything out of the split from Dyrus there, who was vulnerable on the bottom side with no wards and no tower. So CLG, oh. that's the second time they've punished a TSM split with a Sivir ultimate. And TSM, once again, not really respecting the distance that you can close with that Sivir ultimate. And yeah, that's two kills. This is going to be tough for Pole Belter now. Nick Smith, he just got pushed around in the jungle by Wild Turtle as well. We saw he had to use his ultimate. Uh, Wild Turtle just jumping on him in the jungle. I do have to note, Kobe, though, I was told by the observers that they were following Evelyn by best guess. They confirmed they did not lock on to Evelyn. Ooh. But, so, okay, can you lock on to Evelyn, though? We'll have to find out later. <laughs> this is the secondary storyline to our TSM COG <laughs> mega match. <laughs> Observer okay. Easter eggs at 11. 15 minutes into this game, four to three here, and slight gold lead for TSM. They look to push the bottom lane now. This is Bjergsen now working the mid lane by himself, so we'll see if he can actually get more pressure. Nobody's actually reacting to that. Looks like he can get some good damage down, especially with soldiers. All right. Yeah. Pope out there so close to completing this loot, and CLG just want to hold on. But it's a two-level disadvantage in the mid lane because of the pressure the TSM's been able to yeah, apply. Yes, Bjergsen 
with the Azir and the Tristana. This is a turret killing composition that yep. TSM can try and snowball the game with since they had that early advantage and they are split pushing and just trying to create turret dive threat. As far as the quickness of taking down turrets, matching those two up, Azir and Trist, I don't think you can find a combo that bursts them faster. Yeah, but as you get deeper and deeper, they get harder and harder to take. Mm -hmm. And I've al I always want to caution against uh, counting out the team with the AP Cog mid. With these kills yeah. that CLG have been able to scrape together, I mean, they're only actually down one turret right now. Right. That makes up for pretty much the entire gold lead that TSM have. So while TSM have great map control right now, they have super deep wards because of it, and they have control of the game, got to be very careful against, you know, playing around with an AP Kogma if CLG can, can uh, you know, play turret yeah. defense. And a lot of the ways that CLG has gained their advantages there is based on the Sivir ultimate and the mm -hmm. team collapsing around it. The two yeah. people that CLG have ahead with Double Lift and Zion Spartan, those advantages basically come from the kill on the Wild Turtle and the kill on Dyrus while they were trying to push those side waves. Yeah. And it has contained their ability to farm all the while, of course, Bjergsen has been pushing up the mid lane. Well, it will be imperative for CLG at least to grab back the bottom half of the jungle. Pobelter with that damage is going to need his blues. And with Dragon now about to go in favor of Team Solo mid, they yeah. can back up Blue and start buff when he has that. Ludens is yeah. just the most important thing. I think this Dragon does go over to TSM, and CLG make the call to continue with their split push with Zion. Uh, it would be pretty difficult for them to go for this uh, one just because, you know, Pobelts are still not level 11. So I think they're fine with giving that one up, and both teams will get their 6%. You know, walking through these jungle corridors into an Azir that is as strong as you know, he pointed out there is right. very, very, very difficult. So. Given respect where they need to, playing it safe so they can actually have a better mid to late game. Counter Logic Gaming does not contest the Dragon. Definitely a lot more action within this one. Teams a bit more ready to start fighting here 20 minutes into the game, but no yeah. real swing to the game just yet. Without a bit of a lead. Yeah, GSM, I'm, I'm looking for them to use Dyrus. Mm -hmm. uh, because, you know, he got that, the fact that he got that kill, uh, he does have the flat penetration for his rumble. Um, and Azir can't, yeah. Azir plus Alistar have so much of an ability to control uh, the enemies on the battlefield. So much displacement here on the TSM team. They can set up a really good uh, fight if they choose the correct terrain. And Santorin creates the correct terrain for them with that Jarvan ult. What I find interesting about that is that most of TSM's abilities will be flashed out of and then become really ineffective. And since it's been so long since we've seen a team fight, TSM needs to create some smaller fights to burn the summoner spells if they're going to win a big landslide of a team fight. We talked about Pole Belter needing his flash up most of the time, how Santorin can just blow his flash with the Cataclysm and then get him again. Well, has he even Cataclysm Pole Belter yet? We haven't had the opportunity to, but before we see the game changing fight, I right. think we have to see a game altering fight. And that's something that uh, people have been on Santorin for uh, at various moments when uh, he opts for a lot of hard farming routes uh, rather than going for lane pressure. Yeah. Jarvan though, uh, does have, Jarvan does have two gap closers and Kogma only has one flash. You can still make a play uh, with that two visits. So, a bit of a stalemate. As the resources are grabbed, the camps are picked up and waves are pushed into the spots that teams are going to want them now. A little bit of preparation here before they make their next moves. And this could actually work out for Team Solar Mid as they're making their way in towards an empty jungle. Still forward wars getting pushed in their favor. That does not look like they will find any CLG members just yet. Even in CLG's mind, they know they have to respect the composition and play safe. Yeah, a TSM want a fight now, whereas yeah. COG would rather trade objectives. So oh, they sent double lift down bottom. Sivir can quickly pressure a lane and clear the minion wave. The problem is, is that they don't have a lot of vision to perfectly call that trade. So mm -hmm. blue buff goes away. There's your deny of the level 11 Kogma Ludin blue uh, that you're looking for. Yep. And TSM are able to split their resources. Uh, double lift has to recall and TSM have control. Definitely something we should keep an eye on. 25 minutes just around for the next blue buff. We'll see what TSM's positioning is there. Right now it's the mid. Flash for a flash. Bjergsen's out for the better. 
Uh, for Moose, though, we'll be able to try for a hook later, just not as big as a long-range engage. Yeah, it's getting harder and harder for COG to keep up their farm as well as they lose more and more control of the map here. Pobelter's not near a point where he can be super effective. He has nope. the Ludens, but two-level disadvantage and no blue buff keeps him at bay. 421 stacks. Yeah. Yeah. COG's direction of double lift is paramount right now. They have to utilize this Sivir and Kog'Maw wave clear very efficiently. If they blink for one second and CSM gain one minion wave, they can take down that last turret so quickly. That's why we see the rotation there was very quick for CLD to send double lift up top and take out that minion wave. And it's going to be difficult for COG to find team fights as well, even if they have a slight jump, because there are three spells that displace CLG backwards on TSM's side. Right. Azir, Trist, and Alistair can all push you away from a fight. Mm -hmm. uh, and it's just so much vision control on top of really the play. difficulty to initiate. Also think about who they can separate. If they cataclysm somebody, you can just say, nope, we're pushing the rest of you away. Very interesting options wow. that they have. But option to Baron, it's like, is not one of those. They get pushed off two minutes on to the Dragon, so they still want to stay healthy for that situation as well. If TSM want to play that a little bit more aggressively, the Baron was at half when they pulled off, and it was just a Sivir and a Thresh closing in. Uh, a little bit of fear of a Baron throw is what stopped TSM from doing that one. Zion hadn't even begun to channel his Teleport. Yeah. Stop that. I think that could have been a TSM Baron in a big game swing. TSM do have both mid turrets down, so if they were able to get you know, deeper vision inside this red buff jungle, Returning yep. to that sort of play, definitely an option. Giant coming up, though, in a minute means that a, must, a much less risky neutral objective available for them to pull out the CLG squad. CLG obviously going to be looking for the poke before the end of the day. Uh, Pops of ultimate. Hope for that poke building up for them. Just under 500 stacks. Pole Belter has quite a while. Not really able, being able to farm anything or have these fights to charge up in. It's going to be difficult. Still able to poke, just not with that blue. Yeah. And the most interesting thing, the most interesting thing about this game for me mm -hmm. is how the difference in pressure is not reflecting in the gold right now. It's a 1,000 gold game with equal dragons on both sides. Uh, and even now, it's just a one-level difference in the mid lane, but that is mirrored in the top lane, and Smithy's actually out-leveling Santorin at this point. So yeah, for, after the beginning. For all that COG's been getting pushed in, they're not getting punished in incredibly powerful ways. They're staying really, really close and could maybe even contest this dragon fight if they did it just right. CLG does usually stay focused very well in situations where they're determining what's beating them down and how it's happening. Both of these teams are actually pretty good at that. It's the late game fights that have been plaguing them. It looks like they're going to pressure each other into that situation here. Only 4-3 to three at 23 minutes. Not a lot is gained after, after fights. I think we're going to get the long haul here and hope the players are ready for it. Dragon is alive. Probably going to be our next matchup. And it's going to be just about a minute and a half for CLG's blue as well. So this could lead right one into the other. CLG though, have been able to get the Scuttle Crab as well. So they've got positioning, yeah. they've got vision, they have the speed boost, they have everything they need here. Yeah, the only thing they could use is a blue buff on Pell Belter, but they have to be careful not to take too much damage from the Dragon. This is what happened last time, which prepped them for a bad fight. This will start if the top laners decide to teleport in. Santorin looking with Lust Boy to there dive into this one. The Voidus hit. Santorin looking to go in. Lust Boy gets a very nice three-man pulverize. Santorin still does not want it just yet. Lust Boy's gonna left. die by himself. He's left. Looks like the dragon will also be picked up here in a bit of hesitation as Zion Spartan came in with the teleport. It's what caused TSM to balk on engaging. A bit of a strange fight there. No one willing to follow up on Lust Boy, maybe waiting for the disengage. And I feel like Zion's teleport from the backside mm -hmm. dissuaded TSM from following Lust Boy. But for whatever advantage that TSM had built up, not being able to capitalize on it in a mid-game team fight like that uh, is a little bit perplexing. Very big miscommunication there for TSM. Oh boy. Double F though. <laughs> oh my lord. He didn't even need to hit the full equalizer. Hot damn. Dyer is cooking up. Double lift in the bot lane. And CLG, if they're starting to get kills across the map here and Dragons when they shouldn't be, things are going to start falling in their favor. I mean, regardless. We saw one kill for each team. Secondary Dragon, the bonus is not really meaningful. And 
They've already traded yeah. a, mm -hmm. a one dragon, so the stack not going to be that big of a deal until we get later into the game as well. So, yeah. <laughs> pretty much uh, where we were before. Yeah, let's keep playing. And <laughs> still down in turrets. And the Baron, I think, is the avenue in which TSM should probably pressure if they can get the correct vision denial and actually follow up on another initiation like that from Lustboy. The potential is really huge for a big initiation, not to mention the kill distribution on CLG. It has half their kills on Aphromoo. So with the gold being close, the spread of the gold is actually non-ideal for CLG. Over, Pole Belter has his blue, finally able to start charging that puppy up. He needs to get that extra shield for himself to stay safe in these fights. Plus, boy's been going in quite hard with Santorin, except for the last fight. Let's see if they can get back onto the same pages. It's all about the mid lane now. Bjergsen right behind the team with blue buff himself as they set up base just outside CLG's. Not a choke point you want to fight, and oh they're my. actually going to try to chase this. Equalizer is up, and they decide not to walk through the welcome area. Dyrus a couple pixels away from that Zion stun landing as well. Mm -hmm. Bjergsen, though, providing so much threat with the soldiers from Azir. He's, he's their strongest player. He's the most fed champion, and he dissuades the team. Here comes a vision play. He said, maybe we're standing on a ward, guys. I mean, Kogma at this point, Ooh, vision plays are wow. so difficult Great to pull poke. off as Pobelter rises in level and the range increases. Now he's got blue buff, so. That's the big thing. Easily able to check these brushes. Blue buff and his tier upgraded. Yep, Sor Sorcery Elixir as well. He's just chugged through. You can see that on him. Pobelter standing strong. Four in the mid lane now. Smithy is, might be trying to grab Raptor here so he can get up and make sure they're not getting caught on vision. If they try to get a side swipe, Bjergsen almost able to take down Double for the few casts there. Soldiers probably would have zeroed him out quite fast. That cautionary tale of the boy who played around with the AP Kogma. <laughs> yeah, that one. One of my favorites. Here, it's begun. This is the AP Kogma yeah. Pope. Uh, Pope Elter has carried numerous games already this split by getting to a later game version of AP Kogma. TSM has even lost a game having five dragons up against Cloud9 because of Incarnation's AP Kogma. It's right. a very dangerous and real threat here. It just it puts a lot of pressure on TSM to make a game-changing all-in play. So they have to have confidence. They also have to have timing. And something that they have been able to, to beat CLG at in the past is execution on team fights in the mid game. Right. So, yes, they are in a pinch and they do have the pressure on them. It's on the onus of this team fight is on TSM to make the play, but they have had success with it before. Yeah. Getting into pretty dangerous ground. Trying to walk up to a turret here. The engage from TSM is still very much there. Yeah, and there's a lot of dangerous ground yeah. in this game for both teams. Even if you think about a fight in the jungle corridors, yep. uh, you don't want to fight a Rumble or an Azir in the jungle, but you don't want to fight a Gnar with all the walls around for yeah. a giant ultimate either. These teams are approaching these fights with ultimate caution because even though COG had that whoopsie at level one with x Smithy that really did feel at the moment like it was going to sway against CLG. Since they've had a history of losing to these teams, that it. would be a catalyst for them to kind of go on tilt. They have recovered, yeah. and they have turned this into a very competitive match. It definitely took the team to do that as well. Got to make sure that x Smithy got through the early part of the game safely. He wasn't countered anymore. And then Zion Spartan also stayed safe and laid a few kills. Did go TSM's way due to that early game with CLG. Now getting double lift fed, trying to get that Sivir into a position to hard carry. And trying to get Pole Belter safe enough so he can do the same. Just 30 minutes in here, Team Solo Mid getting to a point where the fights could go in their favor due to that mechanical prowess. And Dragon's in just one minute, so we don't have to wait long for the fight either. Gold is dead. Yeah. A little intimidating to the there too. Seesaw game back See this boomerang? I don't need this. This is for the next generation. All right, well, let's see if the uh, deep rewards from TSM do pay off because that is one thing that they can use to pull off a flank and and yeah. make that all-in play on CLG. Not the one they oh, want, oh, but it oh is my. the one that they want. Oh, Santorin has boy. with the Jarvan Quattro Cataclysm. Locks it up for the team. <laughs> Trist, Rumble, picking up kills. Dyrus and Wild Turtle very happy about that. Bjergsen. The Shurima slide into double lift, tries to cut off another finger. And he's going to succeed, but goes down.
I for mean, his own we were life waiting for as the well. game changing play. All summoners burned right away. What a wombo by TSM, but with Bjergsen going down there, Baron damage is low. It's a lone defense right here. Pull about the coming in from the back Zion, side. Charge that bar! Artillery can up down. from the 14 NAR. Gonna get blasted away and off the river. What timing by Wild Turtle. Team solo mid now grabs the Baron. They're gonna turn onto Zion Spartan. If they can get that close onto Pole Belter, not gonna be good. The flag and oh, drag the door. Pole Belter too close for his own good. And he gets a whack to the head from Santorin. Great plays all around from Team Solo mid. Pick up the Baron and basically a CLG. Plus boy playing up. offensive line and defensive line for CLG. He is all over the place. Headbutt into Buster shot at the end. Let's take a look at this Wombo once again, though. So they hook Lust Boy vision control wise, but that's exactly what TSM oh. was waiting for. Oh, 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 equalizer. And it, it didn't even oh. matter that COD had flashes up that was because gorgeous. the equalizer landed the instant the knockup did. So they the damage was dealt by the time they flashed away. Bjergsen tried to make a hero play and was mostly punished. Taking down Doublelift, though, was just enough window that TSM needed to take down the Baron. Taking down Doublelift was huge. Imagine Woo. if Doublelift was still up right for the Baron, as you said. Yeah. So going down was hashtag worth. Once again, the team fight execution from TSM pulls them into the lead. And with that Baron buff, now they can start knocking down turrets, taking, yeah. making use of that deep. Got some free time. This is where you're talking about it, chat. Once Azir and Tristan reach those turrets, not long for this world. That was a beautiful initiation once again. This is why Alistar is first pick, band worthy all across the <laughs> world. So much control the team has in the play as well. I didn't think Brierickson really need to get his uh, offer out that one. Lust Boy going in. This could be much like uh, the dragon fight where the team's not able to follow and they have to leave him out to dry again. Getting a little hyphy on that one, but they are able to get the pickup kill on two pole belts or a little too close to his own base wall. They that, could be able to get one after that's that. That's probably worth yeah. at this point. The main way oh, yeah. to clear is pole belter and they still have their turret killers Support, up. Ooh, Support for mid, that's like a pawn for the queen. You're definitely happy if you're getting that situation. Great trade. Great trade from Team Solo mid. Onto the turret now. Bjergsen in. Back and forth. Ping pong with Pole Belter. And double, rather, ping pong with double lift. He goes down. And it's going to be Zion Spartan out to the side. He can't do much, but watch the inhibitor go down. And another member of Enix Smithy has fallen in this fight. It's going to be tough for CLG to hold their base if they're falling faster than the Team Solo mid members. And they leave the scene of the crime. Can go clean up Dragon right after that. Easy pick up there for TSM. Makes the game so much easier to have yeah. that door open into the base. Inhibitor turret down on the best side for it to be down. What so, did you see that makes him want to go in? Nothing. He sees He's just double lift. Lift. He saw the double lift <laughs> was within range of his Sand Soldier because Bjergsen had prepped it prior, waited for his Q to come on off cooldown again, yeah. therefore could get the extended range on his dash to get behind him for the ultimate. So just a nice combo there by Bjergsen on yeah. the turret, blowing up double lift and just kind of killing x by mistake. That was his last bit of mana too, so they were ready to go in. He was like, you know what? I have one last drop. Let's take out double lift. Successful mission. They have achieved another kill in their favor now. 14 to 7 here. Just about 6 to 7,000 gold lead as it ticks up. And Team Solo mid prepping once again on their side of the map before they head back over to the court of Counter Logic Gaming. Yeah. I mean, they've got a while for neutrals to come up. So, really, if they just kind of close the noose here and they transfer some of their wards over from the blue side up to the red side, they can just corral CLG inside their base and starve them of the map until something comes up. Bjergsen again, throwing in that spell vamp for himself so he can yeah. stay in these fights, trying to negate that poke that he's going to be receiving. He's done it before. Yep. Actually had to do it within his item recipe last time. Now it's just kind of a surplus to keep him in these fights for a little bit longer. CLG trying to absorb the extra gold there. Uh, Double is trying to clear as quickly as possible, but that might be all that TSM need to gain position on this turret. They do have Alistar once again, and diving yeah. these secondary turrets is very easy. These are very dangerous turrets to defend, especially since this is the last one for CLG. Yep. Uh, and TSM are fielding the dive king himself. It's a turret-busting team composition through and through. Not only can they kill turrets incredibly fast with his yeah. Tristana, they can also tank turrets better than almost any other champion in the game because of the flat damage reduction Lustboy gets from his ultimate. These boom, turrets... Boom, boom. 
it'll be interesting to see if TSM is willing to go without minions because I think CLG can keep the minion wave back. And maybe they just wait for Baron, but we've seen some pretty aggressive moves from TSM the last 10 minutes that could reflect otherwise. Yeah, they do have teleport on Dyrus. They could accelerate the process of the super minions pushing into the base to try and draw some attention of CLG away, but they're not even going to commit to it. They have five people bursting down the turret. Yeah, Santorin basically gone. Yeah, if Santorin gets grabbed, that means the hook is down. So is the pressure! He dunks Zion Spartan out of midair. Santorin coming big on the Jarvan plays lately. Lust Boy under the turret where he needs to be with the unbreakable will on and gets out with just a sliver of health. They're going to be on the inhibitor. They get a perfect time and engage there without losing anybody. And they're going to wait it out. They're going to say, we want more of the base. We have another inhibitor to take down. And they got eyes on it. There's a lot of really quality coordination coming out from TSM in these turret dives. Bursting down the turret and just dunking with Santorin going in. That's going to be inhibitor number three, most likely. Very, very tough to get away from the plays when TSM can close the gap from such a distance. Three members, four members, really. Dyrus, the only one that can't close it, but the Equalizer's already there with the team if necessary, so they're they using it great. Yeah, it was just a great hard initiation from TSM to punish the Kog'Maw pick. pick. Right. We've seen so many teams have great difficulty with in successfully engaging on Kog AP Kogma comps, but TSM just get that one play from Lustboy, basically. It was the entire team following up, and communication between them all to pull it off. This boy, he's in can't see me mode. All right, he just wants to make sure it's clear. Hey, buddy. <laughs> Where is TSM going? Looks like they're trying to make CLG march to the beat of their drum down mid lane here with the super minions at least. Wait for that bottom lane that'll soon be crushing in as well. It's all just a matter of time before they put the final touches on CLG's base. Very big gold lead for TSM here. And what a game to explode in the middle for TSM. And there's the hook. Bjergsen again waiting it out to make sure he knows where the hook is going. The initiation's on. Aphromoo gets locked in in the back, and they actually take the Lantern into the Cataclysm. So double if brings oh, himself Belter's to safety in that one. Empty. That was from one equalizer, the pull belt yep. from 98% of his health. Beautiful placement in the corridor there by Dyrus. Oh. Inhibitor's down. It's over. It's over. May not be a fight that they want. Zion Spartan over the wall, able to take one kill out. Staves off a bit of the aggression, but TSM, the DPS guys for the turrets are already in the base. Bjergsen and Wild Turtle able to crush these down. They turn on a double lift. He gets stabbed from Azir Soldier, taken down. A double kill for Bjergsen, looking for the triple if He's got the slide, but he decides to stay in place with the team, and they decide to take down the Nexus team. Solo mid on the split. 2-0 over Counter Logic Gaming for the summer in the NALCS. TSM take down Counter Logic Gaming. Yeah, and 4-0 for the year. This means CLG would not be able to get a win against TSM right. unless they meet in the playoffs. Just spring and summer, 4-0. The domination in this matchup continues for Team Solomon. Started at level one, killing X Smithy. CLG fought back pretty valiantly, evening the gold, making it exactly even yeah. about 25 or eight minutes into the game. But then Lust Boy and the whole Switch. TSM squad just decided to go. Well, McSmithy did repair the early game. I feel like there was still that bit of pressure they couldn't provide. If everything was level from the get-go, Eve would have done much more instead of repair the game. He did a good job at it, though. They could definitely play from behind. But Team Solo mid, if they get a lead, they, they don't let go of it very, very, very often. Great job from all of the DPS members of TSM yep. and the front line to set them up. Turtle never had one of those reckless moments. He was able to use his flash as well as his jump yep. uh, to stay safe for the majority of yeah. the game. It was Bjergsen the one in the range for the hooks this time and still was able to flash out, making good plays in that. Seeing how Team Solo mid comes about the games now, really really relying on their... Heading into our next match to see if that will happen. It's Team Dragon Knights versus Team Dignitas. And now for five weeks, we've been in a roster. Been looking at the roster. It's the Team Dragon Knights roster. Well, ladies and gentlemen, the wait is finally over. Ninja and Emperor are here in the mid lane and AD carry, and they're reporting for duty. Woo! And for all intents and purposes, TDK's season kind of starts today, and it looks like survival will be the name of the game. 
Looking at the standings right now, they are four games behind sixth place and would likely have to run the table to get a playoff spot. Last split, nine wins got you in the playoffs. So it's more realistic that their immediate focus is going to be to overtake teammate or other teams down in the standings to avoid the 10th place auto relegation. Yeah, so we'll see if that uh, road upwards happens. Then, of course, they've got a tough match right out of the gate, though. These guys are facing Team Dignitas, and Dignitas have been doing wonderfully. They started the day in first place. They can tie that again here with a win. Certainly a possibility. Dignitas Definitely don't want to let it go, and they want to be able to contain this against a team that now has a few new players. So this is the first look anyone has at these two new players, Ninja and Emperor, coming in as far as the NALCS and how they exist on TDK. That's true. So we'll see how the synergy is for TDK, a team that has been practicing together a bit, but we'll see how the lineup shapes up right now today on cameras. Starting lineups on the blue side for Team Dragon Knight. Seraph in the top lane, Kez in the jungle, Ninja in mid, Emperor on AD carry, Smoothie on support, and the coach Sean. Yes, and on the red side, Run on the win streak is Team Dignitas. Gamsu in the top lane, Helios, who we just saw in the closer look on the jungle, Shifter in mid lane, Korja J on AD carry, and of course, Kiwi Kid on support. Backed by ex-Fanatic coach Rico. It has yeah. been a really, you mentioned the upward trend or the, the winning streak. It's certainly been a pretty rapid growth here for Team Dignitas. At the halfway point, 7-2 first place. They played everyone once. They dropped only two games. It's a pretty damn good start. We'll see if that continues then. I mean, another 7-2 run puts them in potentially even a playoff buy. It's a very worldly game we're about to have here, if you think about it. Yeah. Rico, ex-coach from Europe, mm -hmm. uh, three Koreans on Team Dignitas, many Koreans on TDK. However, Emperor played in Brazil. Ninja played in China. <laughs> we have Kiwi Kid, <laughs> who's always been in the North American LCS. This we just need a guy from LMS in every major region, and even one of the wildcard regions has been represented in this game. So Crazy. Nearly there, nearly there. But picks and bans have begun. Team Dragonites, they've got their bands, they've got their players. This is... Again, the first look we're going to see at the intended starting roster. No Rumble for Gamsu, no Rise for Seraph, no Jarvan for Gamsu either. Two bands so far. Man, I wanted to see Gamsu play Jarvan. I did too. I like what Helio said just now about Gamsu and how he's used to kind of helping players along. I think that also kind of translates to be within the game. When Helios was on Blaze, he would give and give and give so much to Flame so Flame could hard carry and succeed. And he was a big part of Flame's reputation as that carry top laner was Helios' ability to support him. And if we think of carry top laners the last few weeks in the NALCS, it's Gamsu. It yep. was the MVP last week. But in order to be successful as a top laner, your jungler does need to enable you. Well, we'll see if that enabling happens right now. Team Dragonites right away, first pick Sivir. And even though we haven't seen him play on the LCS, Ninja already pulls his first ban of the split. Twisted Fate gone away from him. Already the respect given by the Team Dignitas members. Immediate Rek'Sai, immediate looks like Hecarim as well. How about setting up a top lane carry? Yeah, get that as soon as they can. There's already a couple of top lane bans that have been thrown out with the Rise, the Rumble, and the Jarvan. So... Gamsu really just taking what is left, but also one of his most successful champions. He's played Hecarim mm -hmm. two out of the last three games, and he would be a combined 16, 3, and 21. So I'd say that's pretty good. Uh, yeah, it's something like a 12 KDA in that champion. Seems reasonable. Couple next picks for Team Dragonites then, as Team Dignitas so far have just shown pretty normal standard stuff. Dragonite's kind of the same, but Emperor's first game will be on this Sivir. Ninja won't get to his fate, but he'll get something else. And I want to know if the style stays to what TDK was doing back in the Challenger series. When Seraph was the hard carry split pusher, they relied on him to get themselves back around. In in the sub squad, it was still that way. It seemed like they couldn't rely on their dual lane very much. Their mid laners having a hard time as well. And it was still the Seraph show. With these two new guys, I want to see if TDK changes their gameplay somewhat. Smoothie gets Nautilus, Kez gets Gragas, and we'll wait to see just what Seraph and Ninja are going to do for the team. Yeah, it's pretty remarkable what Seraph has actually done on an 0-9 team. So he's had, um, as far as more kills than deaths or equal to that, uh, in five games of their nine losses, in like some incredibly one-sided defeats. Yesterday, for example, they got completely crushed by Cloud9, but Seraph was 4-0-0 zero zero yep. in that game on a top lane tank. So he will be a pretty worthy adversary for Gamsu. It's just if these new guys can come in Ninja and Emperor to have an impact. It's not like TDK doesn't actually have a few strengths to build upon. Oh, absolutely. So this roster could start out strong. We'll see if it happens. The team should be playing in Korean, which will leave Smoothie, the guy you're seeing on the screen right now. He won't be able to communicate with the team very easily. I understand Kez translates for him in the middle of the game. So uh, they played Challenger that way, and it was fine. The team played in Korean back then as well when they had Luigi G and Kyle on the roster. Ninja's first game in the North American LCS will be on Victor here. 
And the last pick, top lane, will come through in a second. We'll have to be blind. Or sorry, the mid lane pick was blind, but uh, they know they're facing into Hecarim in the top lane. And the Vladimir that had pulled so many bands is going to be the pick. An incredibly high damage team composition coming out from TDK. Grogs and Nautilus going to be trying to provide the vast majority of the CC, but overall just a pretty sturdy team comp. High damage will take a little while to turn on, uh, but no picks that are completely out of the norm. Very standard things there for TDK. Yeah, on top lane, Vladimir. We see him once in a while. He's still one of the least common top laners, and we'll have to see how Seraph can do up against the Hecarim, of course. Meanwhile, Shifter gets the Azir for himself. Such a highly sought after mid laner. Shifter gets him for a last. Feels safe playing it in Victor. And alongside a Rek'Sai jungle, maybe we see kill pressure in the mid lane. Maybe, you know, it's the two ganking junglers, two defense, two uh, kind of mostly escapeless mid laners. Azir can obviously yeah, bash through a bit better at it. Mm -hmm. a little. But the question will actually be for me, how much attention do the junglers pay to the top laners? And will this be a top lane carry game? Because I've never really seen a team doing a toss strategy, at least in the past year, focus around getting Shifter fed. Shifter will play a very passive lane, and Helios will be free to go help out the top laner, for instance. Yeah, absolutely true. So there's the answer to the question. Mid lane may be less likely to be focused. TDK coming in there. Full lineup is there. You're seeing the Dignitas roster on your screen at this time. And the first TDK game of the full lineup up against Team Dignitas, who are looking at securing first place once again at the end of a week. Certainly a possibility. Could go 2-0. and zero. Coaches shaking hands, and we're going to have quite a good game. We have really no good idea of just how good Team Dragon Knights are. We know Dignitas are fairly consistent. Yeah. And as we get into this one, the team's loading onto the Rift. You guys should head over to Twitter and let us know who you think is going to win. Tweet either hashtag TDKWin or hashtag DIGWin. We'll see how the fan vote stands in just a few minutes. Sarah for the rest of his team gonna be looking to turn around that zero and nine start to the split here. Yeah, pretty much the most, the worst possible start to a split in the first nine games is losing every single one. So TDK, yeah, anything is progress. I believe it is the worst start in history in the North American LCS. I don't believe any team's gone winless in the first half of the split. I agree. So TDK, we'll see if they can snap that losing streak. Of course. Fnatic finally broke their own winning streak after beating Gambit on Friday. They finally stretched that to 10. Maybe TDK can break their own bad streak, either positive or negatively. And right now we're looking at just a standard line of scrimmage. Yeah, nothing, a match up. nothing crazy early on. It'll be very interesting to see whether TDK has had much time to practice because we know that they were practicing with Ninja and Emperor. They just weren't playing with them in the LCS. They had a lot of back and forth issues with their subs, visa, travel, work authorization, authorization issues, the works. But really how much League of Legends practice happened there and also how quickly can you go back to the practice you had been having if you're a team that's been playing in the LCS with subs. Uh, even from other teams like NME when Trashy was out of the country for the basically preseason, mm -hmm. it's been taking them a while to kind of turn back on. These are all challenges the TDK doesn't magically solve just because their players are here. Absolutely. Spawned. So the upward road might be a very steep one. Have to see if they've got a strong grip then. Standard assignments as t uh, actually Dignitas will go for the lane swap here. They're not taking any jungle camps in the start. Seraph is trying to spot him and going for any shenanigans. Won't find that here. Meanwhile, TDK will be taking down the Krugs by themselves, leaving Kez to solo farm. Seraph expecting a jungle start, actually. Whoa. is going to be cutting <laughs> off the minion line. Yeah, he was, he was trying to pull his trick where he gets a minion cut uh, to basically preempt level two on the guy taking a camp and punish him for doing that. But now uh, he can't start a camp himself, and he ends up being a little bit denied by kind of guessing wrong. It's actually really, really bad for him as well. Uh, the Thrash is going to continue to zone him off of experience and gold right here, chasing Seraph around the jungle, in fact, on a half health even. Meanwhile, we're going to see just how well J can freeze up this lane. Of yeah. course, similarly, Gamsu's not getting any gold or XP either. Yeah, but at least he's double jungling here. So at the, at the time, Kez will be a little bit ahead of Helios in experience, uh, but Gamsu and Helios are trading jungle to an excessive extent. A lot of the times you will see 
the jungler take every single CS in these double jungling situations, Gamsu's actually gotten a few proofs. So Helios even sharing the jungle with his his best bud, Gamsu. This is tricky. So we're seeing Pig and Toss get ready for the four-man dive smite. under the top turret. Yeah, the smite's going to reveal the wolf. Seraph not yet level two. If he doesn't have Sanguine Pool, I don't know if he can survive the four-man dive. Kez sees they're up there and decides to not even stick to that side of the jungle. Though Smoothie is heading up to try to defend this turret. This is a tight situation, and Dignitas... Yeah. He just needs a minion to die to hit level two, and he's there now. So no Seraph doubt. is level two. The jungler has been there. And because... Here's the other interesting thing. Because the jungler was spotted and the support roamed up, Gamsu knows it's safe to soak the minions on the bottom side. So I still think that comes out in favor of Team Dignitas. And we'll see if that manifests in the scoreboard in a little bit as we saw the Gamsu teleport try to keep himself afloat. Ninja versus Shifter in the mid lane. Small lead to Ninja, but that's no surprise. Shifter typically down a little bit in his lanes. We'll see as that manifests later on in this one. Core JJ and Kiwi Kid about to reach the turret, the two on two. Happily just trading farm. Vlad, of course, not the best at last hitting under turrets. So that might make him lose some more. Meanwhile, Gamsu at 14 CS up against Emperor is doing pretty well for his 1v1. Top laner, as you mentioned, Dignitas yeah. getting ahead. It went, well. it went exactly right if you're just looking for Gamsu. Double jungle into teleporting for a big wave without risk. Oh, that's a big fat hook. Good hook, good play, good Emperor's jump as well. But Ninja will survive with his own shield. Still losing about 500 health for it. Yeah, it's probably going to force it back, but he does preserve both of his summoners. So I like the roam there by Kiwi Kid. It doesn't burn summoners, but it will give Shifter time to catch up in CS. Because it's not like he lost anything for that. They weren't losing pressure anywhere else on the map. The wave was just resetting on the turret. That's what we call a very good efficient gank. Yeah, efficiency is there. Kiwi Kid shows up in time to even get the soul that uh, dropped for that first minion killed. Seraph getting poked out a decent amount, even with boots not dodging phosphorus bombs. And so. Dignitas still looking fairly happy in this matchup. Gamsu forced to recall backwards for uh, Boots and Cloth Armor will lose a lot of waves from Emperor's push in the bottom lane. This means that Seraph is back to tied with Gamsu. His bot lane turret, I think, losing even more health than the top lane was. Dignitas is pushing. So Vladimir, because he's ranged right here and having some support to back him up, should at least be able to farm. He's just eight three to four Phosphorus Bombs in a row, unable to dodge those things despite having boots. So good aim by Core JJ, but also poor juking by Seraph early on here. May end up getting himself pushed a bit out of this lane, which could punish them overall. Yeah, there's a bit of a risk here in the fact that Dignitas actually froze their lane. They could have ganked top if they forced Seraph to continue to engage too far up, but here's a decent attempt. Emperor out of mana, does have summoners though. What can Helios really get? Funnels forward, spell shield pop, nothing. He can get a spell shield but at least he provides a presence for Gamsu's lane. Uh, that one in particular really just gave mana to Emperor. Didn't even yeah. provide presence. And let Seraph know he's not getting ganked. Now, TDK had also invested a lot of wards in that lane. You can actually see really good warding done by Smoothie so far, but knowing Rek'Sai is not going to kill Vlad lets him feel a lot more comfortable, even when he was low on health here. And Emperor, really not flinching at all. Says, okay, Rek'Sai was bot lane, but I'll push again. Yeah. Sitting level six here, so the lane's equalizing out fairly well. Uh, no heavy punishment going down. Nice, nice phosphorus, but the shield blocks nearly all of it. Okay, about two, three hundred permanent damage dealt to Smoothie here, and Seraph has been able to sustain up. Yeah. <sighs> all right. Good. Okay. Oh, it's hard for Vlad. Nice dodge in that phosphorus bomb this time. And overall, we're just seeing this pretty much trade equally. The the attempts you're seeing, you know, well played lane harass and well played. Oh, the hook. Actually, that one's amazing. The ignite is on. Seraph could not possibly live through this one. The first blood goes through to the Thresh and Smoothie with a great hook on a core. JJ nearly makes him die. So many heal force, but still a great first blood for Dignitas. I wonder if Smoothie would have used his ignite if that was a kill on core. JJ because the heal wouldn't have healed up for that yeah. much. But nonetheless, Seraph gets caught by the hook. He was overstaying his bounds with the minion wave being right there. Uh, CS advantage growing for Gamsu over Seraph, and that kill will punish it more. It will be very hard in the future, though, for Team Dignitas to continue to pressure Seraph now because he has picked up the spell vamp. Just a check for you, Jat. He would have died. 75 points off the heal plus 150 from Ignite. Corky lived with 200. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, it would have been the trade kill. Smoothie just unfortunately didn't realize it would have been enough for him. That turret shot maybe not taken into account. Dignitas get away with a nice gold lead thanks to First Blood. Their advantage right now, 800 gold. As Gamsu is also out CSing Seraph, 
Freaky decently thanks for that kill. Spell vamp now in for the Vladimir might make him a bit safer in the matchups, as the duel lanes will also swap themselves both back to the bot lane here. Sheen plus Longsword versus BF Sword. A lot of mid lane close. Gold right now. And Ninja puts the early W down. Will not get flash knock up by Helios. Gragas was nearby to defend that, but maybe he could have been forced regardless. Ninja was out of mana, couldn't have defended himself or fought back. Demon Toss, they're gonna get Scuttle Crab on the bottom side. Yeah. I want to talk just really briefly about Victor item builds. This is the second time this week I've seen a Fiendish Codec first instead of the Hex Core upgrade. Mm. Um, I feel like there's so much power built into the Hex Core upgrade. Uh, getting your Death Ray extended, basically once you get it, even at level 5, it allows you to take out the back row of minions. Definitely at level 7 with 4 points, it one-shots the back row. Uh, so it's an ease of CSing as well as just two power upgrades. But yet we see this finish codec again and again. I think the mindset of these guys is A, it's cheaper than 1,000 gold, so sometimes you can go back beforehand, and B, they buy it in lanes where they don't necessarily want to push yet. Uh, the dangers that Ninja have with Kiwi Kid roaming around so frequently and Helios being a fairly gank-oriented jungler just allows him to go with CDR, more frequent spells to clear CC. He just can't wave clear quickly. Uh, and just don't expect Ninja to really be pushing into Shifter whatsoever, and is definitely going to be playing some defense with that Fiendish Codec instead of the Hex Core upgrade right off the bat. Yeah, well, you talk about ease of wave clear and playing defensively, but Ninja is being actually pushed around by Shifter in rare form. Shifter goes in for the fight right away. Shield comes on, though. Ninja with a trade back in. Barrier pop, Ninja pop, summoner heal himself. No more on Amicon to cut that in half. Chaos Storm still churning, and it's actually nearly an equal trade, but Shifter was winning the lane up until that point anyway. Yeah. A lot of that was because Kiwi Kid forced him back to base early on and allowed Shifter to get the early reaction and oh. no heal. Yeah, he doesn't want to burn his flash. Nice job putting the gravity field right on top of him. That's very key when you're getting ganked by a Rek'Sai. Rek'Sai can't follow through very easily. Mm -hmm. So Ninja narrowly escaping like the third gank in his lane, I want to say, by 10 minutes. Certainly a lot of attention uh, being pulled, Diglatoss spending a lot of time down there. Now it's to the bottom lane. Corey today gets the lantern just in time. Gets stunned up though. Looks like Valkyrie gonna do nothing. And the kill goes through to Emperor. An amazing explosive cast by Kez makes Kiwi can flash, but here oh. comes Kansu. Gonna knock Kez right back into the turret. Gets the kill. A one for one. It's all said and done. Yeah, so both top laners actually expending their teleport. Seraph canceled his because he realized it wouldn't have been effective, but ultimately they trade a one for one. Uh, Really aggressive play by Kez there to follow up with the Flash Body Slam and get the kill at the end of it. Plus TDK can get the turret. But that's also a fight where Gansu gets a kill early on into the game, which I think is what Team Dignitas wants. A little hat for the minion there, and Team Dignitas now slightly on the back foot. The farm still basically the same, or I should say the gold about the same. Gansu, uh, of course, let Seraph get one to two waves up there, so the Vladimir catches up a little bit on his way towards Will of the Ancients, but uh, TDK looking pretty decent in the early game. Kind of what we expect. They were fine early game in their previous incarnation as well. To me, what I expect from the growth of this roster should be how they look in the mid to late game with the full roster here. Yeah, I think that's definitely what will make or break this team. As you said, TDK, They've had numerous early and mid-game advantages, but just no team cohesion to close things down. I don't expect it to magically be there, but changing the languages in which you play it being a more comfortable environment for many of the players to be here can all make some pretty big differences. Kez, at the forefront of these engages. Feeling really happy. A lot of burst damage coming across. The Kiwi Kid will still get picked off. Just the further chase by TDK is going to work out. Emperor did not use ult for that. It's going to be back up in about 10 seconds, but he's also gotten the kill in time for a Dragon. Looks like Team Dignitas might have to see this part of the map. Kiwi Kid could not get the position to place the wards down. There's no teleport threat by Gomsu. The turret is dead in that lane as well, so Core JJ cannot safely farm. I think that would have been a dragon that is very takeable. TDK is just biding their time, however, and not necessarily going for it. We're seeing Seraph start to get the better of Gamsu as well. Looks like there's no damage to be dealt really from the Hecarim. He also bought the early cloth armor fighting the Sivir earlier on, and okay. Seraph just out sustaining these fights. The top lane battle is getting better and better for this TDK top laner. Gamsu recalls home guards right back to the top lane. Yeah. Seraph, to point out, will have TP first. He's going to have about a 90-second advantage in the cooldown here. Yeah, it's very true. That would be 
probably has gone utility spec in his masteries because they did teleport at the same time. So the a fact cancel that TP is only. Um, oh yeah, it's a cancel TP. My bad. He did cancel that one. That lane also, even though Seraph has a bit of an upper hand, I don't think it's going to snowball that hard. Mm -hmm. Once a Hecarim makes it to his home guards, you can push him out of the lane. But he's going right to be back, back real fast. <laughs> yeah, good point. Well, then I'll just subtly track that top lane farm lead. It's hovering around 18. We'll see if it goes anywhere from there and where people assign themselves. But Seraph, who had given up first blood, is going to do what he can to survive against Gamsu as time moves on. Six Seraph not really trying to push the lane that he wants to be able to freeze and make Hecarim overextend. Of course, no flash on that champion means escaping would require his ultimate cooldown. We'll see how much he wants to commit to get some farm. Level 9 nearly there for Vladimir, that all-important rank 5 transfusion. A couple of recalls come back through. We're still sitting at a tied game with uh, pretty few forced actions. TDK went in. For a turret kill, that worked out quite nicely. They also knocked down Kiwi Kid, but not trying for Dragon or anything just yet. Helio still playing a bit defensively. TDK still push their lane up. They try to roam into the jungle. They try to tax Helios and shift there. And they're really keeping yeah. Dignitas honest. This is where TDK found their last kill. They have good ward coverage within the team Dignitas jungle. And if they want to create more mid lane pressure, being able to deny this blue buff is very key. Two, as you mentioned, two really good wards kind of flanking this blue buff here. They can watch all of the Dignitas movements there. Botlin got equalized. Mid lane has no champions in it as Shifter goes all the way over to grab his blue. This could be a window for TDK to shove him mid, get the inside track, and push this turret down a little bit. What route will Kiwi Kid and Shifter have to take? They can walk right back through. No gains. Yeah, that makes the goal pretty much dead even. As we move more and more toward the team fight phase, I really want to pay close attention to Emperor. Latman didn't really have solid team fighting games. His positioning was very lackluster, especially yesterday on the Sibyl. Emperor is a much more experienced AD carry, playing now in his third major competitive region. Maybe, no, I'm going to count Brazil on this. Sure. Uh, so. Hey, they beat Alliance. Yep. And basically, the fact that he started 2 0 gives him that potential to carry that I don't think quite existed with Latman. It's going to be an interesting point of focus to see if Dignitas can shut him down. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I got to agree. Emperor definitely a very skilled player. We'll see if they can put their trust in him. The 2-0 start, it's pretty much one of the best ways you could ever hope to debut in the North American LCS. DDK is still holding equal against the team known for either games who snowballs or they play a, a slow methodical game to the mid game. So far, we are still equal. Good Lantern. Yeah, that would have been scary. Kez could have chanced the explosive cask, but a risk not taken. Dragon still on the map 16 minutes in. We are at default lanes. All teleports are up, so TDK unable to utilize that 90-second uh, window of teleport advantage for Seraph. Turns into nothing, but... Yeah, based on the records of a 7-2 and two Team Dig and Toss and a 0-9 TDK, you would expect a very one-sided game here yeah. uh, for Team Dig. But even in Team Mignotas' victories, it's kind of shown that aside from that one match where Gamsu went totally off on Jarvan, they haven't started games with big leads. They're yeah. pretty much always splitting even in the mid game and then making very decisive and explosive calls in the mid and late game. So this is now the moment where Team Dignitas wants to be able to turn on mm -hmm. and take control of the game. Oftentimes, it's been punishing opponents' moves. Uh, but at the moment, TDK isn't making many moves. This is kind of the breaking point for whether TDK or Dignitas, uh, how they win and lose their games. TDK's yeah. had decent early games, even with the subs, and it's always broken the wrong way, whereas seven out of nine times, Team Dignitas has gotten the victory. Yeah, and I wonder what, what effect this sort of full starting roster has on the TDK members. Back when Kez with complexity, he was always a very sort of calming voice. He wouldn't didn't rush into many things, and it feels like with the full roster here, he's happy to go back to that slightly more reserved style this year. Good push on towards the Dragon. They're going to get that one cleanly, and they walk right on out. Team Dignitas not even trying to defend this one. Just grab a lantern. No. Looks cooler to go through a tunnel, man. Yeah. I think there's a chance he gets like hooked by Nautilus if he went through the lantern. I don't know if that's true or not, but yeah. either way, whatever, Helios is fine. And TDK get the first dragon of their uh, new team's career. Yeah. It's a reborn team, Dragon Knights. 
this first match. Let's say they're zero and zero. Okay. That's how we're basically going to have to judge the skill of these guys because it's a pretty unfortunate set of circumstances that led to them not having their intended roster until halfway through the split, but now it's here. And honestly, it's looking okay so far. Yep. They're going toe to toe with a team that is seven and two. Team Dignitas has looked like one of the best teams in North America this entire split. Yeah. But yeah, as these guys continue to play risk averse, it just it's not breaking for a while. I do want to keep track on the individual members though. Emperor has continued to build actually a minion lead. Uh, the lane swap was roughly equal. He, of course, he got two early kills, but now Emperor is actually ballooning that advantage, whereas Ninja is actually going the opposite way. He's fallen farther and farther behind. Seraph's actually tied back up with Gamsu, uh, which is pretty impressive by him against the, again, last week's MVP, and Seraph's holding up just fine here. We've talked about his praise enough. Looks like a top lane move by Smoothie to tie up with. Seraph's going to get a lot of damage this turret. Kez shows as well, and with only three members to defend. TDK will back off after getting a lot of damage, but mid and bot keep getting pushed in. These moves by TDK, they're slowly eking out these advantages. TDK has tremendous wave clear in their team yeah. composition. Ninja clears it with one death ray. Vladimir shoves better than almost any top laner, and Sivir clears it with a couple of spells. So every lane can constantly be pushed, which makes the moves the team Big and Toss put in uh, very difficult to pull off. Uh, if they want to go super aggressive. Serif canceled his teleport thinking Emperor was safe. Gamsu's gonna go for the ulti spell shields. The damage, but not the fear, flashes over. And that will keep him alive. Will play it on all counts. Serif thought he was safe, but all summoners gone for Emperor. Yeah, two summoners burned for one. But I don't think Gamsu could have stayed up top and defended that turn anyway. Serif's push is rather relentless. In the meanwhile, though, Dignitas trying to use their point of power in this game, which this time is actually Shifter. A rare 40 CS lead at 20 minutes for yeah. Dignitas in mid lane. Definitely looking good. We're just seeing advantages traded now across the map. The Vladimir split push finally knocks the turret down, but Team Dignitas off of the teleport towards Emperor. They force him out of lane, and Core JJ able to knock the turret down himself. Mid lane still staying equal, so we've basically just managed to split all the outer sides of the map. We saw the aforementioned TDK Dragon take. Gold-wise, we're again at an equal game. Just that smallest of Dragon leads. Technically meaning TDK is winning, as far as stats are concerned. Yeah. And they're also getting to ward very, very well. Yeah, they're TDK is winning in pressure right now, for sure. Because of their tremendous wave clear, it's giving them windows to go and place the wards. Whereas Team Vingatoss has to spend a little bit longer to clear the waves. And this is the first time they're getting a turret edge taking an interior turret. But will Team Vingatoss be able to punish? They're all about getting the proper flanks. That's how they've been able to win their games. Oh. And they're flanking now, Freak. Flashhook's gonna miss, but he has the flame. He wants Kez, and looks like the answer is he does. Flash away, body some and Helios blocks it though. Gets the knock and TDK does get the kill. They're sorry, Dignitas gets the kill onto TDK's jungler, and the chase continues. Gravity Field comes back off a cooldown used for the dive in towards Ninja. Nice Hemo play to push back Kiwikin, and Dignitas do not want to continue this fight. A one for zero, but top lane tier two had died. This will be the name of the game for TDK. They push, beta collapse, and then try and take another, another turret. Trading a mid lane turret for one kill is actually worth it in the grand scheme of things, so despite the kill from Team Dignitas, TDK wins that trade. And a pretty damn well played game by TDK so far. They're basically all playing as though they're Seraph. A bunch of split push, a bunch of wave clear. And if you ever miss which lane TDK is going to, turret goes down. And they can just ult back out with Sivir. So it feels like playing this open map and trying to continually roam around and find turrets to kill is working for TDK. Their aggressive wards were already set up for that top turret, and it fell. It's pretty fascinating that a team that is just now coming together is trying to play such a difficult strategy to pull off cohesively. Playing split push compositions like this and to be successful means everyone needs to be pressuring at the same time and no one can be caught pressuring uh, while the team is, is back. It does take a lot of practice to pull off a team composition like this. Normally you'd expect a team that hasn't been playing together for very long to do more just power pick, death ball, team fighting things, group it in the objective and just kind of go. Uh, but they're going very clearly for the split push 1-3-1 one, one strategy. Yeah, TDK hasn't even won a single team fight. It's been a catch here, a catch there, and maybe someone getting picked off. But it's been an objective-focused game. Four to two in turrets, one to zero in dragons. That dragon comes back up in one minute. And uh, again, we need to see what TDK chooses to do. Dignitas, of course, very good at uh, their own play style of playing a bit passively and capitalizing on any mistakes they see. The question is, are there any mistakes that Kez will call that Helios can capitalize on? 
that'll be the question. With Dragon coming up in 40 seconds, there are opportunities for both teams here. So TDK, they want to get vision coverage up, and if Kez can get a nice knockback onto Azir, there's no resistances necessarily, and Ninja could just blow him up, which would allow Emperor to clean up the backside of the fight. For Team Dignitas, they need some type of flank ward so Gamsu could teleport in, but the teleport's not even up yet. So as far as this dragon being contestable, Team Dignitas would need to actually delay TDK until the teleport is there, and it looks like it may just end up being uh, an objective trade attempt. It is one minute on the teleport cooldown of this Gamsu Hecarim. TDK identify that Gamsu is still top lane, so he's going to battle him, and there's the push in for the Dragon. Top lane turret does go down, but Dragon number two cleanly goes over to Team Dragon Knights. The gold once again tied as the turrets are nearly equalized here, but we look back at our scoreboard. It's now 55 minutes for Shifter. That's what's keeping Dignitas in the game, but Seraph himself now up 15 over Gamsu. Those two lanes continue to snowball in opposite directions. Wouldn't it be fitting if Team Dragon Knights got their first win by taking five dragons <laughs> and reaching their true form? Uh, this is an interesting call, though. They sense the window of the long dragon dance uh, going into a uh, dragon take. Very late scrying orb. That's a 3,000 health Baron. He's going to go. Yep. TDK is going to have to rush in for fight. Well, the knockout's going to land with the two carries of TDK. Sorry, I'll keep Dignitas. Keep getting it backwards, but the hook comes in. Kiwikit has already died a 4v5 and outruns Dignitas. No chase available. Civility has already ended. So, Baron for one, pretty good for Team Dignitas. Very timely call. Finding the window within the game that you can sneak a Baron is always critical. Team Solomon had one in their CLG game that they didn't actually end up capitalizing on. Didn't end up costing the game. Team Dignitas makes Baron their friend this time. Uh, Azir kills Baron mm -hmm. so quickly. So it needs to be respected in all games. A little late on the Scrying Orb. And Team Dignitas honestly keeps it close with that Baron. Neck and neck, number one versus number 10, and we're still at an equal game 25 minutes in. We finally got to see that smart shot gobble by Helios to give his team that Baron up there. Otherwise, the slow and controlled game of TDK has otherwise been eking out advantages. As you mentioned, certainly still anybody's game here, and the next few recalls come in. So what I'm looking for now is the, the hints of where these teams might go next. TDK right now have actually lost almost all their wards, though you expect mid and bot to be the pressure. Emperor actually already jumped on by Gamsu. A lot of damage coming through. Emperor does get away, and now actually Smoothie is around. Hook doesn't quite land. Yeah, so that's the second time Gamsu's burned both of Emperor's summoners, but I like how Emperor is staying safe while maintaining his farm. He needs to have Gamsu on his mind at all times, and he's avoiding, so far, Gamsu from snowballing the game. Team Dignitas, for now, because of the Baron buff, has wave control which is exactly what you want to be able to have against a split push team, almost forcing them to group. It's not like Vladimir, Victor, Sivir is bad in a group though. So yeah. just being there, uh, not necessarily what Team Vingatoss needs. Having the summoners down on Emperor means Team Vingatoss has to flank appropriately if they want to fight. I think they're now going to be going on the split push of their own. Yeah, with Baron Buff, I mean, you can see how bad the wave clear now is from Victor. The fact that he just doesn't kill these melee minions very well. Mid lane being pushed as well. Emperor, the only wave clear available. Hook doesn't quite land, and Dignitas slowly but surely putting a bit of damage on these tier two turrets. Summoned a zero turret as well, easily able to help them siege. Dragon is playing on the back foot for the next minute as they wait for the Baron to time out here. Dignitas relying pretty heavily on Gamsu to make stuff work, but you're seeing how much damage he's taking from Seraph, and actually Gamsu is a bit more health than he'd like, down to 1100 HP, he's gonna be forced to recall home right back in. So much for the split pushing. Yeah. Team Dignitas doesn't, I don't think they caught a single turret after Baron. No. Yeah. So, it kind of just goes to show you how difficult it will be for them to push turrets down. Oftentimes, a team will get a Baron as a catalyst for taking the outer turrets almost for free. But whenever you take a Baron in a closer contested game, you actually have to be stronger than the other team as well in order to access that power. Which Team Dignitas just couldn't do. And that generally means we're going for the next Dragon. And yeah, next Dragon's gonna be about two minutes away. Unfortunately for Dignitas, they got that Baron right after Dragon went down, so there's no chance that they could have taken a secondary objective with the power they had of Baron buff. Just means we reset the map once again. I'm gonna look at Vision Control. Because TDK was forced from the base, all of their deep wards have timed out. They have literally a ward in river, and that's it. But Dignitas has kind of spent all that time getting some wards down. They've actually already prepped this dragon. TDK is going to take quite a bit of time getting themselves back and ready for it. Yeah, the 
lingering effects of having Baron buff, basically. Because mm -hmm. they had the map presence to get those wards down. It's been very, very slow game up yeah. until this point, but rather strategic. They're not really trying to take risks. TDK is basically the ones creating this style by never really overextending themselves, so it makes it very difficult for Team Minotaur to make plays. Gamsu's tried on a couple occasions, True. but it's just been stifled and then pushed back on by TDK. This would be a time to fight, though, for the third drag. And here's the Sephiroth pop right on Akimi. Can they go? One more hit will kill him. The Boomerang Blade's going to miss, though. And in comes Gamsu, who finds them for the AD carry goes down. His first of the season. And as the battle continues, Soldier's in the right spot. A knockup onto Seraph, but he's a pretty durable Vladimir with all this spell vamp. No second kill comes through, but it does mean Diglatas have control of the map. So they actually do blow up Emperor, and it's while his Flash and Heal were down, which is critical. That's the fight the Team Dignitas needed to pick within five minutes of Gamsu making the play down on the bottom side. Because of that kill, they can prep the Dragon a little bit more, but the fight actually happened a little bit too early. People are going to be able to run back to the Dragon and fight again. Yeah, what did help the Gintas was the fact that Seraph had to maintain a wave. He was top lane and TP'd into the fight to stop the bleeding. So there's a teleport advantage for Dignitas, as well as a bit of gold coming into their pockets. The ward advantage actually still maintained. I think we only have a Scuttle Crab keeping a TDK's vision up around Dragon. And makes you think Dignitas still in a very good spot to make Dragon number three theirs. Yeah, it's a big thing to track the ultimates, obviously. No Hecarim ult, no Sivir ult, no Grog Assault, no Vlad ult. It'll be a... Bit of a slap fest early on if they decide to fight for this dragon before the alternates are up. Mm -hmm. But it would be a takeable fight. I think yeah. they're a little bit respectful of Shifter's level 16 Emperor's Divide, however. Yeah. Both Divinus have theirs, and Corky doesn't really need cooldowns for that one. The dragon attempt. Ooh, no steal for Kez. He's got to be a bit careful. Already at half. Gamsu, of course, cannot charge in just yet. Gets a lantern out. Dragon safely to Dean Dignitas, and TDK is going back to mid to clear. But Dignitas not really done. Still looking forward. Gamsu wants it. Finds some damage on a server, loses all his health for Gamsu! Forced to ult away from the fight, and in comes the hard engage. Core JJ gets dropped, these AD carries constantly dying. Seraph the back line pops, Azonia stays alive. In comes Helios, oh wow! Bunch of damage from Shifter, cleaning up the fight, but he's the only guy left alive on the team. Nice oh. Q by Emperor, takes him down. How's that for an Emperor's Divide, and TDK win the fight? Core JJ was evaporated by some damage at the start of that fight. Gamsu wanted it, could not get an ultimate off in an offensive fashion, and TDK used the Vladimir Victor power to win that fight, and now they're going to go for a big edge. They can get this inhibitor. Absolutely. Inhibitor turret's going to be a cakewalk. The inhibit itself can't defend. Four seconds on Corky. Kiwi Kid's alive, but he's not going to go for 1v3. What a great fight. TDK turn it around after they see the dragon to Dignitas and come out convincingly. Yeah, they were just waiting on their ultimate cooldowns once again. Seraph got off a fantastic hero plague which led to that evaporation of Core JJ and many members of Team Dignitas. Looking at this one more time. Gamsu had a lot of damage before going in. Then it's once he gets hooked, just all things towards his base, kind of leaves the rest of Team Dig out to dry. Both backliners get in range of Seraph, and Seraph just does work. Zonia-zing right afterwards, but oh, Team wow. Dignitas, this, this is maybe a bit too bold because oh, yeah. TDK is right here. The hook comes in. They find Kiwi Kid. Maybe not the worst target. They, they got Ninja. Ninja. Goes down. Core JJ is still alive, but Kez and the Vladimir are here. Core JJ will get himself killed. Emperor joins the fray as well, but it's still a couple of kills back and forth. A two for two. Seraph going to get dropped easily by Shifter. Somehow, Team Dignitas puts all five of their team members within the Baron pit and win a fight. Two to three. The Baron, of course, is still up, but the Catalyst was the Baron to begin that fight. Shifter had great zone control with the Azir that fight that let them keep it close. This just turned into a bit of a bloodbath. Ninja was unable to cast Chaos Storm that fight. I don't know if it was on cooldown or if he died too fast, but the fact that that ability was not used in the fight is pretty impressive. Looks like it's just coming off cooldown. It's up. It's up at the very start. Helios knocks him up, tracking Ninja. Then he gets terrified and hit by the Baron. Oh, and wow. then killed. So cc for pretty much the entirety, which hurt the TDK collapse. Team Pigatoss was actually able to spread quite well, thus avoiding a lot of the AoE of TDK and almost nullifying the Sivir ultimate because TDK didn't focus on one side. Seraph was trying to kill the back line, whereas the rest of the team was on the front line slash the Baron. Mm -hmm. So sloppy team fighting there by TDK, but it was a chaotic creation by Team Pigatoss to go for that Baron. Hey, force their hand, certainly. 
Rex is to... loud. Yeah, yes, she, she is. She wants in. Uh, she's angry. Zero one. She wants in. Has a death. Kept it from being James Bond in this one. And Shifter, he poked around. Now, of course, mid inhibitor, keep in mind, is still dead. And Dignitas are playing with a small 1,000 gold deficit. It does give TDK the general sense of map control here, although Dignitas will refuse to say die. Double Sight Stone for both teams does need plenty of wards to try to keep the sneaks at bay. Cordy Day to pop his QSS yeah. for nothing. That could end up hurting him if he ends up getting. Hemoplague is the main reason. Yeah. I feel like it's a running joke at this point that I always call Rek'Sai. He's <laughs> gonna, gonna continue doing that by mistake. All right. Just so everyone knows, I'm sorry in advance. Helios was the key in this sense. Helios. He wanted it. <laughs> I like it. Yeah. I'm a fan, Jet. All well done. Planned. <laughs> All right, well, Azir turret self-destructs. And Teeth Lingus have done a good job of just holding on to that mid lane and not letting it go anywhere. But TDK, again, with the control to push lanes in first. Top lane has been pushed out by them. Bot lane is building up. And now here comes a push in towards mid. Helios trying to run. Shifter as well. Might have to ult to keep himself safe. Does so. Kez will not get it with body stamp, but that is an important ultimate on cooldown for a minute right now. Yeah, and TDK oh. tries to maintain vision control of this spot. They burned so much in that attempt, though. It was a Sivir ultimate for an Azir ultimate. Honestly, I would rather have... Sivir? The Sivir ultimate, yes. Because then they could have used it to go for Gamsu and maybe burn another ultimate away. Uh, as it is now, Team Binger Toss can still initiate, so no real forces coming out. Yeah. Well, 10 second mismatch for the cooldown. Sivir gets hers back in 40 seconds, Azir's in 30. Uh, you wait another two waves and it ends up not mattering in the first place anyway. Baron attempted though before these ultis do come back up. A lot of damage going through. Dignitas must know about this. A lot of words coming down. They're not in the right health. position to fight. They can try and steal, but they need time. Now they're going for the fight. Blue team is slain. Baron actually, that goes to Team Dragonites, and right on top of it they go. Gamsu taking a lot of damage, but Lantern right back out. Core JJ locked up, can't QSS. Will try to kite away Seraph, and he's Whoa. still gonna go down. Two kills picked up for TDK. Make that three. Seraph does get killed, but it's a four for one with mid and hip dead and Baron. Seraph did so much work in that fight. The Sivir ultimate is up in these long death timers, plus the Baron buff could mean TDK's first win of the split. Well, you said it'd be a hard road. Maybe nine wins required to make playoffs. Well, they're going to start with their new lineup with a win right off the bat. They knock Team Dignitas down a peg. TDK going to get their first win on the board, and maybe the miracle season has begun. With the new roster, these guys are undefeated. Oh, hold up! The inhibitor respawns! The inhibitor didn't respawn. even over yet! <laughs> and Team Dignitas is reviving, maybe? Oh, no. They can't. It can't they possibly. Can. They got it. Okay. Well, everyone throws begins. for a loop. Again, TDK with the new lineup, fresh start, kind of one and zero. <laughs> what if the miracle season happens? Yeah. That would be quite the story. That's a nice way to welcome Ninja and Emperor to the team is with a win over a seven and two team, Dingatos, who was just a half game out of first place before this game. Emperor 5, 1, and 10, but even though Seraph had the 2, 4, and 8 scoreline, he had so many outplays of Team Dignitas in that Baron fight. Yeah. Just pooling right around and underneath the pretty much every spell that Team Dignitas threw at them, mm -hmm. killing Core JJ again and again. Yeah, I really like how TDK came in with this lineup. Now, we knew at the beginning of the split, this was a lineup they were practicing with. They didn't practice with the sub squad. These guys were, they were in North America, work eligible or not, Emperor and Ninja were still playing with the roster from the US and, and waiting until their eligibility came through. This team looked pretty well practiced. The team comp was good. They, they covered the fact that Vlad would be low mobility in the top lane by having a Sivir on the team that I believe they first picked. That lined up well. Ninja lost lane, but went 5 1 and 4 this game was consistent enough to show up in team fights. Only that one mistake at the Baron battle. Yeah, and it's very interesting how TDK played the split push for so long and then recognized when they were strong enough to start grouping and just kind of went for it. So once Seraph hit those item breakpoints, having the Void Staff, Zonias, and as well as Ninja having Death Cap plus some Death Ray upgrades, uh, they just started to go for the group fights. Then they grouped up with Sivir in one. So they, they pivoted the way they were playing the map kind of halfway through the game to 
benefit their power spikes as best as possible. And yeah, they I think they really shocked Team Dignitas in this game. Uh, yeah. No one really expected to face a coordinated Team TDK in their first match with the full roster. But that's exactly what happened. These yeah. guys looked very, very strong. This is a Team Dignitas who had beaten Team Liquid. They had beaten Team Solo Mid. They just beat Enemy Esports yesterday and showed that they could play a strong, consistent game. And games are getting a bit ahead or not, just there was not a lot shown for these guys. The slow consistent game was slowly and surely outplayed by TDK. There was a 4-2 turret lead, there was a 2-0 dragon lead. Just the incremental advantages kept going in the favor of the newcomers here. Again, it's Team 8 versus Enemy Esports. And this now, especially with TDK's win just now, this is a high-value game for both these teams. For Team 8, they beat Enemy back in Week 3. They would love to own the head-to-head -head in case you need a tiebreaker, maybe for one of the bottom spots in the split. Yeah, and even though Enemy's above Team 8 in the standings, they do look vulnerable. Yesterday, Enemy was not very coordinated in their team play, and they continue to rely pretty heavily on their two carry positions, Inox and Ardor, too hard carry. The rest of the team does need to kind of step up around them. And we'll see if these guys can step up quickly enough because even though Otter has come up with some very big performances for Enemy, he still says that nerves have been affecting his game. Yesterday, uh, I don't, I'm not too happy with my own performance because I played a little too scared. And what I mean by what, uh, how I played scared, I mean that like I'm using my, uh, t my summoners too irrationally, like I'm using them too quickly without, like even if there's not danger, but it's just like, it's a panic, it's a panic motion. And it's like, uh, if, uh, if I don't play as scared, uh, I can probably carry like team fights because I can commit and do more damage. I mean, absolutely. This is a player who went 10, 1, and 6 on Vayne against Gravity. Yep. Like, not only is playing Vayne a little bit ballsy, but in your first game on the LCS stage, you're like, you have a hard carry this team, no big deal. It, getting back to that, that sort of mentality would be really, I think, wise for Otter and the rest of enemy esports. Yeah. See if they can do it. It's strange. The potential we saw from enemy esports coming into this split seemed yeah. high in the Challenger series, but the adjustment to the stage has been harder for this team than many others. It does really feel like, even in post-game interviews, they are still suffering some from some pretty heavy nerves. Yeah, which is really unfortunate. We'll see if they can shape or, uh, shake that out in time, because for now, we're going to check out the starting lineups. And on the blue side is Team 8 with Catlid Trolls up at the top lane, Porpoise in the jungle, Golden Glue in mid, Nian on AD carry, Dodo on support, and History Teacher as the coach. Yeah, we'll see how they do. On the red side, it is Enemy Esports with Flares in the top lane, trashing in the jungle, Inox in mid laner, Otter on AD carry, Body Drop on support, and their coach, Brad. Brad Marks, yep. Yeah. And Isn't here history teacher's real name Brad? Uh, it was on the prompt and I forgot. If yeah. we get the graphic back up, we can see. But uh, I actually, unfortunately, don't. I don't remember real names very well. There's only a few people I remember their real names uh, on top of my head. So someone will what, correct do me. Do you remember your own real name? Uh, uh, one of the few. Yeah. Uh, yeah. David. David Fleek Turley. Yeah. That's um, the real name. That's 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 really my middle name. Middle is name Fleek. is Fleek. <laughs> Not exactly true. But we are into the game, ladies and gentlemen. Teammates sitting on two and seven right now. Of course, they are 1-0 against Enemy Esports in the overall season. Enemy sitting just one win ahead at three and six, meaning a win here for teammate would drop Enemy into ninth via tiebreaker, though. Yeah, as you said, huge value game, especially yeah. kind of knowing the TDK has finally arrived in the country, and we don't know what's going to happen with that team for the rest of the split. It's no longer this safety uh, for teams. Last split by the last half, uh, the teams in the bottom of the standings had some safety in realizing the Coast was probably not winning another game. Yeah. That's not going to exist this split, so the competition uh, through all parts of the standings becomes very exciting. Yeah, if you extrapolate TDK continuing to win, that means positions 8, 9, and 10 are teammate Cloud9 yeah. and enemy esports. If TDK it actually turns into a top right. team. I mean, just if they pick up like five wins or something, that still pushes these teams down, and that becomes pretty scary. Enemy are uh, right now tied with Cloud9 and wins. Teammate could tie Cloud9 and wins with a, with a win right here. They're only two behind Impulse. We'll just see how that continues to shake up on the back half of the split. But the first rematch of Teammate and Enemy Esports is going to come through with uh, a smattering of bans all around. Teammate not allowing Inox to play an Assassin. And Enemy Esports really removing team fight mids from Golden Blue. Definitely. So Golden Blue, no team fight arena for you. <laughs> Although there's there's still a numerous Cassio and Oriana have been play. Yeah. still around. Taking a look, yeah, Cassio is definitely one of his most played champions. It's been dying off heavily 
in the LCS if you think about it. Mm -hmm. Very little Casio since the early I weeks. Think Azir like started getting banned less, and it just seems like people perceive Azir as the better champion. That's yeah. That's my theory. It feels like Azir wins the all-ins in the trading matchups most of the time, as long as he doesn't get stunned by the Casio. Mm -hmm. By the way, you were close. It's Chad, not Brad. But I mean, basically, you know, the same. Best uh, kind of the same. <laughs> basically, <laughs> not technically. That would be yeah. incorrect, but. Either way, we're going to move on from the name theories. We are here with teammates' first pick being Rek'Sai, as Gragas was banned. That ban's going to pull a bunch of weight as they're going to get an early pressure jungler. One of the most successful champions for Porpoise, when teammate went on that pretty long win streak towards the back half of the spring split, it was a lot of Rek'Sai games in a row from Porpoise, so yep. um, already looking like uh, things that history have shown to be good. Definitely. And I wonder if we're going to see Otter go for the old Sivir. There's been a very high priority put on that pick, but hmm. there's Callista still available yeah. as well, so there wasn't one thing. of those single bans. Oh. Oh. I'm going to say Sid Annie. Or it's Jungle Nautilus. Here are the possible combinations. Or Top Nautilus. Go ahead, go. Just go. Sorry. Possible combinations. Plenty of possible. Support Nautilus, mm -hmm. which means the possible combinations are Top and Mid Annie. Top Annie could be a thing. Uh, or mid lane Annie, which means Nautilus could go support, jungle, or top. That's probably it. Still a lot of combinations. Yep. Yeah, Annie's got th three rolls. You could technically see top end. Yeah, Annie's got two main rolls. Nautilus has got two to three. We'll see where it ends up going, but... Uh, either one of them can go three different places. Yeah. Either way, it's going to be fun. We're going to stop with the permutations for now. It's uh, a lot of numbers overall. Uh, three choose two, something like that. I'm sure I'm wrong here, but teammate to make some, own, some choices for themselves. Either way, they expect... A couple of different options here, and they're going to get actually my favorite duo lane in League of Legends, or one of my top three, I would say. Morgana Callista, I think, is so incredibly potent. You can trigger the Sentinel passive, and she's also really good by being thrown into the team uh, through Fate's Call. So a scary duo lane for teammate. Nyana Dota could have a high impact this game. Didn't even mention the best part. It's like impossible to kill either one of them. Uh, also true. Yeah, because Morgana can always just black shield the Callista, so Callista walks away yeah. and then get thrown back in. Yeah, well, it's because, it's because I never die, so I don't think about defensive options. I just think of killing people. It's definitely false. <laughs> <laughs> definitely is. And it looks like we're... I'm trying to, trying to see what's going on on screen here. It looks like there's a bit of confusion on the enemy esports lineup. Uh, we were informed we might pull out of champ maybe select a champ here. Maybe champ select issue. Um, but we'll have to see. I mean, maybe, maybe Nautilus Annie was an accident and something else was intended to be picked. We'll have to see, though. They're still discussing, and they might pick in their next two champions. We'll have official word on that in the near future. Four seconds for Enemy Esports' next pick. Olaf! And maybe not on purpose. Maybe it is. I mean, maybe I mean, they... I was going to wonder why Trashy is sitting on Ghost as a summoner spell. <laughs> there feels like there's some confusion going on in the no. teammate. Looks quarters. like we're good. We're told problem resolved. Right. They're going to play these champions. And uh, Trashy's running Ghost on Olaf. That might, in fact, be him playing Olaf Jungle. Saver is, of course, a good combo for that. And a bunch of hard engage with Nautilus Annie to set up Olaf big plays. Looks legit. Nautilus top. If Huni played let's Nautilus, do, would be a fanatic do, Let's do predictions right here. Nautilus top, Nautilus top Annie, Annie support. And Ox has played so many poke champions. Yeah. Uh, there is. No, it's too physical heavy. Uh, Kog'Maw's still up, actually. You could play that one. Yeah. Uh, I don't know if it, I don't know if it fits like comps. Like I'm not exactly sure what the cog synergies are. I think it's probably good with everything. Um, yeah, I would say not Jace, probably not Nidalee, but I think oh, uh, cog would work there pretty well. Vladimir and Shen will be the last few pickups for teammates. So I believe Cali Troll's second Shen game in as many days. And Golden Glue finds another team fight mid laner Vladimir, the next one down the list here, and we've got the teammate lineup. Ooh, I changed my mind. Hecrum top, Annie mid, Nautilus support. Ooh, that's that's what your bet is here. Yeah, if I had to guess, this is this okay. is what teammates probably been trying to do uh, with these unconventional lock-ins, playing the flex game. Hmm. Come on, enemy. What about top lane Morgana support Shen? That's probably it. No. <laughs> You pull a St. Vicious or Elimination and play a bunch of support Shen games. Yeah, talking about flex picks. We'll see where it ends up being here. Enemy Esports, 15 seconds left on their final choice here. You're saying mid Annie as a decent chance. We'll see what Inox actually wants to play for this one. Knows he's 
almost definitely up against a Vladimir here, and looks like that choice... Top Nautilus in this case? Yeah, I mean, unless you're playing support yeah. Varus. <laughs> so a, a very physical damage heavy composition for enemy esports. They are going for the Varus yeah. mid. A lot of wave clear, but they are setting up for an Olaf jungle. Yeah, so big time tank in the top lane as well to go against another big time tank in the top lane. Nobody will die in that lane, <laughs> uh, but the rest of the map will be exciting. The, the big benefit, I was talking with someone else about top lane Nautilus. Mm -hmm. uh, the big benefit with top lane Nautilus is that you get Nautilus on your team. That's, <laughs> <laughs> that's pretty much that's it. That's a good benefit. Because he doesn't do much in lane. He has like a little bit of gank assistance. He has no kill pressure. He can usually yeah. survive. But it's pretty much just to have Nautilus on your team yeah. in team fights. What, yeah, what I noticed from watching uh, my own couple of uh, Nautilus top games in the pro scene was he felt like the top lane version of support Alistair. Like, yep. his TP ganks are stupid good because he crowd kills you for like 18 seconds flat. Uh, and then he just like doesn't do any damage. Like he can't 1v1 and AD carry in the back line without Thor and Mail. You know, it's not like jungle nulls where at least you get Cinder Hulk to do some damage back. Uh, but a big crowd control bot, a lot of damage uh, with the Olaf, I keep wanting to say Vegar, uh, Olaf, Varus, and Sivir, but it's all physical base, which leaves me with a little bit of worry yeah. in that eventually the big tanks of Shen with 700 armor just doesn't die anymore. But that's going to be the goal here from Enemy Esports. Now, guys, let us know who you think is going to come out on top. Tweet at LOL Esports with hashtag T8win or hashtag Enemy Win. Let us know who's going to take this one home because the winner puts themselves up in a tie for seventh or sole possession of seventh if it ends up being Enemy Esports here. But a move on up for the victor. We'll see if it can happen. We are in a game. Yeah, Cloud9 sitting on three wins currently. So... There could be a log jam down there if Team 8 wins against enemy because we'd have a bunch of three win teams. The armor stacking potential in this matchup is Welcome immense for Team 8. Uh, Golden Glue can go a fairly early Zonias. Porpoise and Kali Trolls can very easily just stack full armor, which really limits the number of ways in which enemy can kill them. Yeah. Trashy will not kill them with true damage, I assure you. There is some incremental magic damage. You have like Inox's W passive, which is some, and at least it's percent health, which kind of matters. Annie does a decent amount of damage for a support, but yeah, nothing that's going to kill a Shen, certainly. Maybe Golden Blue somehow gets burned down, but only one Ignite on the team as well means cutting his healing is also unlikely. At some point, he'll recall and heal himself back up. I can't imagine Vlad wants to fight like this. Yeah, it's funny. If Inox had Ignite, I'm sure Golden Blue wouldn't fight him, but he would nearly kill the guy. But he knew he didn't. Yeah, so, true. I mean, why wouldn't you Body make drop yourself in, from the, in uh, recall range? That's uh, fair. Not a fan of Golden Glue right there. De definitely unnecessary trades, <laughs> because if there was an invade planned, mm, enemy could have easily brute forced five people sold. through. That's true. And gotten jungle position. He's just upping his stats for like damage per game. It's just it's just improperly inflated now. 100% of the damage from each team is from flares and Golden Glue, or uh, Inox and Golden Glue. See all the action per minute stats that people used to pay so much attention to in StarCraft where people oh, just spam man. actions that were useless before it started? Yeah. When I played WarCraft 3, I made it a point to have zero APM for minute two. I just queued up five wisps and let go of my keyboard. And I'd like look and it would be like two APM. And I'd be like, I did it. I felt so good about myself. Either way, Nian will get the small crook. They will stay for the entire camp because it's so damn easy with Ballista. Dota did start Puddle. And he actually gets the kill on it and actually absorbed all the XP. So Nian actually far from level two, but Dodo's one minion from having Dark mm. Binding. Yeah, that's that's a pretty big misplay, I feel like, in Krugs. Most of the time you want to share so both guys have level two at once. Very rarely Especially do you want Kalista. your support to hit level two first. Kalista really wants level two first. It'll give Dodo an early bind, though. And since he picked up the experience in the brush, maybe they get a surprise attack. But... Even then, with a level one yen, they're not going to get much. The other win. guys hit level two. Yeah, well, Bynod Otto's going to stop the rest of the push. Bynod up will land a stun, but doesn't mean a whole lot. Coin Annie, by the way, so the harass damage actually a bit less. Gives her a lot of sustain, which can matter against all the Morgana folk. Hmm. The thing is, I do like that because it allows Talisman Ascension even earlier than normal. The income's just fine with Coin. You just don't have to sell Spell Thieves, so... So Ancient Coin gives 25 basic mana regen. Yeah. No health regen. It's health on minion kill. Uh, as like pseudo HP 5. Yeah, you gain 3 gold and I think like 3 health when a nearby minion dies. 3, three gold and 5 health. So, ah, yes, correct. Uh, 
So it is, it is sustained, sorry. Yeah. It's just so rare we see that item built in competitive play early on in the match. We'll see so many people trade it out later. Yeah. Especially in a 2v2 laning scenario. Yeah, it became a bit more common after the changes, but you're right, it's still not the most popular one. Uh, once in a while you see it, but... Either way, moving on from that point, Enox is shoving in early on a Golden Glue, missing about four CS on his push, and Vlad gonna do what he can to last it under turret with only rank two transfusion. Gonna make that a bit difficult. Yeah, Just Golden Glue gonna miss a lot of these CS early, early on the lane. Varus, definite advantages. You could see even from the level one shenanigans <laughs> in the mid lane yeah. that Enox is gonna have the better half of those trades for quite some time. Golden Glue will have to level up and he really just has to do survival CS in his turn. Yeah. Of course, eventually that matchup flips around when Spellvamp comes in for Vladimir, and there's no easy lifesteal items for Varus to buy. There's too many core items he needs earlier. Yep. So Sustain flips over uh, maybe when 10, 12 minutes into the game and becomes a difficult road for enemy esports. But that's not here. That's not yet. 300 gold lead just from the early laning phase. Uh, ooh, Otter lost his recall. Water not forced to stay. They wanted a recall for Pickaxe. It was 950 gold for the AD carry. Yeah, That's gonna now, get stymied. Now he's pretty low too. That's a really, really critical puddle by Dodo right there. Yeah. Especially because Otter didn't realize it immediately and yeah. ended up also taking a couple Callista autos. And so Sim Simmer's whole thing in the lane is to be able to shove in again and again and again and again, which is why he wanted Pickaxe to kind of preempt any item break points and never fall behind again in the shoving war. But he just fell behind. Golden Blue did puddle the first axe toss, so he actually had to burn Ghost to get away. I think holding on to that cooldown a little bit too long. Loses Summoner, loses some health for it. Again, a fight in the bot lane. Body drop gets the Sentinel pop out of a great spell shield. Otter will stop the piercing uh, Javelin toss. But a couple of nice rends by Nian still put some damage through. Otter very low on health here. Yeah, again the binding. You can see the pressure in this lane switched around. Now would be a time for some recalls, but neither guy really wants to go back. They're 1,200 gold right now, which is 300 shy of what they want for the BS sword. Well, enemy esports also have a health lead now. Dodo's out of potions. That coin from Annie is starting to really matter here, as with no pots left, Annie stays healthier. AD carries are at basically identical health. It will be the Team 8 recall. They got to shove it in first, and that'll require interesting maintenance. It's still two waves away for enemy esports if they stay. The wave they recon is the wave teammate shows up and can make that recall actually really awkward. So they choose not to go for that one. Otter recalls right away for pickaxe and maybe boots. Vamp Tepter and boots for Nien's Callista can continue to play aggressively. Top lane matchup, small, small lead for flares. Mid lane basically equal off the golden glue recall. And we're at a roughly tied game. I'm happy we're watching the top lane right now. Just, just to kind of show you how no one is ever going to be low in this lane. Like they aren't <laughs> going to be doing damage to each other unless they really want to take damage. The shields for both these guys can hardly be up. Good flash. Oh, no. Dodo missed it. Didn't expect the flash binding. Won't matter, though. Inox certain oh. to fall. Dodo claims the kill, but either way, a great roam for first blood. Yeah, nice timing there. But right as the recalls happen, that's a lot of times what a support should do. And that's actually the benefit of teammate recalling first. They knew they wouldn't have to be in lane for the presence right off the bat. Gave him a perfect time to go in for the roam. But honestly, it seemed like Porpoise and Golden Glue had it on lockdown. Mm -hmm. Didn't even need the binding vote, Toto, just to get the gold. And level got five, the kill. bind over the wall. Nice. Whoa. That's a change that we made a few months ago where you will see skill shots in a certain range of you if they're headed at you. Even if you don't see the orc yeah. in front of the cast. It was uh, basically a Nidalee nerf, essentially. Because you'd see so many javelins hit you from nowhere. And it's like, yeah, you know, we're just going to draw them for you. So, goodbye, Otter. Still shows that in time. Yeah. back to equal. So, first blood, how much will this affect teammate? And it's an awkward recall for Inox. Tear and a longsword, not amazing for him. Golden blue without summoners, but... Still scaling up happily. Rushes the uh, arm guard to then go into spell vamp, which I find interesting, but just the armor to stay alive in the lane. Top lane fight. Ooh, actually, woo, that's hey. some damage. That's hey. actually some damage. Flares. Yeah. Calm down, man. You're going crazy. <laughs> I mean, with points in a riptide, though. Oh, what a good taunt, though. Two turret shots. With points in a riptide, that's 180 damage every five seconds. And Flares has the catalyst for sustain. Kali Trolls has the Vorpal for sustain. With how low they are now, they're actually putting themselves in vulnerability for a gank. And Trash, he's coming, but he's running out of Porpoise. Porpoise, like, hey, wait a second, that's an Olaf. 
will not kill the ward though. Forces Trashy away. Will they kill it time? Ooh. Yep. Nice. Ooh, and spots the pink ward. Trashy might lose a whole lot of vision. Well, he's still playing offensively. We're gonna go donate the blue buff over to himself. Probably Vlad doesn't need it. Actually, no one's really using blue buff on this entire team. There's three energy or non like resource users. I remember Team 8 is the team that actually beat TDK. It's one of their, sorry, uh, NME. Yeah. Teammates, two victories are from the two newest acquisitions to the LCS, one against NME, one against TDK. It would be great for them if they could go 2-0 up in this. Mm -hmm. That would also mean they definitively hold the head-to-head -head tiebreaker against NME should they have identical records at the end of the split. Yeah. Not only would it equalize them in the standings, it actually puts them ahead of NME. Well, so it was something to watch for. Of course, enemy had gotten one of their wins over Gravity, one of them was over Cloud9, so maybe they move on up in the standings with Flares forces Flash okay. away. The ganks from Porpoise now have burned two Flashes and gotten his team a first blood, so so far this Rek'Sai play has been good. The Olaf ganks have only burned a Ghost once, and with all the gank pressure, it's a gold lead for Porpoise. Yeah. Ultimately, this enemy team wants to find a group of people. They want to sever all thin with a Nautilus Assault and have everyone just dive into a giant pool of pain. Uh, but doing that against a Vladimir is actually pretty difficult because as you're funneling in as a group, Vladimir will just hit you with pretty much all of his AoE, Hemoplague, E, and then pool right as you're trying to go in. So it's it's really difficult to dive through, not to mention the Morgana and Callista that have great disengage. So thinking about this as far as what enemy wants to do for win conditions versus what teammate can do to stop that, uh, teammate is pretty well prepared. It's just, not to mention they can also armor stack. So I feel like enemy has to just really snowball this game. Oh, we'll see if they can do that. Trashy Porpoise in a battle. Porpoise wanted a fight, but here's the Shen ult. The Trashy Porpoise to run. Pops, Ghost pops the ult. Shen has to wait two more seconds for the top, but gets rooted before it can happen. And here's the TP back in from Flares. Who is he going to ult? He goes for Porpoise. They don't want Kali Trolls. They go for the jungler. Porpoise will die, and the kill goes to Otter, thankfully for enemy esports fans. Teammate forced to run away. The better of this battle definitely goes enemy's way. Yeah, that was mostly ideal for enemy because they didn't have to do anything through Vladimir and Golden Blue doesn't have his items yet, so they could group up and run straight at Porpoise right there, uh, comboing the teleport and auto assault into a kill. Yoda puts the puddle down. There's always a chance it steals. Fine, easy smite. Okay, it was down to take it back, but Trashy lands it with the QE. Rank one, reckless swing, I'm pretty certain. But it was enough, so no steal. Dragon one goes to enemy esports. Gold basically back and tied up. Golden Glue is near impossible to push out of the lane here. Yeah. Even before he's got the uh, spell as well. So, something that happened yesterday to Cali Trolls' is shit is... I believe he was against... TSM. He was against Dyrus's Nar. And he had pretty much no lane pressure, so he could never set up a split push opportunity that he could teleport into. Anytime Cali Trolls would leave the lane, they would basically lose a turret. That problem won't be as evident against this against this Nautilus, just because oh, now that he has a Spectrus Cal in his build, the magic damage coming out from Nautilus is mostly inconsequential, and he can't shove much faster than Chen can. So therefore, Cali Trolls is free to use his ultimate just like he did there and not be punished pressure-wise. Uh, a much better environment to play Shen in. Yeah, there's uh, plenty of CCs for the channel, but you're absolutely right as far as turret pressure goes. So we'll see if... Yeah, a million CCs. <laughs> Even the auto attack will do it. In fact, here comes Corpus. The flash already down from Flares. He's got nowhere to go. Nice anchor block. The kill goes to... Oh, Cali Trolls? Yep. And the Vorpal takes him down. First kill the board for the teammate top laner this game. Map pressure is in the top lane and no response at all from the Olaf. Yeah. Uh, Flares, oh. probably too caught up in the ridiculous nature of this matchup that he forgot to respect the jungler <laughs> in this case. And it's the second time he came by. He's so pushed up in lane, cannot anchor toss through if he doesn't keep his lead on them. I'm going to try to fight him, though. Enemy could have gone for the two-man push in the mid lane. Instead, all they do is save four minion kills and a bit of damage in the top turret. But honestly, Olaf and uh, Varus were in the mid lane. Golden Blue recalled. They could have actually gone for turret damage and chose to push mid for the top gank. Yeah. I, I'm actually not sold on enemy's choice right there to run top for basically nothing. And even let Golden Blue shove in mid and deny a bit of gold from Inox. He's now stacking his man to Mune, so at least that growth has started. Right now, 239 of 750 mana. That's going to be a long road ahead for the Varus mid. 
Ninja Tabi on Golden Glue, and Zonius will be his first item. He's already sitting on 119 armor. Oh, wow. Kali Troll's already sitting on 123. Going Sunfire Cape is his first item. And Porpoise will most likely go Randwins for his first major item as well. We mentioned it before, enemy kind of has to get either a big lead in this game or they'll lose to the armor stacking of Team 8, and they are currently behind before the armor stacking has even really kicked in. That's true. Yeah. 300 gold deficit for enemy esports. Bid still getting cleared back and forth. Inox, one of the big star carries of enemy esports, really not having any advantages to speak of. In fact, has a death thanks to Corpus's ganks. AD Carry Otter also only splitting gold, and even Flare is forced to run away from Kali Trolls in battles. A nice taunt into some more damage coming through, and yeah, the sustain from Vorpal Blade making Flare slowly but surely lose out in this lane. Yeah, constant pressure from Vorpal's Rex Eye. Pressure building up in the mid lane as well, as Golden Blue able to clear these ways before Inox can really fight back. Oh, and a hard engage in the bot lane. Body drop has no one to save him. Easy kill picked up by Nian. I want to see that one again, but the 2v1, Annie had no reason to be there with Sivir recalled. Good pickup, I assume. It wasn't even Fate's call. Dota just found him without flash. Yeah, that... Must have been a bind? It was It was a baited recall by teammate. So, enemy body drop was actually trying to disrupt a recall because he thought one of them was going to be gone and he was just trying to be cheeky. Uh, but it ends up costing him his life. He's done this actually a few times this game when they're both going to try and recall because he tried to disrupt it. Hasn't worked out yet. This time it's punishing. He's going to try to disrupt Nien right here. Ghost from Olaf use as well. A lot of move speed. Shen comes in, but it's going to be a lot of damage coming through. Kalista will die out of the turret, but Shen has arrived in the back line. Otter pops summon heal to run away, and Trashy going to do what damage he can, but Otter got bound. Kalitros flashes in for the kill. Dodo gets the credit. A late TP from Flare as he will ult on a Kalitros. Trashy's about out of mana, though. A good hook to buy some time, but I don't know if it's going to be enough. A dark binding hits. Trashy is completely oom. TP means nothing, and Rek'Sai holds top lane. They burn a lot of stuff. They end up trading one for one now, but they're going for a continuation dive. Re-engage, stun into Ignite, Black Shield used, but doesn't really block much. More damage coming in, the auto attack, Body Drop gets the kill. A flash bind from Flares, two auto attacks till Dodo dies, but no range left to get it. Clears a wave, Rek'Sai still pushing top though, might equalize the turrets. Yeah, enemy might end up losing two turrets for one out of this engagement. Yes, they dove and got through, Porpoise pushed that. There's been a Vladimir mid lane for quite some time. This is another one of those trades that may not have been worth for enemy, getting a little bit bloodthirsty under the turret. Yeah, for the second time, Inox leaves his lane to do something, and that something barely means anything except his own turret getting pushed down. Golden Glue a hit away from killing it. No one's in range to knock him down, so teammate still well poised to take a lot of this map away. 1,200 gold lead for them, body drop on the flank, not gonna find a stun. And we settle back down with a fairly equal trade, all things considered. Yeah, and now enemy decides to rotate up, try and maybe preempt this. Well, he's got pretty good wave clear, especially with the black shield to allow him to get close to the wave. It's a bit of a pretty interesting game right here. Flare's caught top lane, though, with no teleport. Mm -hmm. It's gonna make it very difficult for enemy to hold this dead. Yeah, Kali Trolls has his, so he can even match the Nautilus very simply. Not expecting not a fast pusher either, so certainly a long time to go. A lot of room had. Frozen Heart completed here for the Nautilus, though. CDR will be at least an offensive stat with how low the Riptide cooldown is. And a long enough fight that kind of starts to matter, I guess. Trash goes on the Sentinel. Dragon levels up. And enemy esports are going to send their top laner down to the side. Kelly Trolls, though, still not split pushing. Again, he has teleport. Finally heads to the top lane here. He will join that wave as it reaches his turret. And the lane's better pressured by teammate. Enemy, go for the early dragon attempt. The mid laner is actually still stuck there. Vladimir far away as well. This could be rushed down in time. Corpus could try to join to smite this one away. 1100 health goes in and the smite comes through. Trashy gets a forced ult away. Binding hits Flares, who had already been in this, uh, the correct spot for Kelly Joe's front line. Nian gets jumped out of the back line and ulti in from Nautilus and Timbers takes him down. Bottom up gets the kill. Trashy traded back on. Out goes Corpus pops. Vladimir in the middle of it all. Two kills for two. Inox forced to run away. Who's going to get what? Ghost keeps him safe. Vlad still the chase. Two kills for two. Dragon to enemy esports. All fair.
Yeah, Kali Troll's a little bit late to the party. He spent so much time walking up to that giant wave only to have to teleport back down. So enemy really wanted to force the 5v5 immediately there, knowing that they'd be able to burn the teleport and make teammates sacrifice the wave in the top lane. And that fight was very messy. Just like the rest of these fights are going to be very messy. There's a yeah. lot of bruisers in this game, tons of tanks, enemy very much just a run at you team composition, and teammates trying to stop from being run upon with a lot of counter engage. Uh, so, more fights like this is what we'll see here. Obviously, teammate goes in strong. Vladimir and Varus are a little late to this fight on the sides. Vladimir's not even really here, which gave enemy a chance to win this fight. They kill Yen right away, but then Golden Group does enter the fight, and you can really see the power of Vladimir, not even with Zonia's right there, because of how grouped enemy is going to be and how all of Vladimir's spells, aside from his Q, are going to be massively AoE focused. It's going to be a hard game for enemy to win. Absolutely agree. It's actually surprising a bit that teammate chose to even be in that battle, considering once the armor stack comes through, there's there's almost no way to lose a team fight. Flares still battling Kali Trolls and actually stopping the wave push, but Callista had already jumped the wall. Looking for a flank. Problem is, enemy kind of have some resources here. Eh, looks like nothing really doing. Callista joins the team again. Kali Trolls to recall. His ulti's back up, so once again, split pushing can happen for Shen. But before he gets there, Sivir's already pushing the top lane. Doesn't stay to knock the turret down. He could have gotten some serious damage in. Yeah, I think he just wants to respect the Vladimir a little bit. He can't, he can't tango with a level 13 flag. Gets it anyway. All right. He gets it anyway. The, global, the local yeah. gold. Does. Speaking of low health turrets, during the replay, Nian did take down the mid lane turret as well, placed a ward afterwards, which was nice and smart, too, so they can see through the lane. Those are actually my favorite wards. Yeah. As far as low cost, high value, especially if you have an upgraded yellow trinket, just place them on dead turrets or in the lane. It creates so many vision opportunities. Just... Don't put it near the alive one, because the true side will kill it. I've made that mistake enough times to like yeah. be, just be mindful of where it goes down, but for all the all the bad warders out there like me. Alright, well enemy esports with the uh, vote lead in this one, despite the fact that they had lost the matchup against teammate about three weeks ago. Hard engage comes in, nice early black shield from Dodo, and of course you can't focus the support of a Callista. Flares caught up under turret, but the re-engage comes back through, and in comes Dodo, two man ulti in. They're gonna turn right back out of the Morgana. A lot of CC comes in, the stun still lands on a body drop, supports get traded back and forth. Corbus on the front line, the double AD carries are around. Yeah, gets chunked out, actually. Keep in mind, uh, the squishies can still get poked away. You have to be yeah. auto attack range to lifesteal. Yen and Dodo definitely have to respect the physical damage. They're not allowed to stack armor right now because they don't have the gold to. And interesting flash in there by Dodo to try and proc the soul shackles. He got pretty punished. I don't think yeah. teammate needed to die for that. They still could have picked up the kill, but because they did and because Yen got chunked out, this could still end up being a successful scene for enemy. No, it hasn't been too much, unfortunately, as Kylie Trolls walked to the bottom and afterwards knocked that outer turret down as well, which means all three outers have now been killed for teammate. Uh, you're right about Dota getting punished. He had the Shen ult on him, so he thought he'd be maybe just durable enough to make it work. Um, yeah. You also talked about Dota not having armor yet. He's going for Forbidden Idol, which is a component of uh, the uh, McHill's Crucible if I understand properly. So still going for a very yeah. utility-focused Morgana, not a frontlining Zonia as well. Or even just some health. Yeah, true. Yeah. I would like that because he needs to kind of stand there as enemy walks through them. So he needs to be able to take a few ricochets and maybe the sides of, of a Tibber's damage in order to be successful. Mm. Uh, as of now, if he's going to go Talisman, he can't actually alt in, inside people. He needs to just peel back land bindings and maybe alt one person. Uh, but he yeah. can never get in the fray. He could like ult to peel, but it's a Nautilus and an Olaf, one of which you don't care about peeling, the other one you can. So, yeah, target selection gonna be hard for Dota 8. Long range bindings can be cool, and he's got the movement speed to boost his team in, which, you know, either from kiting away from Olaf or simply ju jumping into the face of Sivir, we'll see what that ends up being. Golden Glue, though, is being the split pusher. Now, he is teleportless. Kelly Jones has two globals. Golden has zero, and it's going to be the Vladimir running top lane. Now, Dragon's in 45 seconds, which means Vlad's going to have to switch lanes soon, I would say, as Flares has his own TP up. 
Otter shoving in against Cali Trolls, but Otter has no reason to be anywhere but bottom lane. And in fact, Cali Trolls is going to have a, a tricky time winning a battle like this. Yeah. You can spell shield the taunt and not get wrecked by the turret. Cali Trolls got to be careful. Interesting how teammate had rotated so many people up towards the top side. They lost control of their own jungle. This is an opportunity for enemy to take something. Got to be somewhat careful of the flank. Yeah, this is just given for free. Enemy from pushing the correct lane. Vladimir had recalled a purpose. Whoa, jumped on Shadow. Not gonna matter. Just taking him down. A miss rotation and the re-engage those Cali Trolls. They dodge the stun. They dodge the taunt. He flashed away. Dodo forced away from this fight and Golden Blue shows up only to ghost and run away. The slow lands from Trashy. The ulti gonna force Cali Trolls away. Black Shield used very conveniently and a quick pause in this game. We'll see what that one's about, but Porpoise Pops very much in the wrong spot here. And yeah. uh, enemy getting a much better set of choice in this one. Yeah, I don't blame teammate for pausing right here. There was, there was a play earlier in the year where Slushy was playing Azir and they thought there was a bug, but didn't pause because of it, because mm -hmm. they, they were just afraid of pausing. Anytime an LCS player suspects a bug, they're allowed to pause to try and review whether it actually was a bug. That's yeah. probably what this is for, because it's me to the after team fight, or maybe his keyboard just died. Cali Trolls, uh, I was told Cali Trolls said he has frame rate issues, so it may not be even a, a bug. client restart, could be a yeah. computer restart. Uh, yeah, uh, I don't think anything frame rate wise would have hurt him here. He channeled on a Rek'Sai who died through the shield, so uh, I don't think it would have had any effect on the fight regardless, but that is what I'm told Cali Trolls said to the ref, forwarding it on to you guys. And. So now to recap the state we are in the game. We're 24 minutes in, 7-7 seven to seven in kills, 3-3 uh, three to three in turrets, 0-2 to two in dragons, small, small lead. Of course, you can see the score lines up yeah. there, but uh, the tiniest of leads for enemy esports. Yeah, and that last fight was kind of ideal for enemy. It was really not well coordinated by teammate. Uh, Porpoise basically was trying a flank, but no one was in position to actually arrive because... If we're looking at the armor stacking teammate right now, just as an armor update, Cali Troll's 191 armor, mm -hmm. Porpoise 144 armor, and even Golden Glue has 143 armor. Just one last whisper on Inox. Otto's not doing much damage, Trashy's not doing much damage, and Flares is just a pure tank who does a bit of magic damage, but basically physical damage is 80% of their damage sources, and it's being yeah. heavily built against by teammate. So in an actual 5v5 where both teams are there, enemy's probably losing but they need to use their Nautilus ultimate, their Ghosted Olaf, and their Sivir ult to just pile in for team fights. Mm -hmm. And that's kind of what they're able to do there because yeah. they caught teammate thinking about a flank and struck first. Right, and with the people put in the wrong lanes as well, Golden Glue was top lane for a bit, showed up late to the fight, wasn't part of the whole battle. So enemy esports capitalizing well. Uh, we are swapping the PC of Kelly Troll. So as that happens, we're going to throw it over to our analyst test to break down the game further. Thank you, gentlemen. Unfortunately, a little technical difficulties, but it gives us some time to discuss what's happening as of right now. I know first off, we'd like to talk about the uh, top lane Nautilus a little bit. So, Zyrene, I'm yeah. just going to hand it over to you and let you go. So, Jat was just talking about how it's 80% physical damage on this team from enemy. Maybe even more. Maybe even more. <laughs> but this top laner is Nautilus, right? He has a lot of magic damage in his kit, and all the top Nautiluses we've seen to this point have built Rod of Ages first. He does not need a Righteous Glory. If you look down there, you can see Trashy already has one. He should have gone Rod of Ages right off the bat. I'm having a little rant about this because I think that they need this magic damage or it's gonna come and bite them in the ass later on because right now it's, they're looking at a physical damage outlook. Also, the fact that he's shoving these waves, he could have shoved them a little faster. He might have even had that kill down bottom against the Morgana earlier when he was just hitting him. Like, <laughs> I really would have liked to see a Rod of Ages here, but the way that the game is going, can't knock up too hard for it. It's even right now, but the fact that they haven't gotten a large advantage, the physical damage part is going to come into effect. Yeah, you know, even if they're being even right now, there's nowhere for them to really go. They've built themselves into a Varus comp. That is why whenever I see the Varus mid, I'm always expecting something like a Rumble top or a Corky for your AD carry at the very least, but comboing Sivir with Varus, they, their end game, they just don't have many options with this end game. Here. I think especially scary too when you look on the other side of the map and you see a Shen. Gl also a Vladimir, Yo, like Yo, Golden Yo. Glue's all over this. He's like, you know what? All right, Zonia's rushed. I got Ninja Tabby as well. He's just gonna stay in there and sustain through the, the entire team because they're all tanks. You're never gonna kill that Vladimir. This is one of the reasons we saw Vladimir come to prominence in the Cinder Hulk meta. A whole bunch of tanks. You can't burst him down, so he gets his rotation off over and over and over and over again, and you never kill him. Well, they have a damage dealer with Olaf who will deal true damage, and that's countered by bit. HP. It's like, that's, <laughs> yeah. uh, it's a big problem here that I think they're going to run into, and Kalissa's going to get double life still at 
some point as well. So I don't see them, if this game gets drawn out, taking down this Team 8 lineup. Well, right. So we're only 24 minutes into the game. It hasn't quite gotten to that point where, you know, it's – it's a lost cause. We can't do the yeah. damage. We can't get through people. And as uh, Jad and Freak mentioned, the most recent engagement went in favor of enemy in the bot lane. And it looks like maybe that's the way they're going to have to tackle this game, using the speed and mobility of Sivir to move around the map and just take turrets, almost avoid those straight up, you know, uh, long, longer duration fights. Yeah, they have better ranged wave clear, right? Like a Vladimir, a Shen, and a Kalista, they had to get kind of close to actually clear waves, so your sieging option is better on the side of enemies. So you can siege and then dive with an Olaf, get that extra Ragnarok movement speed that was added on to it very recently, and just dive straight into the back line. They have the Righteous Glory to do it. They have the Talisman of Ascension. So setting up, pushing side waves, and then abusing the wave clear is a really good thing to do with this yeah. team comp. We only have about another minute or so until that PC is fully swapped out. So, you know, continuing down the line, let's hop over onto Team 8's side in which we see, you know, some, some catches, or some, some people getting caught out, rather. We saw Porpoise get caught a few times. It still seems, they still seem very disjointed having lost Slushy in the mid lane. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Well, right as I say yeah. that, I mean, we're ready to go back. So I'm going to cut you guys off after I ask you a question. The technical issues have been resolved, so we're going to send it back over to our casters to get us back onto the rift. Rude. <laughs> <laughs> well, thank you very much, Rude Dash, but we are here to cast the rest of the game. Six-minute pause, but looks like the players say they are ready. We're getting right back into it. Uh, just to point out real quick, you, uh, I know Zyrene talked about Rod of Ages, uh, Nautilus. I haven't seen it on every single Nautilus. There was one in Korea, I think it was... I want to say Smeb, but I'm probably wrong in this one, who actually did just Righteous Glory and he just did no damage. Uh, the reason I actually like Frozen Heart, though, is 20 CDR is 20% bonus damage, essentially, mm -hmm. when you're cooldown based, uh, which would have been more Riptide damage per second than Rod of Ages Riptide. Yeah, I think the idea is you build both, but in this case, teammate trying to sneak a Baron while enemy get Dragon number three. It's going to be interesting. They don't have very fast Baron damage. Enemy is on the run. This would be another yeah. way that enemy could win a fight, is if teammate takes all the damage to Baron. Yep. Uh, instead, they peel off. Yeah, enemy knows about it. They actually rushed the home guards on Otter. He recalled and was like, oh crap, oh crap, 475 gold. Get me back here. Uh, so Dragon attempt uh, successful. Baron not taken. Enemy getting farther ahead now as they knock down that bottom tier two from the previous fight and have, even though the gold doesn't say it, I would say enemy feel ahead even though we've talked about the late game team fights being difficult. Yeah. It's still an interesting game. We know how much is on the line as far as positioning here. Teammate needing to win to tie in wins against enemy, but it will give him a 2 0 head to head on the year. And I still feel this weird tension in this game where, yes, enemy is up in dragons, but they're down in gold, and they're giving themselves all these tools to run into a team fight and actually find and engage. Yeah. But the later and later it gets, they're going to be running into their own demise because they are kind of out comped in straight up 5v5 team fights. I want to bring something up though, as a theoretical. Okay, so Golden Clue's building almost overly defensive in that he went Ninja Tabby, right? So his damage is like slightly lower than other Vladimir's. Mm -hmm. Double Righteous Glory, Sivir, Annie. Uh, they will just kill Nian or Dota. Hold on, first off, Otter's fighting Golden Gloom. Running across the can. All right, he's fine. Not quite. Uh, they will straight up kill Dodo and or Nian. Like, for sure. They're going to die when enemy chooses to kill them because you can't stop that, like, dive chain. And then teammate are left with only one damage to you. Right. Shen low damage, Rex low damage. It's just Vlad. It's, it's, that's what, just Vlad against double Marksman Olaf. I think you just win that fight at that point. Whether he's got armor or not, Vlad's not going to 1v3 when there's no damage dealers left. That might be how enemy wins fights, but they, of course, have to yeah. bypass the front line. It's the great peeling quest that Dodo and Yen are going to be on. Uh, Good old. Wow, that he helps. got just in range. That doesn't help. Nope, Porpoise is getting jumped on. You're seeing the hard, hard dives are working. Three kills on the body drop. He's actually got the most kills in the team, and they refine Dodo. He went back to mid. Calitro's also going to try to run away. He taunts out, awkwardly enough, and gets away from himself. Inox still poking Ooh. in the end, losing even more health. Hey, that's another fight. We said, enemy, if they are to win, it's by finding fights where they have the numbers advantage because they have tools to create numbers advantages with all their initiation, and they get two kills right there on Dodo and Porpoise. Time to turn to Baron. This could be a major swing, and enemy actually pulling out a win here. Well, the team's going to come defend this one. Golden Loop goes in, goes for Bottom Drop, stunned up, and lost. Doesn't even have health. ultimate up right be now. Be careful, though. There's no jungler, which means the smite should be easy. It goes over to enemy esports, and now the battle continues. Golden Glue has the zone. He's getting stunned through it, though. Ooh. Can't pop it in time. It explodes, and enemy getting three kills and a Baron unanswered. Yeah, and with the way they've been able to catch Team 8 out of position, 
the next catch could actually lead to the game if they shove down enough turrets right afterwards and get a big enough catch. It's been a story of teammate season. They look okay, but they just keep making all these mistakes. They are not coordinated like we expected them to be when they came into the split. Teammate was the teamwork team that didn't beat people in individual skill, and they'd always have the right yeah. calls, and they'd follow Cali Trolls into anything, uh, but it just hasn't been the case. Yeah, it feels like the teamwork, maybe though it's still there, the calls just haven't been quite as strong as you might expect from Teammate here. The little Baron stats I actually find quite interesting. Enemy Esports, you seeing how uh, sometimes scrapped together their wins are. Only three Barons for an entire split for a team with three wins. Usually rare that they, that they, have, you know, they have so little map control for so you know, few of their games that they even get Barons at all. The enemy now with a sizable lead afterwards. Also notice the really early Black Cleaver onto Inox, recognizing the armor stacking threat, trying his best to help cut through it. Yeah. He gets a few autos off, lands an E on a group of people. That's a lot of armor shred, uh, especially when Otter can finish off his last Whisper. It's actually very intelligent. He never even went for Brutalizer. Yep. Inox fully recognizes the fact that flat armor pen means nothing against this team. Uh, very smart build adaptation. I actually really, really like this. The fact that Inox identified uh, what both teams are going to be doing itemization-wise is super good. Otter with a good black shield, 2, 1, and 4 on him. Butter up now has four of his team's kills. He's literally got double anyone else's at this point. I feel like he should just buy Sork Shoes or a Void Staff and just wreck people. Yeah, I would love it if Body Drop took those kills and started building damage. Punish I people think Lee would work stack. well enough. Yeah. All the health stacking armor tanks. Yeah, right? Like, who's gonna withstand that? But either way, I mean, what's happening right now is certainly working for enemy esports. Bot lane pushing heavily, Nian and Golden Blue playing wave clear. Good damage. Oh, oh. man, yeah. Well, he's down to half, and healing that back up is gonna take quite a bit of time. More poke coming through the siege for enemy esports working. Pressure is really on, and because they have the map control with this Baron buff, even if they don't get a siege, it'll still mean Dragon number four. And yep. if they end up getting the five dragons, it won't matter if the other team's armor stacking because of that fifth dragon buff. Flares is going abyssal for his ability power item, so without just the Roa to get a faster frozen heart and adds his ability power later on with a flat pen item, so cute okay, stuff there. Choice. Yeah. Amplifies the rest of the team's magic damage, as little as there is. Ooh. I will let you guys know, by the way, at the end of this, what the percentage of damage on the champions is. Physical magic true. The thing is, it'll be skewed by the armor stacking. Yeah, oh, of course. Magic right. damage always gets through if you never build for it, which is always interesting. But mm -hmm. there's a few people that have even built for magic resist. Uh, Spectre's Cal sitting there. Cal for the lane matchup, yeah. Well, mid lane still getting pushed. Or not mid lane, sorry, the bot lane getting pushed around, but Nautilus had a bit of free reign up to the top side. Kelly Trolls finally sent to defend, and of course, uh, the taunt makes it difficult for players to siege successfully. Rexail comes what? in, Corpus will try to chase Nautilus away. They hope. Why around. would they Nautilus, why would they Rek'Sai ult there when Dragon is respawning? They had a tunnel behind the Dragon Pit if they were ever going to contest that. And this does nothing. It. I mean, if Teammate thought they couldn't possibly take Dragon or fight for it, they said, well, maybe we kill Flares and do something else at the time. But certainly, neither happens. Enemy Esports, four Dragons to zero. Now they kill minions even faster, which means Sivir and Varus really, really one-shot minion waves now. Yeah. Tides are turning back towards enemy's favor. It seemed like, compositionally wise, the armor stacking would be able to do it, but enemy has picked up enough advantages off of just grouping and mobbing to a disorganized teammate that they're getting picked off one after the other. And now maybe the strengths have turned. You know, there's not much damage on Golden Glue or Nian. To your point, they did build a little defensively, uh, but mainly, there is damage now on enemy. They built their last whispers. This is their mini power spike before the ultimate uh, armor stacking would come in. No one's at two or three hundred armor. Yeah. Well, they're at two hundred armor, but they're not at three hundred armor at least. Two sixty for Shen, one seventy eight, one forty eight. Yeah. So Kelly Troll's still trying to get there as best he can, but uh, not building a lot of damage return. No thorn mail for him. Just the sunfire cape. Oddly enough, no frozen heart at all from teammate either. Despite the fact that they've got three auto attack focused champions, that feels like a bit of a miscue to me. Well, no one wants to build frozen. Yeah, I mean none of them use mana. Models. Well, I mean, maybe Dodo tries that instead of going for Mikhail's, I'm not sure, but it just feels like a missed opportunity, mana or not. Uh, either way, the choice they made were for double Randwood's Omen. Of course, if they're the tanks, they still slow attack speed, so it can't be that bad. Uh, Kali Trolls now sent to the bottom lane. They realize Baron up in two minutes, so this will push her back to that side of the map. And maybe that works out well, but so far, Kali Trolls is actually getting more pushed around by flares. Seems that the Nautilus is having, generally speaking, minion wave pressure. 
Corbus takes basically no damage. The Talisman's popped on all sides. Golden Blue looks for the flank. It's a bit of damage down. Otter trying to run away. And the taunt nearly lands on a body drop. Oh. They might kill the Annie off. More flashing out. And a massive set of roots come out of the Varus as Flares is in the back line. Morgana ulti about to stay alive. Gets stunned up on in the end, though. And there's the back line push. Bought it up. Gets killed. The armor takes. Maybe it's starting to work out now as exactly who can enemy esports kill. Flares rooted up a great taunt. And Calitros locks in a kill for Nien. Nien still on the chase, but be careful. There's always some counterattack available. Cali Trolls running backwards. One for two in favor of teammate. The armor stacking starting to pay off. What a close fight, and surprisingly, teammate takes matters into their own hands. They try to initiate on an enemy. They were tired of getting caught out by all the talisman and righteous glories. Righteous glories only work in one direction, so it was just a talisman versus talisman move speed battle there, plus Sivir, that allowed teammate to barely get a fight there, and they come out on top, two for one. Mm -hmm. Watch that fight again. The flank from Golden Blue to help kind of... Yeah. And the penalty on the Vlad as well. Immediately. In sight, yeah, so. so they use that to try and chain taunts. He doesn't actually get to body drop during the taunt. And the Varus ultimate was super effective. Rooting multiple members. Flares with the teleport in at the back as well. Created that type of chaos. But the main thing is Golden Glue was able to sustain up through the end of it. Nien was not... Dovon, which was the big risk we saw for Team 8 if enemy actually piled on Yen. But since all their movement speeds were used in retreat, they couldn't use yeah. them on the attack front. And Yen ended up doing a lot of damage for the back line. Yeah. Very well done by Team 8. Calitrols and Porpoise, if you try to ignore them, they'll just run at your back line and knock them down. Body drop picked off by some good flash dives. And Team 8 can once again feel a little bit better about themselves. Baron is back up on the map, though. All the respawns have come through, and we are sitting on Every single ulti for enemy esports. Almost the same here for teammate. Porpoise and Kelly was missing theirs for now. It's actually very important how well Inox pokes the squishy targets. Yeah. Before this fight. They can lifesteal up on waves, but if there's no time to kill minions, then that poke definitely sticks. But enemy make the rotation to the top lane, and looks like Kali Trolls will stay mid while the rest of the team... Yep, easy turret. It's gonna try to turn back around. Enemy esports sitting on six turrets now to three. They're winning in globals. They're winning by 4,000 in gold. Dragon fives in a minute, 45 seconds. Baron's up. They're definitely rotating around this map quite well. Kali Trolls, though, by staying mid lane, gets an interior turret. He could always have the option of joining with his stand United. Uh, Ward in the corner there of the Baron. Hello. He's going to be able to reach the back line. Trashy running away. Flares by some time by locking down one. Kali Trolls slowed again. Poked decently by this Varus. Enemy could actually rush for the top lane yet again and dive in for maybe an inhibitor turret. But careful, as the recalls come through, Shen is around. Kelly with the ward, sees what enemy is up to, and the team's going to move towards the mid lane here. Keep in mind, Baron can be rushed down by both these teams. Kalista's good at securing that. Yeah. The actual DPS on Baron is low from teammate, but the secure is very high. If they could do Baron without taking much damage, the idea is they'd peel for a fight afterwards. It's very dangerous, though, keeping Yen in the Baron pit if enemy could dive on them. Sivaroth is not up, so the dive isn't as powerful, but yep. both Righteous Glories are off cooldown for enemy. And that's a talisman. They are full health for the Saints to the Vorpal Blades. They jump in on a Flares who is trying to flank, but he's not exactly Hecarim. Stun lands on Golden Blue. They force the Vladimir away a little bit, but he's got a lifesteal tank Flares now. He is safe on this side of the fight. They will knock down the enemy esports top laner. He's crushed off and no kills come through on the back side. Enemy esports down a kill teammate. Cali is just zoning the team away. Good play. It's gonna be a barn burner. Dragon in 25 seconds. Very close game right here. Two and a half thousand gold difference. Teammate, they're, keep, they're continuing to pressure this Baron, but if they're not careful, they're just gonna give a fifth Dragon to enemy. They may even give up their lives here if they get too low and if they take too much poke. There's oh. still a Talus, there's still a Righteous Glory on two members of enemy for a potential engage. Now the Binding's going to miss half health now. Body Drop goes for the hard engage. The end cleanses it away. The fight has begun. Kelly draws the front line. Otter forced to run as fast as he possibly can. QSS has that one away as well to not take any more damage. Kelly draws Chuck Low goes down to Ricochet. Boomerang Blade comes across well. A one for one, but ooh, ooh Inox knocks the kill through. Two kills for two kills if you count the death on flares. This is huge right now. Cali Trolls and Golden Glue are down. And look at the size of these minion waves pushing in the base. Instead of going for the fifth dragon, instead of going for the Baron, enemies looking to pressure these inhibitor turrets. And they're going to force all of teammates to respond to that one. The team running back to their base, which now does give room for enemy esports to run towards dragon. They just made sure teammate had to defend. Yep. Sentinel goes down. This will be Dragon 5 on four members as Trashy is still dead. But now that true damage poke is going to mean a whole lot when your opponent's stacking armor. Rotation game again. Advantage enemy. Close fight. 
but too many casualties for teammate. Teammate needed to win a landslide there if they wanted to get control of Baron or Dragon. And yeah, that's Dragon number five. Dragon number five. So here. three minutes of power. Baron, we know enemy esports is not shy about starting that one. Maybe that comes through in the, the double global buff. Did mean a ton for enemy esports yep. here. So aspect of the dragon. Mm -hmm. We don't get it that often because usually a team will die trying to stop it from happening. It doubles all the other bonuses, and it also does a 150 true damage burn over three seconds on attacks. So no matter how much armor you're stacking, it's really good for tanks to have this buff because it just lets them shred through you. If they, if Inox and Otter do get caught out, the Squishies will still die. But for instance, players can now actually threaten Kali Troll. You're seeing the damage, that true damage burn. is doing 50 damage a second. It's basically Ignite on an auto attack, still landing it. Enemy Sports find the full collapse, and Kali Troll's taunts in, but will go down. It's a one for zero. Top lane not pushing all the way. Keep in mind, teammate could push in mid. Enemy Sports have to be careful not to lose this game to a kind of a base race situation. The wave yeah. will join them. Teammate will play defense, and the siege might continue once again. Well, maybe enemy decides to dive through her. That turret is so low. This is a, oh. at least an inhibitor. What a terrible time to Zonia's. Golden blue pops. Zonia's chugs his ghost, his pool, and takes a black shield. But top lane inhibitor goes down. Still 25 seconds on the Shen respawn. He does have Stand United up. He can join his team at the drop of a hat. Enemy looks like they're rushing right away for this blue buff, and maybe even Baron. Yeah, even with the fifth dragon buff. Maybe teammate fights this if they can get in quickly. Seconds. Kali trolls can alt in in 10. Careful. And players. how low can they get flares? Now the bind drops to about two thirds off the follow up. Looks like enemy's gonna turn right back around. Golden Blue to buy some time. He does not have Zonia's though. Goes in towards Inox. The Baron was hitting, and Inox might in fact get himself killed for it. And in fact, the shutdown does come through. Flares doing some damage to the back lane. Actually, a double kill oh. for the top lane. Nautilus runs away, but Baron kills off Otter. Now Kalidro's tanking up the Dragon Buff Champions. The end back in the fray. Kalidro's very low, but so is Trashy. A ton of Ren Spears, and a kill comes through. It's a two for four that teammate is winning. Minute to the bot lane or not, it means means Baron's being attacked. Enemy overstep their bounds, and teammate looking to take Baron if they can. There are four waves, approximately, of minions killing their inhibitor in the bottom lane as well, and they're still fighting against an aspected Annie right now, trying to two-man the Baron. This is chaos, Freak. Well, the end's gonna have like a 7,000 damage rend. That's a bit of an exaggeration, but still, Baron is gonna be almost for sure secured, unless Mighty Drop goes for it right about now. Just, he's got to be safe. He's going to wait for it to go low, over securing with a monstrous rent. But they lost their second inhibitor. All right. While getting Baron. One member dead for the Baron buff. That means four Barons on teammate. Their base in shambles, but with no objectives possibly to take for enemy esports, teammate can basically safely sit in their base, farm up, get their tanks even tankier, and play for that later fight. Yeah, maybe a sixth dragon. Uh, it still gives him the same five dragon buffs. Because Baron is down. They've got to be cautious about taking fights. If they get aced, it's trouble. Here, Flares is just a little bit overzealous in trying to defend from the Baron, because what enemy wants, they actually do want to 5v5 with Aspect. But Flares takes a bunch of damage, and that leaves the window for Golden Blue to flank. Not to mention, Inox never quite gets out of Baron aggro range. Baron does so much work in this fight. Yeah. Uh, notice how Otter comes back. What? Yep. Baron's still angry. It, Baron basically did all the damage on both marksmen of uh, enemy esports. They did not peel away properly. A well placed flank. And, I mean, a double lifesteal Callista. Good luck yeah. killing her when your marksmen are already dead. Very true. Now it's a battle of how well teammate can defend these two down inhibitors. I actually don't like Enox's choice of going for um, his magic for this item right now. He went for the uh, Maul of Amortius. I actually think he needs Infinity Edge to be a consistent damage dealer. Getting through tanks is actually a, a big deal here. And it's basically the yeah. same cost. He'd have Infinity Edge right now if he went for it. Thing is, he's worried about getting one shot by Golden Crew, which is basically what happened last fight, even with the Maw. Yeah. Again, though, Kali Troll's on the side. He cannot get picked off yet again. A hard dive in towards Golden Glue, who's forced to run. Shendel popped onto him, but the re dive of Porpoise pops. The thing is, Porpoise is alone. He goes in to get himself killed. Another one for zero. Baron buff on teammate or not. It's 50 seconds with two inhibs down. Exactly what you don't want to happen when you're a downed inhibitor is you have to shrink your potential faults in those situations. Do not be far away from the base, but enemy catches Porpoise and Kali away from the base. 
meaning they now have a numbers advantage to pick up a third inhibitor. Third inhib is absolutely massive. Top one will respawn soon enough, but for now, the hard dive on towards auto. They try to blow up Sivir's spell shield and flash away. Does block a spell. Still, the very disruptive flare is going to get stunned up by Dodo, killed off by Nian. Golden Glue Zonis doesn't buy some more time. Three kills oh. picked up by teammate. This game constantly back and forth. Fantasy owners be happy about this one as Body Drop runs away. How long is their Baron buff up for? They have about 20 seconds. If the Baron buff lasted purpose. until they made it to the Nexus turrets, they might be able to do it because Inox couldn't shove through. They're going to try to get at least an inhibitor off of this one because they had so many people stay alive. And they could try to win the game. Corpus, Keep in mind, Corpus could yeah. join the team. Yep. Or he might need to help out with the two down inhibitors, even with just these three. Cali Trolls could join the team, or Porpoise could join the team. If they wanted to, if they get a window, they could have a five-man dive onto the base with about 20 or so seconds to try and win. His I think they should be happy with just the inhibitor since they know they'll be superior in real team fights. Ooh, I'm surprised they didn't push for a bit more, but I guess there was no wave left. Inox cleared it away, and it is going to be defense. Top and Hib's going to respawn, I'm going to say, in under a minute here. And they can get their first dragon. Yeah, dragon's alive right now. Eight seconds on the major respawns here, and there comes Golden Blue in the end. Safe and clean and easy. Dragon number one finally in for teammate. A huge surge of stats this late into the game. Woo. And maybe the late game scaling is finally ticking in. Overzealousness by enemy esports gave teammate just enough chances to come through. The inhibitors are respawning for teammate as well. Enemy may have missed their chance. But yeah. with all of the building destruction they've done out of this point, and all the times they've been able to catch teammate out, if they just catch teammate out one more time, it could lead to victory. But yeah. at this point, if one fight goes wrong, it's over. There's even some good wards down for teleports and whatnot. The flanks could definitely happen. Kali Troll's looking to clear wards away. Defensive pink ward's gonna make that happen. And it wants to keep their banners alive today. Keep that base up. Top and hip has respawned. Bot probably in two minutes, minute and a half maybe. And they've stopped the push. Two and hips to one, still the status. No globals up for a while now. Dragon five minutes away. Baron about three. Yeah. Which means you're just playing minion waves in base defense. Thorn mill, very important to onto Kali Trolls. Calvin Ascension used doesn't find anything though. They don't go in for the push. Enemy Esports still trying to play poke. Double quick silver sash on them. Triple upgraded trinket on one side, double on the other for extra wards here. Another cooldown popped. Righteous Glory by the Annie. Binding hits flares. Maybe that's a bit of a window in. A good amount of damage can be dealt. Kelly Trolls barely feels the poke back from enemy esports. And can always heal back yeah. up. He gets 21 health a second. While under the effects, Butter Drop goes in, does not find the sun on the end. That's dangerous. Gonna ult in Dota. This could be the fight that wins teammate the game. The hard dive comes in. Cali trolls the front lines. The kill already comes through to flares. Anox getting chased around. Trashy can't go much of anywhere except back. And an axe to buy some time, but teammate are in control. They only get one thanks to enemies disengage, but Porpoise is on the hunt. To win the game for teammate. Porpoise pushed around a little bit, but one more tunnel could get him the kill on a Trashy. Black Shield's on a little bit too late. The stun's gonna buy some time. Enemy needs to heal, though. Keep in mind, the inhibitor is dead. Kelly Trolls does not have Flash to land a chain. Oof. Just trying to close distance. This might use my trash to buy some time they as well. They still only have a one number advantage. They're maybe gonna try to push with these super minions, but it would be too dangerous to push in against four people. A near miss, but the game goes on. But we are now only a minute away from Baron respawning. They've got a 30 second window from Flares coming back up to Baron Wait. being a viable target. Teammate can play the vision game right now. Set up a death brush for a binding or a shen taunt to kill off enemy esports. Certainly teammate are in control right now. I'm not sure what prompted it, but there is a spectator bug right now. Five dragons are not active on enemy. They only have yes. four. So just pointing that out right now, enemy on four dragons does not have the aspect buff. The next dragon or Baron is quite critical. Enemy kind of on their back foot now with all the inhibitors being respawned. You really saw the power of Golden Blue in that last fight. Five alive, 20 seconds on Stand United, no teleport for Kali Trolls. There's the ulti and they're gonna look for Trashy. Takes a ton of damage even through the ulti. And two ults down in fact as the Chain of Corruption also used 
but that means more map control for teammate Trashy has to heal. He's got home guards, but he's going to give a lot of room over to teammate who are going to knock down another turret here. Top lane tier two could die easily. All three of teammates inhibitors are back up. A big mini wave grouping in the bot lane, so that's going to siege uh, properly as well for teammate. Top lane just got pushed in. Mid lane is fine for them with the inhibitor down. And now is the Baron attempt. Keep now mind. they Come dare for Baron. Team. Yep. They can actually kill it pretty quickly now. They know that Olaf is going to be in the base coming out with home guards. They peel for a really early Orpheus fight. This goes for the flank. Baron secured cleanly by Nien. And the battle begins. Dodo buys a lot of time. It's a two-man stun here. Locks up body drop. And Flare is forced to run. The tank not tanky enough. Nien is still on the chase. Goldenglue gets the kill. A one for zero. What can enemy even find? Goldenglue flashes to find more engages. Enemy forced to run away from this one. Kalitros lands the taunt. Body drop forced to run. This could be the fight that wins teammate the game. They've got their second kill in. Still chasing towards the back line as that's going to be three kills and four kills. And Anox, the last man alive, they can leave him up. Who cares? Tell the rest of your friends that teammate's going for the base. Oh, man. Four down for enemy. Porpoise Rex size back to come back from Aspect of the Dragon. So many misplays by teammate in this game, but they grit through it here. Now with the Baron buff, four people still alive and only Anox trying to defend. They're going for the win. There's almost no chance Inox defends this one in the 1v4. Waiting for the minion wave. Here they go with the Baron buff for Nexus turret number one. Claimed easily. Kali trolls on the hunt. Uh, yeah, good you luck with that one. cannot touch him. This is what we thought would happen with the armor stacking, and it finally did. And it happened after all. It tech turret number one, turret number two. 49 minute win, but that's going to be the game. Teammate and get their third win of the split by knocking down enemy esports. Whew. 48 minutes, nearly 49. Cali Trolls knows that there are many improvements for the team, shaking his head after that victory. But guess what? Still a victory. And they're now 3-7. and seven. They're ahead of enemy in the standings. They 2 owed them on the split. Yeah. And they still have the rest of the split to grow. And teammates sit now tied in wins with Cloud9. They are down 0-1 in that head-to-head. -head. Maybe a matchup that's going to be important for these guys as well, but teammate are now in control of their own destiny for hitting a seventh place spot. Only two wins behind Impulse for a playoff spot as well. Certainly not out of reach either. They'll play them later on in the split. And teammate improving a little bit here. Nian, the new AD carry, came in after week one, 11, two and 10. 21 of the 24 kills he was a part of, only two deaths. Definitely a massive factor for the team as well. He went largely untouched. The dive couldn't reach him. Dodo peeled for him properly. Kelly Trolls and Porpoise front lined well. The armor stacking paid off, and teammate took a good win. Yeah. Even though, because there were so many team fights, the damage numbers in this game are absolutely absurd. Uh, but if we were, we talked about comparing physical and magic damage just at some point in the game. Uh, 93,000 physical damage dealt. Uh, to 42,000 magic damage dealt. That was the distribution uh, for NME. Yeah, so with the armor, armor. stack, even with the armor stacking, they're still dealing at least more than 66 percent of their damage being physical. Yeah, much better spread and team composition for Team H. So history teacher can be happy about that draft phase. Definitely things to improve upon with the in-game strategy and execution mainly. Yeah. We come into this one with a strong showing of the end of it all for teammate. I, I definitely agree. There were a lot of mistakes back and forth there. I think both teams could have had the game easily under control. Teammate, if they play slowly and safely, the game looks like it does at the 40 minute mark here where they just can't die anymore and Callista's safe. And in Esports though had so many opportunities, a Baron oh, yeah. buff, Dragon 5, a 5v4 with late game scaling in and overstepping their bounds. I mean, good tenacity by teammate to break through those difficult situations. Definitely a game that could have gone either way. Oh, absolutely. There were multiple opportunities for both these teams to win. It's one of those wins that if you, it's one of those losses that really stinks. Yeah. Because you know you had the game in hand and that could be all too common for enemy this split. They need to get over this stage fright, it feels like, because